Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Aquaculture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. For more than 10 years, the Medway River Salmon Association has been receiving up to 60,000 sea trout eggs and 10,000 fingerlings from McGowan Lake Hatchery to raise each year. Whereas the association introduced fry and fingerlings in the best pH balanced brooks in Medway watershed. And whereas these projects have resulted in a great increase in the wild trout stock and has made the Medway River an important angling destination for recreation on the South Shore. Therefore, it be resolved that members of this House congratulate the Medway River Salmon Association for its enthusiasm for making trout fishing on the Medway River what it is today. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask for a waiver notice and passage of the debate. There has been a request for waivers. It agreed. It is agreed, but all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I begin, may I give an introduction? Permission granted. Joining us in your gallery today are members from the Canadian Congress of Black Parliamentarians. I would ask them to rise as I call their name, please. Uh, first is Ms. Audrey Gordon, MLA, for the Electoral District of Silkdale in Manitoba. The first black woman to be elected in 150 years. And also with us from PEI, Gord McNeely, who is the speaker in PEI. No? No? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And lastly, I have uh, Mr. Martin Morrison from the Department of Education with us as well. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotia is honoured to host the Canadian Congress of Black Parliamentaries Black Leaders Summit 2020. And whereas the Canadian Con Congress of Black Parliamentarians is an independent nonpartisan group of government parliamentary leaders of African descent who work together to provide workable solutions for issues relating to African Canadians. And whereas Nova Scotia looks to the Canadian Congress of Black Parliamentarians as leaders of positive change and equity representing Canada. Therefore, be it resolved that members of this House of Assembly join me in welcoming the Canadian Congress of Black Parliamentarians and thanking them for the important work they do to create racial equity and access to equitable delivery of government services for people of African descent living across the country. I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> we'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce uh, an act to amend Chapter 11 of the Acts of 1993, the Railways Act. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 11 of the Acts of 1993, the Railways Act. Bill number 236, An Act to Amend Chapter 11 of the Acts of 1993, the Railways Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to, to table a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1995, the Highway 104 Western Alignment Act.
The Honourable Member for Cumberland North begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1995, the Highway 104 Western Alignment Act. Bill number 237, an act to amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1995, the Highway 104 Western Alignment Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 231 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Insurance Act. The Honourable Minister of Finance begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 231 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Insurance Act. Thirty-eight, an act to amend Chapter 231 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Insurance Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2011, the Elections Act. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2011, the Elections Act. Bill number 239, An Act to Amend Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2011, the Elections Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I make an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you. Uh, direct uh, colleagues' attention to the uh, East Gallery. Uh, with us are uh, Paula Langell, the Director of Continuing Care, and Vicki Elliott Lopez, the Senior uh, Executive Director of Continuing Care. Uh, they, along with the uh, whole team in uh, the Continuing Care branch, uh, work hard every day with our partners in the Continuing Care sector. Uh, so if you please uh, give them the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Life Partners in Long-Term Care. The Honourable Minister of Health begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Life Partners in Long-Term Care. Bill 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate the career and life of an amazing Nova Scotia nurse who is retiring after a lifetime of dedication to Nova Scotians. I met Janet Landry at the age of 12 when I started volunteering with her organization that she started while still a nursing student. She started a unique program at the Dartmouth YMCA called Upward Bound. This group was made up of over 60 teenagers over the years who were paired with children with special needs. We did arts and crafts, a gym class and pool therapy every Saturday morning for years. Not only did Janet provide support for these children, she was also a mentor to all of us teenagers who learned compassion, leadership skills, and the need to generously give back to your community through the years. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say that after all of those decades, we are all still friends. Janet is now retiring after a lifelong commitment to her work and to her community. And although I know that she deserves this well-earned rest, Everyone she's ever worked with will miss her greatly. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in celebrating and thanking Janet Landry for her commitment to Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate Keith Getson of Bridgewater on his recognition of, as Athlete of the Week at St. Mary's University for the week ending January 12th. Keith is a former Halifax Moosehead and former assistant captain of the Charlottetown Islanders. He had a four-point weekend for the Huskies as they picked up two wins over Dalhousie and St. of X. 
Keith scored two goals in each game, improving his goal totals to 10 and 18 points for the season. I'd ask the members of the House of Assembly to please join me in congratulating Keith Getson on his continued athletic and academic success. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate Howard Oakey on his many volunteer contributions over the years. Most recently, Howard has been deeply involved with the Bedford Lawn Bowls. He's been volunteering there for more than eight years, serving as social chair, vice president, president, and treasurer. Folks describe him as a natural leader who's eager to bring his knowledge and high standards to the club, so it's no surprise he often takes on leadership roles when he gets involved in an organization. Howard is currently the past president of Lawn Bowls, Nova Scotia. <clears throat> He's also volunteered with the Real Estate Commission of Nova Scotia and served as National President of the Real Estate Commission of Canada. He's Treasurer of his Condo Corporation. He served as President and Treasurer of the CFB Halifax Curling Club and volunteered there with countless curling events from Olympic curling trials to the Briar Cup and the World Championships, to name a few. I'd like to thank Howard Oakey for his many contributions to sporting life in Bedford and beyond. He rocks. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in recognition of Social Enterprise Week, I rise to celebrate an organization in Queen's County that exemplifies what it means to support adults with diverse abilities as they strive to reach their full potential. For over 50 years, Queen's Association for Support at Living, affectionately known as Quasal, has been an advocate and support leader for people of all abilities, helping them to reach for their dreams and to make decisions about their own lives. Offering innovative programming and employment opportunities at Penny Lane, Woodworking and Enterprises, and the very popular Riverbank General Store and Cafe, Quasal is truly a model for helping people to thrive and reach their potential. Mr. Speaker, I thank Quasal for all they do for residents of Queens and look forward to watching as they continue to grow and make Queens County an inclusive and supportive environment for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we'd like to recognize Ms. Car Carol Ann Dixon of North Preston on operating her own business, CA Nature of Things, for eight years on Portland Street in Dartmouth, selling Celtic sea salt, herbal products, and bath sea salt. She now sells some wonderful products from her home, which affords her the time to work on her next project, opening a senior's residence in North Preston. She is an active member of the St. Thomas Baptist Church, where she sings in the choir, conducts some sermons, and also attended Emmanuel Baptist Church in Hammond Plains from 2012 to 2015 to study to become a lay pastor. I recognize and congratulate Ms. Carol Ann Dixon for her contributions to the business community and her church. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize Jonathan McClelland. Jonathan is the CEO of the Cumberland Business Connector. Jonathan is committed to economic growth in development and development in Cumberland North and has a lot of experience working with agriculture, forestry, fishery, renewable energy and in the manufacturing sectors. He's been investing in Cumberland North since 2016. He has encouraged young people to become interested in businesses as new entrepreneurs with things like the Cumberland Youth Entrepreneurship Challenge. Jonathan has put in hard work to help businesses in Cumberland North start and succeed so that Cumberland North's economy can thrive. He is a valued member of our community and today I would like to thank him for his continued work and efforts in Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. With us today in the gallery, we're joined by two talented Armdale residents, Krista Dunn, housing manager at the YWCA Halifax, and Bridget Langell, the YWCA's director of philanthropy and communications. The YWCA does so much important work in our communities, and I'd ask both Krista and Bridget to please stand and receive the warm welcome of the house.
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Krista Dunn of Halifax Armdale. Krista, originally from Yarmouth, has a passion for helping others. Through her studies in psychology and addictions counselling, she discovered how much difference one person can make. During a student placement at Phoenix, Krista worked closely with at-risk and homeless youth, developing a deep appreciation of the struggles that young people face when they lack adequate supports. Through her work, Krista learned valuable skills that she brought back to her hometown where she helped launch Yarmouth's first emergency youth shelter. After starting her own family and moving to Halifax, Krista jumped at the opportunity to take on the role of housing manager at the YWCA. Today she plays a big role on a team that provides invaluable support to young and single mothers and women experiencing homelessness every day. For her community service, Krista received the third annual Queen Pin Award at a ceremony in November. Congratulations to Krista, her husband Eddie and family. Thank you for helping those who need it most. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay my respect and send some condolences to the family of the late Bernice Kennedy of Duncan. Bernice left us on February 6th at the young age of 67 after a brief illness. She spent a lot of time working in her yard and garden and was a wonderful volunteer in my recent campaign. Bernice was known as an inspirational soul who dedicated her life to her family, especially her husband Hugh and many friends. She will deeply be missed by all who were forced into have known her. I ask all the members of the legislature to join me in sending sincere condolences to the family and friends of Dorothy Bernice Kennedy, a special woman who will be never forgotten. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Christine Bowie, a resident of Hatchet Lake. Christine opened her home to raise a puppy for the CNIB Guide Dog Program. Her puppy was one of 25 canines who graduated from this program in November of 2019. Volunteers who raise these puppies foster dogs from eight weeks until they are about 12 to 16 months old. The puppies have to learn to behave in a certain way before they can go into the harness work, which is the professional part of the training to learn how to wear a harness and actually guide a person. The dogs have to be trained to walk properly, sit properly, and be exposed to different environments in a variety of different situations so they are prepared to be a guide dog. Mr. Speaker, I'd like the members of the House Assembly to join me in thanking Christine for her volunteer work to raise a puppy to this important milestone and make a difference in the life of a Canadian who lives without their sight. These exceptional dogs are so special because of the passion and dedication of the volunteers who raise the puppies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the Sackville Business Association members of the organizing team and volunteers of the Sackville Snow Days in Lower Sackville. The sixth annual Sackville Snow Days took place from February 14th to 17th this year. There was something for everyone going on each day as activities such as activities and contests for the kids. East Coast music concerts, a parade, a starlight walk followed by fireworks at the Kinsman Community Centre and many other free events each and every day. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Sackville Business Association, the organizing team, and volunteers of the Sackville Snow Days. Without their support and commitment, this winter festival would not be possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Whitney Pier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to recognize uh, Pratik Gunny Brar, who's a uh, student from India who has studied at Cape Breton University over the last number of years. Uh, Gunny had the honor of being the student union president uh, at CBU over the last uh, two years uh, and really played a, a very significant role as CBU made the transition to see as many international students uh, that they have on their campus now and within the community. So Gunny has been a leader in the community for a number of years, uh, and I'm sure he will be uh, as he moves uh, on and graduates, uh, moves on to his profession into the community. So uh, I, want, I stand in my place today as a former student union president at CBU to congratulate him uh, on his uh, work advocating for students uh, in our community, and I ask all members of the host uh, to congratulate Gunny on uh, two uh, very successful years as president of the student union at Cape Breton University. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the participants in the Special Olympics Floor Hockey Tournament in January. GOVRC is an enterprise in Spring Hill and area where Terry Black, Brad Cody, and Jonathan Dauphiny and their teammates won the gold medal in the Cobblequit Floor Hockey Tournament hosted by the Special Olympics at the Truro NSCC. 
Terry, Brad, and Jonathan are just a few of the players where they were very proud to represent their area and agreed it was amazing to taste the gold. Please join me in congratulating Terry, Brad, and Jonathan and all their teammates and representing their team well and bringing home the gold. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable, Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize an important day for the Mount St. Vincent community. Every year, on the last Wednesday of January, MSVU celebrates Caritas, or Charity Day. This day promotes and encourages random acts of kindness or giving time and talent to others. Caritas Day dates back to January 1951, when a devastating fire destroyed the university's only building. Since students no longer had a place to continue their learning, residents and businesses of Halifax opened their do doors and provided students with this much-needed space. As a result of the community's generosity, MSVU created Caritas Day, a day for students to give back. In the past few years, some of the student and faculty-led initiatives included knitting toques for Syrian refugees, organizing food drives, or raising money for local shelter programs. Caritas Day isn't limited to current students. The school highly encourages alumni and the general public to stay involved. So, Mr. Speaker, as a proud alumna of MSVU, I hope to encourage the members of this house to do random acts of kindness with me, not just on Caritas Day, but every day. Thank you. Good job. Good job. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je me lève aujourd'hui pour reconnaître Marie-Claude Huo, la présidente du secteur de la Nouvelle-Écosse pour l'organisme éducationnel Epelle-moi Canada. Epelle-moi Canada est un organisme éducationnel qui vise la valorisation et la promotion de la langue française chez les jeunes francophones de 6 à 14 ans. Demain, le 29 février, 22 jeunes de notre province vont rassembler à l'école du Carrefour en Dartmouth pour le concours régional d'appellation en français. J'aimerais sou souhaiter bonne chance à tous, les, à tous les participants. Monsieur le Président, la promotion de la langue française grâce à des évén événements comme celles organisées par Marie-Claude sont essentielles à la création du Canada et d'une nouvelle Écosse bilingue ainsi qu'il monde où nos jeunes peuvent vivre dans la fierté de leur identité francophone. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate 10-year-old Dominic Lehman of Beaver Bank, Monarch Elementary, who was the grand prize winner of a Scholastic uh, Canadian Graphic Novel Contest. Dominique says he was excited to win because of he worked hard on his story, which he says is a jam-packed full of action and adventure. While the contest uh, asked uh, the students to write as if they were a buddy of the main character, Dominic created a whole graphic novel. Dominic's mother, Trish Lehman, says because of his autism, some things can be more challenging, but comics have always been the outlet for him and as a chance to foster his creativity. Mr. Speaker, I request all members of the legislature join me in congratulating Dominic on his grand prize win and wish him continued success. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the Sackville Lions Club, who are celebrating their 50th charter anniversary this year. The Sackville Lions Club is part of the Lions Club International, a non-profit organization that consists of volunteers who work together to help organizations in our community. The Sackville Lions Club works with and donates to the IWK Children's Hospital, Kids Help Phone, Millwood High School Sports, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, Foundation, Beacon House Food Bank and the Sackville Schools Breakfast Program, just to name a few of the organizations. On April the 18th, Sackville Lions Club will be celebrating their 50th charter anniversary by holding a dinner and dance. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take an opportunity to thank the Sackville Lions Club and all their volunteers for the continued support in the community if over the last 50 years and here's to many more years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Tara Taylor and the team of African Nova Scotian women and girls that organized and took part in the second annual Braided Couture Arts Show last weekend at the Bus Stop Theatre. The show, held in celebration of African Heritage Month, featured emerging talent in hair, makeup, and fashion. Artists and art included Tara Taylor, whose skin line uh, Car Carmelina Naturals was also used for the show. Tasha Dawn, whose beautiful braiding work was featured, Martina Brooks of Hologram Designs, Hilary Sears of Hill Designs, and the clothing line Scotian to the Bone. Braid artists as young as 12 years old also showcased their talents. The night also featured performances by Tyrone Taichichi Thompson, the Unique Four dance troupe, and Tara Taylor uh, debuted a theatrical performance entitled Hair Today, Slam and Tomorrow. The Braided Couture Art Show was a wonderful celebration of black hair and fashion and of truly excellent emerging artists in our community. I ask all members of this house to join me in congratulating everyone involved in the show and encourage everyone to check out the work of the artists when they have the opportunity. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Today I'll recognize uh, a fine young lady from Hammonds Plains, Mackenzie Joy. Uh, she's done a tremendous job fundraising for the IWK. She was born with a chromosomal abnormality, which causes her to have ADHD and uh, epilepsy. Over the years, she spent quite a significant amount of time at the IWK, so she's decided to give back. She began taking pictures and, took, and turning them into cards, which she sells at different crafts, craft fairs uh, and markets around, around the community. And she's raised, Mr. Speaker, more than $13,000 for the IWK. She's given so back, much back, and now she's trying to, uh, her and her family are trying to raise the funds uh, to provide her with a service dog uh, to, to help her through, through her, through her, uh, through her um, life. Uh, and I ask all members of the House to join me in, in thanking her for all the, the work that she's done to fundraise for the IWK and wish her well. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honour our nation's heroes, those who have fought for our rights and freedoms, and of many around the world, our veterans. Today, the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 155 in Wedgeport is holding a commemoration ceremony for the 75th anniversary of the withdrawal of Canadian soldiers who fought in Italy during World War II before being deployed to fight in Northwest Europe. The battles in Northwest Europe overshadowed the accomplishments of the soldiers who fought in Italy. The brave soldiers became the forgotten soldiers, never receiving the praise they deserved and often referred to as the D-Day Dodgers. The Wedgeport Legion is honoured to have as its members two veterans of the I Italian campaign, Charlie Muse and Henry Miff O'Connell. I would ask all members of the House of Assembly to join me in thanking the members of the Wedgeport Legion and other legions around our province for their commitment in ensuring we honour and remember with gratitude all of those who have served and as well as thank all of our veterans, including Charlie and Miff, for their selfless service. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Dartmouth writer and queer activist Rebecca Rose on the publication of her first book, Before the Parade, a history of Halifax's gay, lesbian and bisexual communities from 1972 to 1984. In writing the book, Rose conducted countless interviews with queer community elders who generously shared stories of struggle, of fear, and also of great solidarity and joy. The book was launched at a standing room only celebration at the Halifax Central Library library where 300 people gathered to hear excerpts of the book, hear from some of the LGBTQ, LGBTQ-esque and queer elders mentioned in the book, including a number of founding members of the Halifax Women's Housing Co-op, and of course to buy copies of the book. Mr. Speaker, in many ways things have come a long way for the 2S LGBTQ plus community in Nova Scotia since 1984, and yet it is important to know the, the history of the community to understand the work and struggle that folk endured in the early years, and upon whose shoulders the queer community stands today. Rebecca's book gives us that history in a truly wonderful work. Fun fact, Rebecca Rose is also the constituency assistant in the Dartmouth North MLA office, and she brings the same intelligence and generosity that she brought to her book to the people we serve in our office. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to recognize an incredible individual in my community, uh, Megan Fraser. Ms. Fraser, as she's known to her grade 1-2 class at William King Elementary, is a top-notch teacher and friend to her students. Megan is always there for the students and parents. Megan helps grow the minds of our youth, brings them out of their shells, and goes above and beyond the duties of a teacher. 
Megan is always there to also give advice to the parents to show them how to build on her teaching, including her famous apple and onion game. Megan, my apple is I get to watch as you help my son grow. Uh, my onion is that you won't be his teacher next year. So to Megan and all the educators at William King Elementary and the entire community, thank you for all you do. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to congratulate Liverpool Regional High School student Keegan Oikel on his achievements in the prestigious Duke of Edinburgh program. Keegan recently completed his Silver Award level, which required 26 weeks in the four criteria of skill, physical recreation, service, and adventurous journey. Kagan's activities included skiing, skating, cycling, playing guitar, volunteering at local radio station QCCR, producing and recording 57 weekly episodes of his on-air program, Tapped. And he's competing a three-day, two-night canoeing and camping expedition in Kejimakujik National Park. Of special note, Mr. Speaker, he was asked to offer the official thanks to our Lieutenant Governor at the ceremony. Mr. Speaker, I ask members to join me in applauding Keegan on this very impressive accomplishment. He is a wonderful role model for Nova Scotian youth, and I wish him the best as he works to achieve his gold level. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge a special long-standing relationship between Foxy Moon Hair Gallery and Adsum for Women and Children, the former a business and the latter a charity, both located in Halifax, Needham. For the past eight years, Foxy Moon Hair Gallery has offered pro bono hair services to clients of Adsum for Women and Children. Adsum shelters, houses, and provides services and programs to women, families, youth, and trans people facing poverty, homelessness, systemic discrimination, gender inequality, and violence. Each month, a different hairstylist from Foxy Moon will offer an afternoon of their services to the Adsum shelter. Adsum's Twitter page recently pictured, pictured photos of happy clients with fresh haircuts sharing that they felt a boost in confidence. Mr. Speaker, Foxy Moon's collaboration with Adsum reminds us of the importance of relationship building, community care and connectivity, and that simple gestures can go a long way. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Pastor Elliot Seitman of St. Peter's Anglican Church in Clayton Park West. In 2004, Father Elliot became an ordained deacon and priest. Under Father Elliot's leadership, St. Peter's Anglican Church has been a cornerstone in our community. The church is a host to several events throughout the year, including the annual Christmas craft and fair, uh, pancake supper, which we just had last week, brunch with Santa and Mrs. Claus. The parish also participated in many outreach programs, including St. George's Soup Kitchen, the Anchorage Recovery Program, Halifax West um, Acumenical Food Bank, and the Mission to Seafarers. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Father Elliot for his service to our community. It is his kindness and sense of humor that I enjoy the most. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge March 1st as Zero Discrimination Day. This day brings awareness to discriminatory provisions in laws and policies and encourages people to make positive changes to ensure equality, inclusion and protection. Mr. Speaker, discriminatory laws and practices can create a significant barrier to access health and other services and undermines efforts to achieve a more just and equitable world. From race to religion, gender to sexual orientation, age to income, we all need to commit to bringing the world closer to zero discrimination. Mr. Speaker, I call upon the members of this House to speak up and prevent discrimination and to work toward eliminating discriminatory laws, policies and practices in their communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to congratulate Mr. Mark Carter and Carter Sports Cresting on their 20th business anniversary. Carter Sports Cresting was opened on June 1, 1999 and has been serving our community by printing signs, embroidery and other promotional items with an in-house production facility. Mark employs 10 full-time staff in his business. He's located in downtown Amherst. I wish Mark and his staff the best 
on this significant milestone and hope Carter's sports cresting continues for many more successful years. Mr. Speaker, another successful business in Cumberland North. Thank you. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the last few, few years, our province has welcomed more and more young entrepreneurs returning home to build businesses, families, and community. Matthew and Steve Hasem, both geologists, returned from Western Canada to start a family business in Wolfville known as the Church Brewing Company. Matthew and Steve renovated and repurposed the former Main Street Anglican Church designed by renowned architect Andrew Cobb to a restaurant and brewery. Since opening in January 2000. And 19, the church has become Wolfville's second largest employer with over 90 local staff. Once a destination enjoyed on Sunday mornings, it is now seven days a week uh, enjoyed by locals and tourists who congregate amongst its flowing taps, stained glass, and church bells. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Matthew and Steve Hasem on their successful business, thank them for preserving an important community building, and to welcome them home to Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Mike Prosnick and the team of volunteers of the Sackville Area Warming Centre in Lower Sackville. Mike and many others realize the need in our community to provide a safe place for citizens who are experiencing homelessness. Mike is the catalyst who brings everything and everyone together. The Sackville Area Warming Centre provides an opportunity to get a break from the cold temperatures and offers dry socks, a warm drink, a bowl of soup, and conversation. With tremendous support from stakeholders in the community and dedicated volunteers who sacrifice sleep to be on duty all night, the centre is able to open four nights a week, which is twice as much as it was last year. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating Mike and his team for caring so much for their neighbours in need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Ms. Barb Plate, a graduate of Mount Allison University with a bachelor's degree in a degree majoring in music who served in the Terry Fox Foundation Provincial Director for more than 14 years. She directs the church choir at Hope United Church in Halifax, as well as being active in the Rotary Club of Halifax, where she participates in a harmony group. She and her husband, Glenn, own and operate Red Mahone Bay Bed and Breakfast. I recognize and congratulate Ms. Barr Plate for a valued contribution to the community as a Terry Fox Foundation Provincial Director and church, and wish her every success in the future. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the 30th anniversary of an outstanding performance of The Living Christmas Tree in Port Reville, Nova Scotia, directed by Judy Wheaton this past December. The Living Christmas Tree has been entertaining holiday crowds for 30 years, and those who have seen it once want to experience it every year. The beautifully decorated Grace United Church hosts the performance year after year. Everyone does an amazing job decorating and performing in this event. The Living Christmas Tree was started as a Sunday School Christmas concert, and some of the original participants are still performing. Mr. Speaker, I ask all to join me in congratulating the Living Christmas Tree performers on another outstanding performance, and I look forward to celebrating next year with them for the 31st anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to congratulate Dorothy and Donald Dempsey for 66 years of marriage. The Dempseys are a corner store family of Herring Cove, and Dorothy and Donald are two of the family's most respected individuals. Dorothy and Donald have many children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, including their neighbour, who is their son and daughter-in-law, Terry and Darlene. Terry and Darlene play, had a huge impact on me as a youth, including feeding me and giving me a roof over my head. Dorothy and Donald should be proud of their family they raised and the lives they have created. Happy 66 to both of you, and here is to many more. The Honourable Member for... Picto Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, another Hall of Fame induction awaits Art Hafey. 
the former top featherweight contender of the professional boxing world, will be inducted into the fall into the West Coast Boxing Hall of Fame. Technique and tenacity were the characteristics of this great boxer. Art's induction will take place on October 4th in Hollywood, California. Hafey is already in the Pictou County Sports Heritage Hall of Fame as well as the Nova Scotia Sports Hall of Fame. Hafey was a rising star in Canada's boxing circles when he went to California in 1972 to pursue the World Featherweight Championship. His overall record shows he won 53 boats, lost eight and hit four draws. He scored 36 knockouts during his career. I would ask all members of this legislature to join me today in congratulating boxing great Art Hafey on his induction into the West Coast Boxing Hall of Fame. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro, Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to applaud the vocal and theatrical talent of the Guysboro Academy High School Drama Program and their excellent production of the hit musical Grease. Wowing the audience with their excellent effort and outstanding performance, the drama program certainly put in the hard work and brought an incredible amount of creativity to the stage to make their production of Greece the success that delighted the community. <clears throat> With their first show on the 14th of February quickly selling out, the drama program had to put on a second performance for the 28th of February by popular demand. Hosted in the amazing Chedebukto Performance Center, a 300-seat theater located in the heart of Geysero, people came from far and wide to enjoy a night of musical theater. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the Geysero Academy High School drama program on their musical theater production of Greece and wish them all the best in their future performances I'm sure they'll continue to shine on the theatre stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Island View High School Enhancement Society for recently becoming a Southeastern Community Health Board grant recipient. This committee gains funds through donations, grants and fundraising throughout the year. The committee is in place to help fund items for sports teams like the mascot costume and a new score, scoreboard for the school, uh, new technological devices, a camera for the photo club, science kits and art supplies, just to name a few. Although it is a small group, the hard work and continued dedication from this group of volunteers does not go unnoticed. I would like to recognize the chair and former candidate of record, Nancy Jakeman, Michelle Myers and Krista Shannon, and former MLA, Kevin DeVoe. Um, this group volunteer on so many things that I could be doing member statements about them almost on a daily basis. It is a pleasure to work with them. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in thanking all of the members of the Island View High School Enhancement Society for their tireless effort in generously giving back to their community and especially the students of Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, at the end of November, I was honoured to attend the annual Order of Nova Scotia induction ceremony, where a posthumous award was given to David Matthew McKeege of Halifax, Armdale. David was a father, husband, dreamer, optimist, and a four-time cancer survivor, whose tireless work brought about Brigadoon Village in the Annapolis Valley. Today, Brigadoon Village is Canada's largest pediatric illness camp program where children can be children regardless of their illness and challenges, and where no child is defined by their diagnosis. He also brought together stakeholders from across the health, academic, not-for-profit, and public sectors to form lasting partnerships that would help to transform our health system far beyond the walls of Brigadoon Village. David's life was defined by his optimism and his resilience, and his biggest joy in life was being, being a dad to his son, Bennett. He made Nova Scotia a better place for all, and I ask everyone to join me in thanking him for that. Rest in peace, David. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay homage to Etherin Gorham, who passed away on November 29, 2019, at the age of 78 after a courageous battle with cancer. Etherin was long involved in his community of Woods Harbour. He was a dedicated educator, having had the opportunity to positively impact the lives of so many. He served in the Woods Harbour Fire Department for 20 years, as a councillor for the municipality of Barrington for nine years, and as a deacon at the Calvary United Baptist Church. He was dedicated to serving numerous community organizations throughout his lifetime. 
As a strong supporter of uh, the Progressive Conservative Party, Etherin ran as a candidate in Shelburne in 1978 and 1984. I ask that all members of the Legislature to join me in extending condolences to Etherin's wife, uh, Helen, and his daughters, Jane and Joanna, and to celebrate the life of a man who gave so much of himself for the betterment of his community. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to recognize Suzanne Barkowski as she steps down as chair for the Lake of the Woods Homeowners Association. Suzanne was elected to this role in February of 2015. In addition to her regular duties as chair over the past five years, Suzanne has been instrumental on a number of major neighborhood projects. She has dedicated endless hours to addressing concerns and looking after interests and infrastructure for the neighborhood. She worked with various levels of government to reduce the speed limit in the neighborhood, install a new playground, arrange an emergency fire exit between abutting subdivisions, organize the annual fun day events, and launch the annual Christmas light competition. She was also the coordinator of Tantown Citizens on Patrol and worked closely with the RCMP to patrol the area and report suspicious activity. Notably, Suzanne facilitated the sale of a parcel of land near Lake of the Woods to the Five Bridges Wilderness Heritage Trust for the preservation and protection of 50 acres of undeveloped land. The beautifully forested area next to the BLT and Bluff Trails has wetlands like Cranberry Bog, wildlife habitat, and is home to increasingly rare flora and fauna. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the House of Assembly to join me in thanking Suzanne for volunteerism and commitment to the Lake of the Woods subdivision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on February 5th, I had the opportunity to participate in World Read Aloud Day and read to two classes at Fairview Heights Elementary. As a former teacher, this day is always special for me because it raises awareness about the importance of literacy and encourages parents and their kids to spend time and read a good book together. Many reports and studies indicate that reading aloud to children is the single most important activity for building their knowledge for eventual success in reading. According to Scholastic, more than 80% of both kids and parents love read aloud time because they consider it a very special time together. I know that when I was a child, reading with my mom and dad was probably the best part of the day. World Read Aloud Day is now in its 11th year and is celebrated in over 173 countries, so I say that that's a huge success. Mr. Speaker, I want to extend my thanks to Fairview Heights Elementary for allowing me to read to their students and for encouraging literacy both at school and at home. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Wayne Buttle, the rink manager at the Thorburn Rink. When young people from Pictou East were being bused to Trenton for ice time, Wayne was instrumental in ensuring the children of Pictou East had access to a, a rink. Wayne made many applications for federal and provincial grants and approached community members for contributions. Finally, his dream of opening a rink in such a rural location became a reality 45 years ago. The first official game included a team with the Nova Scotia Legislature versus the Thorburn Terrors. I want to thank Wayne for all the time and effort he has dedicated to keeping the rink operating for all these years. The people of Pictou East are forever grateful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the author, Brad Kelm of Fall River, on his newest release, The Russian. Brad Kellen is the author of uh, Blake Waiter Mystery Series, which is uh, set in Halifax. This is the second book in his series, with the first being released in 2018, entitled Tell Me More. Dr. Brad Kellen is a clinical and forensic psychologist based in Halifax, as uh, well as a special consultant to both the Halifax Regional Police and the Nova Scotia RCMP on hostage negotiation and criminal investigations. Kiln book are filled with action, humor, and psychology. Mr. Speaker, please join me in congratulating Lady Brad on his new release, and with him, much success with the Blake Waiter Mysteries. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, uh, as we conclude Social Enterprise Week in Nova Scotia, I want to shout out the Social Enterprise Network of Nova Scotia, a non-profit member-led society that is building this important sector which contributes to the social, cultural, economic and environmental well-being of our province. The Social Enterprise 
uh, Network of Nova Scotia is hosted at Common Good Solutions, based in Halifax Needham. And Common Good Solutions also deserves a huge shout out. It will be hosting the Social Enterprise World Forum in Halifax in September. This annual event was first held in Edinburgh, Scotland in 2008 and has since been held on six continents. Nova Scotia has about 1,000 purpose-led businesses that are creating job opportunities and other economic benefits, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, while accomplishing social, environmental and cultural objectives, and they deserve uh, this government support all year round. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to say a big thank you to a woman who has been volunteering with the Bedford District Girl Guides for more than nine years. Susan Manning's involvement with the Girl Guides shows she's committed, serious, and ambitious for our guides. She's described as a strong and intentional leader who puts thought into every decision she makes. She brings real-life experience to the meetings she runs for her guides. Susan has held many positions locally as well as nationally. She's been the guider and unit treasurer for the first Bedford Rangers. She's been the Bedford District Cookie Manager, the Girls' First Steering Committee member, and the Girls' First Champion member. Susan was a program intern at our Chalet World Center in Switzerland, a Girls' First Nations Steering Committee member, and a Diversity and Inclusion Action Group member. Susan has guided and influenced the lives of many young people through her work with the guides, and I want to commend her for the, the profound impact she's had on so many. Well done. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to talk about a difficult subject that touches too many lives, the disease of, uh, of dementia and Alzheimer's. These diseases are terrible, and those suffering from them aren't the only ones impacted by the awfulness of the diagnosis. Recently in Guysboro, a dementia Alzheimer's caregiver support group meeting was set up under the dedicated and compassionate leadership of Ursula Ryan. They are working to establish a dementia caregiver support group in Guysboro and surrounding areas to help provide support and information. The efforts underway to establish the Guysboro Dementia Alzheimer's Caregiver Support Group has been warmly received by the community as it is seen as an important and pressing need for those impacted as caregivers. Mr. Speaker, it is encouraging to see how many positive efforts underway to support those in our community providing care to those in need. I'd like to commend Ursula for her efforts and offer my well wishes to her caregivers and the Guysboro Dementia Alzheimer's Caregiver Support Group. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If there are no more member statements. We'll just await the arrival of question period in a few seconds. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, following the closure of Northern Pulp, the province projected a $400 million decrease in our forestry industry. That's a $400 million hit to our economy that will impact thousands of families across the entire province, and they're working in many different fields, as we all know. Uh, that's $400 million this year. 400 million next year, and so on and so on, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with that in mind, I wonder if the Premier can explain how he was able to calculate the $50 million that he uh, initially allocated for the transition fund. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, the Honourable Member is referring uh, to a number that would uh, be real, Mr. Speaker, if the entire sector uh, disappeared across the province. He's very right. This hits every community from one end of Nova Scotia to the other. Uh, we knew there would be a transition, uh, Mr. Speaker, when it came, uh, particularly 
uh, in the ecosystem of our forestry sector, when we look at the men and women who were out in the woods uh, each and every day, some of them would have to transition. They would still be working. Some may not be. Uh, the $50 million, Mr. Speaker, uh, was part of an analysis that we did to say, uh, how can we best provide programming and support? Uh, and if there's more money required, Mr. Speaker, we as a government will continue to support that sector. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I hope the Premier will be willing to table that analysis. But uh, just for clarity, the $400 million is what, is what the hit to the overall industry. The overall industry actually, um, for the Premier's information, was in the range of $2 billion. So it's not completely disappearing. That's not a, that's not a number uh, that's at the high end. That's the number that the Premier's economist and his, his, his department has come up with. That's the hit. So uh, we know that a transition team was put in place to oversee this fund. But it remains unclear how often that team is meeting, what their goal lines are. So the funds have been allocated, but as far as we can tell, there's been no, no measurements, nothing put in place to measure what success of that transition team would look like. So given the government's history on this file, it is critical that there be planning and some thoughtful analysis into what success looks like. So I'd, I'd ask the Premier, in, in, in light of the $400 million hit that's pro projected, what is the target uh, that the Premier would use to determine whether or not the transition team has been successful? The Honourable Premier. Uh, it will be uh, the men and women in the industry, Mr. Speaker, that will determine that and benefit from the commitments that the, the transition team is doing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he would know. We've already uh, committed uh, uh, more money uh, to silver culture roads being built. He would also know we just recently announced a new capital tax investment specifically for the forestry sector that we believe private sector will uh, add investment into their equipment to do value added, which would deal with some of the chips and residuals that are there. Uh, that is uh, ideas that have come from the transition team uh, that have been communicated out in policy. Uh, and we, again, have set aside that $50 million that uh, will continue to work with good ideas uh, to how do we best support uh, everyone uh, in, this, in, in this industry, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, the, the Premier has already demonstrated that he was completely unclear as to the size of the forestry industry, the potential impact that this would have. Uh, and when government allocates money, when government allocates $50 million to something or whatever number will, will end up being, it's very useful if they have some idea of what uh, success looks like. Will it be effective? Will it not be effective? And time and time again we see that this government is not really that thoughtful about why they're doing certain things. So I would ask the, the Premier a very specific question. In light of a, of a projected $400 million hit to our economy, what does success look like? Is it a return of that $400 million? Is it better than that $400 million? Is it something less than that $400 million? Has the Premier given any thought to what this industry will look like if his transition team and taxpayer investment is successful? What is successful, the Premier? Honourable Premier. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, success, Mr. Speaker, is continuing to uh, grow the economy of this province, uh, continue to ensure that people are working, Mr. Speaker. Lowest unemployment rate in the history of our province, Mr. Speaker. That's success. Continuing young people see a future for themselves here, Mr. Speaker. This sector is transitioning to a new tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. As you know, the Leahy Report was transitioning it as well over the next 10 years. We will continue to transition that. Uh, the Honourable Member uh, knows uh, that uh, this sector uh, had, had a hit, Mr. Speaker, when it came to the pulp mill. Uh, there are environmental obligations that, that the mill was unable to meet. Uh, I don't believe the Honourable Member suggested we should continue to pollute, or I hope he isn't. Uh, the reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, there's a process for that mill to go forward. They're going to do, hopefully, an environmental assessment to determine whether they want to make the capital investment to reopen that mill. We're working with them to put it on a hide idle. But, Mr. Speaker, we're going to deal with the issue of Boat Harbour. We're going to protect the environment of this province, and we're going to continue to grow good jobs and good opportunities for Nova Scotians here. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask the Premier about the Health Authority. In, in November, the, the then interim CEO of the Authority, Janet Davison, described the NSHA this way, overtly complex and bureaucratic, confusing, and a structure that does not allow us to easily address challenges unique to individual zones, unquote. Uh, does the Premier 
agree with Ms. Davison about the negative consequences of his government's focus on centralizing health services in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, uh, I want to thank the member for the question. It's a very good question. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Davis for her work uh, as uh, uh, the interim CEO, Mr. Speaker, which she clearly highlighted. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, she articulated that the One Health Authority is an important thing for Nova Scotia. What she was referring to uh, was that uh, some decisions need to be made out in parts of the province, Mr. Speaker, in, in zones and areas. Uh, we agree with that. The health authorities agree with that, and there's actions being taken to provide more site-based uh, decision-making. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the province's Key health indicators have continued to worsen since the establishment of the NSHA. The percentage of people uh, in the province with regular access to a health care provider has decreased. The percentage of people in the province who believe they are in good health has declined. And the number of people in the province reporting mental health problems has increased. I'll table this data. Does the Premier acknowledge that while his government has been focused on centralizing health care services, actual health indicators, key ones, have worsened in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've seen uh, over the last uh, uh, number of years uh, the number of people who are looking for primary care is going down. Mr. Speaker, more people are being attached to primary care teams across the province. We're, we have the fourth best record in the entire country, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to attaching our citizens to primary caregivers. Uh, the Honourable Member, though, uh, highlights a real issue, and part of that has been in the infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, with inside of our province. Not only in the massive investments we're making in our regional hospitals, Mr. Speaker, but the fact in collaborative care models. Uh, that uh, health care providers are telling us today, doctors, nurse practitioners, all telling us they want to work in a collaborative team. That's why we've continued to invest to ensure that we provide a collaborative care a model around the province. And by doing so, Mr. Speaker, we're attracting more people to provide the very care the Honourable Member is referring to. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, despite centralization, uh, health disparities between the regional zones are key characteristics of the period since the inauguration of the Health Authority. Uh, life expectancy, for example, is almost three years lower in the eastern zone than it is in the central zone. Diabetes is nearly twice as prevalent in the eastern zone as it is in the central zone. So I want to ask the Premier, can he point to any evidence that this whole centralization project has done anything to significantly address geographic disparities in key health outcomes, key health outcomes in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what uh, he is highlighting is the very fact, uh, and some of the uh, numbers here are quoting, Mr. Speaker, were part of the fractured health care system we had in this province. Uh, under one health authority, we recognize, Mr. Speaker, the cancer rates in Cape Breton. We needed to make a substantial investment in cancer care in Cape Breton Island, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. That's what we're continuing to do to respond. But under the old system, where it was fractured, Mr. Speaker, they were looking at it in nine different ways and in nine different lenses. This is one lens, but I will give the Honourable Member this thing, and we know this as we go through this. We are allowing more site-based management to continue, but we will continue to have an overarching umbrella how we deliver primary health care and acute care to our citizens in this province. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The wait times in Industrial Cape Breton for mental health services are the highest in the province at nearly 300 days. And uh, Rob, Rob Murphy wrote a song about the wait times. It's called 300 Days. It, it, is, a, it is a painful uh, song. And there's one line in there that says, you could have helped her, uh, but she was easier to ignore for 300 days. No one should have to wait 300 days for help. And this is a song about somebody who couldn't. Um, and in this budget uh, for uh, mental health services, the budget was increased by just $550,000. I'd, like I'd like the Premier to explain uh, what his plan is to shorten wait times for mental health services across the province. The Honourable uh, but Premier. Particularly in Industrial Cape Breton. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member would know, uh, the new health agreement at the national government dedicates funding directly towards uh, mental health. We will make those investments. He also would know uh, if he's followed the last number of budgets, the investments we're making in our education system around uh, Schools Plus put wraparound supports and systems to help identify the issue of mental health early and then provide 
those initiatives, and we're listening, Mr. Speaker, to the mental health professionals. Uh, both uh, the, Dr. Stan Kucher, uh, Star Dobson, Mr. Speaker, have all provided support and input, uh, and we'll continue to make uh, those investments. Uh, uh, the honourable members are raising a, a very important issue uh, for those families and those individuals who are suffering. Uh, we need our support uh, uh, today, Mr. Speaker. It's why we continue to make the investment in, in every one of our budgets. Uh, but it's also important, and I think everyone would identify that the earlier we can identify the issues of adolescent mental health, the easier it is for us to provide those supports. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I do agree that when it's obvious to everyone around them that somebody is struggling with mental health, it, it is good when we, uh, when we acknowledge that and try to reach out with help. Uh, the actual dollars spent on addictions and mental health in this province are somewhere in the range of $176 million. And if we looked at mental health spending on its own, uh, it would, it, there are only eight departments. Uh, eight departments of government that have larger budgets. So I'd like the I'd like to, the premier to to address the fact in light of you know, the premier's been premier for two consecutive governments. Wait times continue to increase. Uh, things are not getting better uh, in healthcare. Things are not getting better for those seeking mental health services. I'd like the premier to to comment on. Does the premier agree uh, that addictions and mental health are such a significant issue in this province that they warrant a dedicated department with a dedicated minister? who would be responsible and accountable for making sure that people get the help they need when they need it, not 300 days later. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the reality of it is we continue to make investments in mental health in every year, Mr. Speaker. We're, uh, it's the largest investment in the history of our province in this current budget, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're going to continue to make those investments, continue to provide supports uh, for families, and we're going to continue uh, Mr. Speaker, to listen to the clinicians, the professionals, Mr. Speaker, who uh, tell us uh, that you need to do this on the evidence base. You need to make sure these decisions are being made because some cases, Mr. Speaker, decisions governments have made in the past have actually not helped. They've actually made the issue worse. Uh, so, the, so the psychiatrists are telling you, make those investments based on evidence. And that's what we're working to do, Mr. Speaker. And I don't believe creating more bureaucracy, Mr. Speaker, around the issue is going to help those families who require support. The Honourable Member for Pickard West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. 23-year-old Chantel Lindsay of Toro died last week after a lifelong battle with CF. I know all MLAs in the chamber joined me in sending condolences to her family and friends. She truly was an incredible person. In the final months of her life, Lindsay's family and health care team fought for access to a breakthrough medication for the disease called Trichafta, a drug available in the U.S. but not yet in Canada. Lindsay's team applied for compassionate coverage to obtain this drug, but they were denied, Mr. Speaker. So my question is, has the minister contacted his federal counterparts to make sure Trichafta and other life-saving drugs are available when Nova Scotians need them. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the, the member highlighted, uh, certainly a lot of public awareness. Many Nova Scotians are, are aware of the, the, the tragic uh, uh, events uh, that have taken place. Uh, we also know that uh, with the, uh, the work, one of the priorities uh, between, uh, within health uh, right now is about uh, pharmaceutical uh, services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's a, an agenda item that we uh, continue to uh, engage in with our federal government. Uh, we know that they are uh, moving forward uh, with work on a national pharmacare. In this particular uh, case, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the manufacturer has not uh, reached out to uh, provide that particular drug uh, in Canada, uh, although I certainly know that the uh, federal government, uh, Health Canada, was prepared to uh, move forward with uh, approval in a, an expedited way. The Honourable Member for Picto West. Mr. Speaker, we have all heard of sad stories like Chantel's where an expensive drug could have saved a life. It's gut-wrenching for families to know that a parent or a child needs a drug that exists and works, but they can't afford it. To know that as hard as you work to provide for the ones you love, it might not be enough to get them the thing they need the most, to live. So my question is, will the minister tell the House how much money is in this budget to help Nova Scotians with the cost of expensive, rare disease drugs? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member uh, for the question. Uh, what uh, we have is uh, continued investment and expanded investment in our pharmaceutical, uh, pharma care programs, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, both within our, our seniors' pharma care as well as our family pharma care program. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind the member that just uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, I, in my first year as uh, Minister of uh, Health and Wellness, we brought in a new program for expensive uh, cancer take-home uh, drugs, Mr. Speaker, uh, the first of a uh, first of its kind here in, in the province, Mr. Speaker, to start a program uh, to provide that. So we've been responsive, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to be responsive, but we will follow uh, the advice and, and the, uh, the clinical uh, recommendations when it comes to uh, the, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, drugs within the formulary. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the industry of forestry in Nova Scotia is in a state of transition. On top of all that uncertainty, the viability of their future, another topic remains in the mind of many harvesters. In 2015, a deputy minister's meeting in Nova Scotia committed to 2020 biodiversity goals and targets. My question for the minister, is Nova Scotia still committed to the 2020 biodiversity goals and targets set for Canada in 2015? The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we work with the federal government on the uh, international agreements that went through, and we continue to work with our partners and in, uh, industry and the uh, environmental groups across the province to ensure that we look at ways that we can improve the biodiversity. It is one of the most uh, pressing, along with climate change, it's a pressing issue of our time, biodiversity loss, not only in uh, Nova Scotia, but across the country and across the international community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank, thank the Minister for that response. In 2017, man, uh, the mandate letter to then Minister of Natural Resources, a Biodiversity Council was to be established. That was accomplished in May of 2018 with four prominent members. This council lost a member shortly thereafter that took a position within the department. My question for the Minister, does the council now have a full complement of members and how many times did they meet in 2019? The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't have the exact number how many times they meet. They meet uh, regularly. This is uh, a group of people that uh, are focused on, on the science. They're from the uh, academia community. Uh, we value the input, but of course, uh, the, when there was an opportunity for one of those members to actually uh, work with the department uh, with the expertise that they have, uh, uh, the person actually is from the Mi'kmaq community, we uh, welcomed her into the department and we are looking to fill that position currently. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadamid Valley. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last November, there was an accident, a significant one, that uh, took out the Dillman Bridge in Myers Grant. Uh, no one was hurt, but the bridge is deemed irreparable and unsafe, and it was removed in December. A detour was created, but this detour has a significant <coughs> amount of time to go anywhere from that area. I've been informed that TIR determined that a temporary structure was not feasible. Uh, could the minister provide an explanation of why it was not feasible? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for the question. Uh, the, uh, we understand that many in the community are anxious to have the bridge replaced. As the member pointed out, this was the result of an accident. Uh, regular inspections uh, on the bridge found it to be fine, uh, but uh, it, it was uh, an encountered uh, a, a collision with a, with a truck. And uh, so our staff have been conducting the uh, geotechnical and preliminary design work as to what we're planning on doing there, and it is actually due for replacement in 2021. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that partially answers the question. My next one. Uh, it is an important connection, and uh, a lot of people are concerned that uh, emergency services uh, may not be able to get through at the uh, proper time. Um, just for their peace of mind, uh, is there an actual date in which that bridge may be replaced so that uh, the folks will know what is happening? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, as I indicated, uh, the uh, uh, capital plan would see the bridge replaced in 2021. Uh, we are aware of the uh, six-kilometer detour that is currently in place, uh, and we're also understanding that uh, uh, folks are taking the coal road, which cuts that uh, uh, detour down to 1.5 uh, kilometers. Uh, so we are, uh, have this in our design process and uh, hope to have it 
completed as quick as we physically can. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Justice. My office was contacted by a constituent who I personally know. Uh, on Saturday, February the 15th, at uh, approximately 10 p.m., uh, this person was a passenger in a vehicle that was stopped by the Halifax Regional Police. When the officer was asked for the reason for the stop, he explained that he was checking for impaired drivers. The officer was informed that no one in the vehicle had drank alcohol that night or drank at all. The officer then informed the occupants of the vehicle, all of whom were black, that in Nova Scotia, a vehicle can be stopped for any reason. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister is, would he please clarify if the statement that in Nova Scotia, a vehicle can be stopped for any reason is true? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the way it's worded um, brings complexity to the comment and the circumstances, but I'll say this. Uh, law enforcement officers in the province of Nova Scotia have the authority to stop a motor vehicle and ask the operator for a driver's license, registration for the vehicle, and insurance. That's embedded in provincial statute, Mr. Speaker, and common law. That's what gives the, the police the authority to stop vehicles. Mr. Speaker, what takes place after that initial stop is based on the authority that the police officer possesses. At no time should police be going beyond their authority when they engage operators or passengers of vehicles. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Mr. Speaker, I'm curious to know, uh, after we made some inquiries with the Halifax Regional Police Department, uh, my office was told that there were actually two stops that were conducted that evening between 9 uh, p.m. and 12 a.m., and it was confirmed that uh, in both cases the drivers of those vehicles uh, were individuals of colour. Mr. Speaker, I just want the Minister, can he confirm that racial profiling and street check have ceased in the province of Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague uh, would know well that uh, we have banned street checks in the province of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the law enforcement community uh, are aware of that ban, and there's an expectation amongst our police community that they respect that. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. For several months, our caucus has been pressing this government on progress towards the overdue targets in the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act. Recently, we were delivered a rude update when we learned that Efficiency Nova Scotia has cancelled its mercury recycling program. Mercury-filled light bulbs will now head to the landfill instead. The reason given is that the legis legislated targets have been met by Nova Scotia Power and there are no new targets in sight. Mr. Speaker, what other programs are headed to the landfill now that we are several months and counting without new environmental goals on the books? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I thank the member for that question. Um, certainly, any time we talk about what gets into the environment, uh, it's important for Nova Scotians to realize that there are substances out there that uh, we need to protect the environment from, mercury being one of them. Um, there are programs out there now, certainly through our uh, municipal um, HHW sites where uh, residents can take their mercury to. Also, there are some private sector uh, initiatives where we see thermostats, that thermostats can actually also be recycled. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's surprising to a lot of Nova Scotians, actually, when you raise the topic that there even still is mercury out there. It is being banned in CCFs, and, and within time, uh, it will be a part of a stream that will eventually disappear, but I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to raise the opportunity to express that, that uh, if anybody does have mercury, uh, go to their HHW sites at their municipal offices. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, last session, our caucus submitted a comprehensive list of amendments to the Sustainable Development Goals Act, asking for measurable targets for renewable energy, local food procurement, green job creation, and electric transportation, among others. They were all rejected. This week in Committee of the Whole House on Supply, we learned that the government cannot report on its local food procurement and local farm production goals because it hasn't really been keeping that information and has no baseline data to use. 
Mr. Speaker, these are targets that were written into law. Why can't this government give us basic updates on our progress toward addressing the climate crisis and environmental sustainability? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I, th I thank the member for the question. I think at this point in time, we should stand here very proud that we have some of the most aggressive uh, targets in greenhouse gas emissions. We, uh, we, lead, we lead the country in waste diversion. Um, we've uh, just banned plastics. We have uh, one of the most aggressive pieces of legislation in our uh, sustainable development goals legislation. And around that, the points that she's making are very, very valid. Uh, we, we are working very uh, aggressively at this point in time, preparing for consultation. Uh, what we want to do is hear from Nova Scotians on what they feel is important that should go into that legislation. We will continue to lead the country. Um, we are uh, being seen by people like the Suzuki Foundation as leaders in this country in what we're doing. And we will continue as Nova Scotians to set that goal and keep that bar high for other provinces to uh, follow. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, a review was initiated of the Yarmouth Area Cancer Services, and the report was completed in 2018 and concluded at the time not to build and operate a radiation therapy unit in Yarmouth. The report recommended by a majority to support the delivery of equity enhancing measures to enhance care for uh, residents of Southwest Nova Scotia, such as travel support, improve appointment uh, coordination. Uh, and more. I'd like to table an article from December 2019 with the title Recommendations to Enhance Cancer Services in Southwest Nova Scotia Expected in the New Year. So my question for the Minister is what is the timetable uh, time for these recommendations to be presented to government and when can residents of Southwest Nova Scotia expect their implementation? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I thank uh, the member for uh, the question. Uh, the uh, work, uh, both the review and the uh, continued work, uh, is uh, being led uh, predominantly by uh, Dr. Bethune and his uh, team with Cancer Care Nova Scotia. Uh, so that work is uh, underway already. In fact, uh, uh, aspects such as the, the work around uh, being more efficient with the scheduling, scheduling that um, is designed to take into account, I think, in the past there were times where uh, you might have multiple uh, appointments for the same condition in the city uh, that would require people to spend uh, an extra night in, in the city. They're working to coordinate the uh, health care needs so that people can do it in, in one visit that may not require a night. So all of that work is actually underway uh, and some aspects that are being able to be implemented uh, are being implemented as soon as they, they are. So some of the work has already been done. Uh, there is still more, more work to be done and the committee's uh, active at that. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. You know, as more time uh, passes before all these recommendations are implemented, uh, Nova Scotians are suffering. Uh, this lengthens the burden on, uh, on Nova Scotians and my constituents, uh, particularly the financial burden uh, compounded by on the impacts of cancer. So I'm concerned uh, that these delays are costly not only to my constituents but right across uh, the health care system. So my question for the Minister of Health is what are the costs associated Associated with delaying these services to the people of Southwest Nova Scotia. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we, cer Mr. Speaker, uh, we certainly uh, recognize. Uh, the importance of uh, providing uh, cancer care uh, services uh, to all Nova Scotians. Uh, we recognize the, the burden, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, in, in part uh, based upon uh, the advocacy of uh, residents uh, within Southwest Nova in the Yarmouth uh, area, and, and uh, the member for Yarmouth uh, certainly uh, brought these uh, concerns forward, including, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I mentioned in a previous uh, response, uh, introducing uh, coverage for take home, a program for take-home cancer, uh, Mr. Speaker, which I know uh, constituents of the member of Yarmouth uh, brought forward. So again, we know the advocacy, the recognition, and the awareness of, uh, uh, of uh, cancer treatment uh, services and supports. We recognize them, and we've been investing uh, to support them and all Nova Scotians. 
The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. I received a letter from two doctors from Pictou County with concerns about a recent bed uh, closure at the Aberdeen Hospital. Last month, they lost four of their 10 ICU beds. The doctors and staff affected by these changes were not involved in any discussions about these cuts. Over the past three years, the occupancy rate far exceeded the recommendation of 85 percent, with an average of 97 percent they needed these beds for. So, to not consult staff about changes that affect their ability to provide health care is simply not fair, Mr. Speaker. So, I'd like the minister to uh, let us know why are people who are affected the most by these cuts not being consulted? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, bed closures uh, at uh, the facility, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I believe there have been some uh, reclassification uh, adjustment of the beds, uh, beds being uh, targeted uh, to uh, the areas uh, in need, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that uh, work is uh, undertaken in, in reviews and analysis uh, completed by uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority responsible for administering and managing our, our hospitals. Uh, uh, I would certainly, my expectation obviously is that uh, when they are making these site-based uh, decisions that they are engaged with uh, the clinical experts uh, to help inform and advise the optimal use of those resources and make sure the beds are allocated where they're uh, most uh, in need. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Mr. Speaker, I received the same letter the Minister did last week and I will make sure I table that later or provide it to him. At the Aberdeen, in the operating room, every single morning starts with um, a negotiation between doctors for beds. This is unacceptable. On a site where there are not enough beds, four of the 10 ICU beds were cut. In 2019, 23 orthopedic surgeries were cancelled. This past January alone, 24 elective surgeries were cancelled due to the lack of beds. Outpatient care was compromised by moving ER admitted patients into outpatient clinic space. The inability, Mr. Speaker, to deliver health care compromises the relationship with patients and health care workers. So my question for the Minister of Health, why were cuts made to a hospital that was already struggling to provide health care? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, as I uh, stated in, in my previous response, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware of any cuts uh, being made uh, at that facility. Uh, all of the uh, resources uh, within uh, the facility in, in terms of bed counts, are, 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 as, as uh, far as uh, I'm aware, are still uh, within the facility. Uh, the uh, allocation or the distribution of beds uh, for the purposes uh, for which they're uh, being allocated towards may shift, um, but that is not bed closures, uh, Mr. Speaker. That is uh, uh, realignment. Uh, Again, uh, when uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority is making those operational decisions within e individual uh, sites of hospitals, of course I expect uh, those recommendations to be coming and, and, uh, and following uh, the best clinical uh, delivery of service models to ensure that the, pa the patients and the residents of the community get the best care possible. That's certainly the expectation and uh, I'll certainly uh, follow up uh, on the specific uh, site and beds uh, allocated as uh, noted in the letter uh, the member has tabled. The Honourable Member for Pictos. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister for uh, LAE. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Nova Scotians and former employees in Pinto County are already feeling the impact from the shutdown of Northern Pulp. I have recently had three separate displaced workers come to my office requesting direction with respect to children they have at various universities across the province. The problem, Mr. Speaker, the eligibility and the amount of student loan is based on the previous year incomes of parents and legal guardians. This will be a further burden on this particular group of now unemployed mill workers. My question to the Minister, has the Minister and his department given any thought to this aspect of further hardship with this group of displaced workers we'll be dealing with? Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the member for the very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our student loan program already has in place 
that if a parent loses a job or loses an income, that will be a factor in their future student loans. So for the individuals who are applying coming up in uh, this summer for next year's school, that will definitely be a factor. And even if their income shows is too high for the previous year, um, the, the student loan department will look at what their current situation is, factor that in, and uh, at that point, uh, most likely the individual would qualify for a student loan. Thank the you. Honourable Member for Pitco Centre. Um, I Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member uh, for the minister for that answer. Uh, in one particular case, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, one particular uh, family said if, if things aren't adjusted that their child will not be able to attend the fourth year of university and finish off their undergrad. So I guess there's uh, my question to the minister. There, there is a little bit of confusion from, from, from the end of the uh, parents and the information that they're getting. So. Um, I guess my question would be, what is the, uh, is there any particular process that they should go through and how, how soon can they go through it without with getting that type of advice? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. I would encourage uh, any individual in that situation to reach out to the Student Loan Department um, and then just inquire. Every situation is different and in the calculation they look at not only the income of the household, but they look at how many dependents there are. If there's any other dependents, such as uh, you're taking care of parents, that factors in as well in terms of what student loans are. Um, one thing I will say about the student loan program, especially this year, I encourage all families to apply for it because the Nova Scotia portion starting this year, moving forward, will not, will not only be forgivable for university students getting a Nova Scotia student loans, but in this budget it will be also forgiven for all community college students getting a Nova Scotia student loan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's, Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Nova Scotians expect the health system to be there when they need it. But for the people on the South Shore who attend the Cardiovascular Health Clinic in Bridgewater, the service they relied on closed without any warning at the end of January. There was no notice, no communication with patients, no warning. Actually, Mr. Speaker, some patients found out by calling the clinic and hearing from a voicemail message. While it's true the nurse practitioner at the clinic moved on to another job, the NSHA had had more than ample time to find a replacement. Can the minister explain why these patients were given no warning that the heart clinic would no longer be open to treat them? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. As uh, the member uh, rightly indicated, the NSHA is uh, actively uh, recruiting uh, to fill uh, the position. Uh, as we've uh, discussed uh, in, in numerous uh, different types of uh, questions uh, on the floor here uh, over the uh, past uh, number of sittings, Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, the member would know uh, that one of the challenges with filling uh, vacant positions is uh, the supply of uh, qualified healthcare professionals. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we've expanded the number of uh, nurse practitioner seats at Dalhousie Medical School to have more uh, nurse practitioners available. We've provided an incentive program that will actually support the, those nurses uh, training uh, who will uh, sign a return of service in areas of high need. And we've expanded uh, physician training opportunities, both medical seats and residents. So we're building the supply, Mr. Speaker, so that the NSHA will be able to more successfully recruit uh, to communities in need. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for the response. Um, without this critical program running, constituents on the South Shore with heart disease will no longer have access to a key part of their recovery journal. And I will note that um, as of this week, there was still no posting to replace this position on the NSHA website. Uh, research in the Heart and Stroke 2018 Misunderstood Report indicates that attendance at the typical 12 to 24 cardiac rehabilitation program can result in a 31% reduction in hospital readmissions and 25% reduction in mortality. And I'll table that document. My question to the minister is, what is the minister's plan for reopening the heart clinic and giving cardiac patients on the South Shore the support they need for better health outcomes? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, I want to 
state uh, clearly that uh, uh, the uh, residents and the patients uh, receiving care do uh, continue to receive care. Uh, that clinic is recognized as an important, valuable part of the health authority's uh, operations, and that's why, Mr. Uh, Speaker, they're working to uh, get uh, the appropriate uh, qualified health care professionals uh, to uh, continue to provide that service. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, that work is ongoing, uh, and uh, we look forward to having it established once the appropriate qualified personnel are made available. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Lands and Forests. Nova Scotia Provincial Parks offer wonderful trails and beautiful views of our great province for all to enjoy. If you are looking to get some fresh air or peace and quiet, provincial parks are the place to go, no matter what time of year. Since provincial parks are becoming more and more popular during the winter months for activities like snowshoeing and cross-country skiing, challenges exist for government to provide services and facilities for the public to use. My question to the Minister, what is the Department's policy related to services such as snow removal and facilities as, such as washrooms during the winter months? The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can get the uh, exact policy for the member opposite. Uh, we continue to uh, make sure that the, uh, all the parks across the, the province uh, have a uh, safe uh, environment for those uh, that are uh, going into our parks, uh, but there is uh, months of the year that unfortunately uh, we do have to uh, close down those parks, uh, and there is uh, snow removal for those ones that are open and, and not for those ones that are closed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for the answer. Petersfield Provincial Park in Westmount is a great place to escape the hustle and bustle and enjoy the great outdoors, no matter what time of year. I have received numerous calls this past winter from my constituents expressing the need for Petersfield Park to be ploughed to allow for parking. As it stands now, residents cannot access the unploughed parking lot unless they're in a 4x4 or SUV. This is causing residents to park alongside the highway, which raises safety concerns. This park is open year-round. So, Mr. Speaker, my question, will the minister commit to providing services and facilities at Petersfield Provincial Park? The Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what I commit, can commit to is looking at uh, this park along with others and look at all uh, balance of considerations in terms of our budget, what we deliver at the parks across the province, ensuring that we do have a consistent approach and give due consideration to what the member is asking. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. For the Minister of Justice. In 2016, this government passed maintenance enforcement legislation to improve the system. I recall the Premier felt this issue was so important that he raised it with the Council of the Federation as a matter affecting all provinces and something that all provinces needed to be working on together. One in four cases at the time was cited as problematic because either the payer, either the payer or the payee had moved to another province. <laughs> the intentions were good, uh, but we supported the legislation here in the opposition. But sadly, I can cite two recent cases where moms are not getting the money they are entitled to from their children's fathers. The fathers are living in other provinces. Can the minister explain why these problems persist three years later? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank my colleague for the question. This is a, a very important issue uh, on our agenda within the Department of Justice. Uh, just recently, I had the opportunity to be in Victoria with federal, provincial, territorial ministers, and this, uh, this issue of interjurisdictional support uh, was the top of the agenda. Uh, it's a matter that uh, we continue to pursue, and I will tell uh, my colleague that as we speak in Nova Scotia now, we have the lowest num amount of arrears in 10 years, Mr. Speaker. Um, <laughs> We, we committed in a previous budget, Mr. Speaker, to increase the resources uh, in New Waterford and the MEP uh, division by five personnel. That's had a significant impact, Mr. Speaker, and will continue uh, to drive that down. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Improvements are good, but there, ideally there'd be zero arrears because there's people being affected. In one case, over $26,000 is owed. Garnishments are in place, but the province attempting to collect from him cannot find him, yet he is employed there. And I'm sure his employer will be sending his T4s to his address, and Revenue Canada will know where that is. In the other, the father has actually been paying, but in that province he is listed as having previously overpaid, while Nova Scotia has him in arrears for over $10,000. If he pays within the system, his money is trapped. 
If he pays outside, he will show us delinquent. So, Mr. Speaker, these are process issues. I've reached out to uh, maintenance enforcement here. I've even contacted an, an, an MP in the province uh, in that case. Uh, the problem persists. Is it time to raise this matter again at the Council of the Federation? Because these interjurisdictional corridors do not seem to be working and children are going out with the, with, going without the funds they deserve. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, <clears throat> the Council themselves have instructed federal, provincial, territorial justice ministers to continue this work. As I said, it was on the agenda uh, just recently in Victoria. I had the opportunity while in Victoria to engage the Premier directly on this subject matter, Mr. Speaker, because it is of critical importance to this government. And I want to give my colleague uh, the opportunity, the circumstances that he's speaking to, uh, to share directly uh, with my office and we can advance that further. These very same circumstances arose, Mr. Speaker, with a, with a, uh, a surviving parent and a single parent in Queens County and through the work, collective work of our offices, Mr. Speaker. We were able to secure $80,000 in, in payment that was owed to that individual, and that individual now, Mr. Speaker, is able to support her children and her community. That's the work that we'll continue to do. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A household is considered food secure if the household has access at all times throughout the year to food for an active, healthy life for all household members. According to the February 18, 2020 article published by the Nova Scotia Finance and Treasury Board, Nova Scotia households are the least food secure in all of Canada at 84.7%. Those are not statistics that we should be proud of, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I understand that there are all kinds of factors that affect food security, but in our province in particular, we don't produce very much food that actually Nova Scotians pr produce. So I'd ask the Minister of Agriculture what bold plans are in place within his department to be able to kickstart food production in this province. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, uh, uh, last Saturday we announced our new uh, Buy Local campaign under Taste of Nova Scotia. It's a, uh, it's a program of ra raising awareness of uh, food that's produced in Nova Scotia. As we move to complete food security in the province, it's going to take us some time. There was goals set in the past, but the goals were set for a number of farms, not the amount of food we were producing, and there was no way of measuring it. So we're going to put a new system in to measure what kind of results we're getting, and indeed we want to become 100% self-sufficient in the province. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, according to the Nova Scotia Finance and Treasury Board's article dated January 6, 2020, on Nova Scotia's total trade for 2018, Nova Scotia imports amounted to $29 billion. Nova Scotia is heavily reliant upon others to provide us with food, fuel, and supplies. And we saw with recent uh, protests and blockades and with Hurricane uh, Dorian that we're really exposed with regard to food and fuel insecurities in this province. So I'm going to ask the uh, member, uh, the Minister for EMO, what do we have in place to ensure that Nova Scotians are prepared in the event of a supply system is cut off or interrupted? The Honourable Minister responsible for the Emergency Measures Organization. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, we certainly work uh, in this most recent example with regards to the blockades, and I'll mm -hmm. speak to that. Uh, we are twice weekly checking in with our provincial, municipal, and critical infrastructure partners to see what the status of supply is. We have a relationship with all of those folks. We'll continue to do so. We will work with our federal partners as well well to ensure that supply chain uh, is open and how we uh, do alter when we need to do to make sure that we have the necessary supplies, such as food and other things like propane that has been an issue that we've heard about. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I spoke in the House uh, a fair amount of times about the, uh, the promised elementary school that was announced uh, two years ago for, for Spring Hill. Um, at that time, uh, the, the minister stated that he was waiting for a technical evaluation of the property. I spoke several times to the minister and we continue to have open dialogue and uh, I've invited him to Spring Hill to tour the uh, facilities and also tour the area to look at possible uh, sites. Uh, will the minister be announcing the site uh, anytime soon and what date would he expect the construction to start? The 
Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, there's been some reasons uh, that have delayed the site selection. Uh, one, there is a tremendous amount of undermining in the Spring Hill community with both legal and, and illegal mines, evidently, uh, that, that exist. Uh, also, as the member would know, we did find a suitable location at the uh, current high school um, to expand that facility. We could have done that on an expedited process, but in fact, we did listen to the member's feedback as well as feedback from municipal officials that said that was not the preferred site for the community. That has also delayed site selection. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing a technical evaluation of sites that indeed the member himself and municipal officials have provided us. Uh, we hope that those technical evaluations can happen and be completed soon, and we hope that one of those sites works so we can get on with this important project. Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that update. Uh, the capital plan last year when it was announced caused quite a stir in Spring Hill that the school that had been uh, talked about for 2021 was moved to 23-24. Um, the Minister has spoken in local media lately that uh, he is still committed to that September 2021. Uh, will the Minister reassure residents that he's still committed to that 2021 opening? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, we're absolutely committed to getting that school built as quickly as possible. There's been um, reasons that I think the community can understand that have impacted the uh, the site selection process uh, and the and and that have that may result in delays but if the school community does like a current uh, design that exists in the system that will expedite the design process and that will shave months off uh, construction at the end of the day order please it's time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired we will now move on to government business Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on Supply. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it is uh, an honour for me and a pleasure to speak into Supply and add in a few comments on the uh, on the budget that we have just seen tabled, a budget uh, that in my seven years here is, I believe, the earliest budget we ever had uh, delivered. Uh, we normally have budgets in April. And here we have a February budget, so that's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, observation, and uh, for which we we really don't know the reason. But one of the thing, one of the impacts of that is that since the government year end is March 31st, for many of the items in the budget, we don't know the actual number. We only have a forecast. One of the things that the budget does give us is a 55 million dollar surplus, and. Uh, of course, uh, Nova Scotians hear that number and think, wow, we have a surplus. And uh, However, there are a few caveats to that $55 billion surplus that I do want to, uh, to raise, and uh, uh, things that are of concern. And uh, I know we've heard the message about how great things are in the province and how well the province is doing, and uh, we have a record number of people in the province. However, at the same time that we have uh, those good messages, we also know that we are the only province in Canada to see an increase in child poverty. Uh, we, are, uh, we are the province in Canada that has the lowest median income of any, any province. So we see the economic prosperity of the country somewhat passing us by, and uh, that is a very great concern. Uh, one issue that we we can say, well, we see in the budget that we have an additional $395 million in transfer payments from Ottawa. So, uh, and I believe the number is approximately $3.6 billion of our transfer payment, of our $11.5 million, $11 million budget is transfer payments from Ottawa. $3.6 billion of money coming to Nova Scotia, which effectively comes from other provinces. So other provinces are paying into the national kitty, and uh, when you look at the uh, the federal government has a formula. I'm not privy to the formula. I'm sure it's out there in public domain. But whatever that formula is, our per capita share. We're not a we're not a contributor, but we're a receiver of that. We receive 3.6 billion dollars, and this year, as I mentioned, 395 million dollars more from the federal government. So in in some way, our economy has continued to falter vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country. And uh, if you think about what I've mentioned, the fact that we have the only province to have had an increase in child poverty, we have the lowest median income of a, uh, family income of any province, and we can see that the seven years of this Liberal government have not, not kept us 
not allowed us to keep pace with the rest of Canada. While it's true our economy has grown, it has not grown at the same pace of the rest of the country. And while it's true our population has grown, I would say that, it, and I don't have those statistics right in front of me, but it would be quite, I'm sure, it's correct to say that our population increase hasn't maintained pace with the rest of the country either. And uh, while we are happy to have a uh, population increase, we want to, be, uh, we want to meet, meet the Canadian average. We want to be part of the Canadian model. We want to be a net contributor to the economy of Canada. Uh, so what uh, the goal would be, Mr. Speaker, to see uh, the transfer payments going down. The goal would be that someday we could be a contributor to the economy of Canada in the sense that we are one of the provinces that is paying in and not taking back. And uh, I believe that is a worthy goal. It should be a goal of ours, not to be going steadily, to see the steadily erosion of our economy compared to the rest of the country. So while there are good news stories in the economic, uh, in the budget, there are also very troubling, troubling indicators. Another troubling indicator to me with the uh, $55 million surplus is that we are adding a billion dollars to our debt. Now, I know the minister has said there's good debt and bad debt, and good debt is for, uh, 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 you know, and I'm sure that the ordinary consumer can understand that. There's uh, debt for consumer goods and there's debt for property, for instance, and, and yes, long-term debt for property is not seen in the same way that consumer debt is. However, when we look at things like what are we spending our money on, we're spending our money on hospitals as a, to a large measure, and I know the public goes, yes, that's good. If we look at the budget that we have before us, the estimated spending on hospital infrastructure last year was $185 million. The projected actual is $124 million. In other words, there was $60 million less than projected spending on hospital infrastructure. Now, I don't know if many of you go into hospitals, but if you do, you will see that there are broken tiles on the floors, there are holes in the walls. Our hospitals are very, very heavily used, and uh, they have a lot of use and abuse, and they need, uh, they need maintenance. I can tell you as a farmer that we repaired our barns and uh, would save us money if I was farming and I had a barn that was slowly breaking down. I wouldn't build a new one just so I didn't have to show it in uh, current, my current operational costs. So rather than build a new barn, uh, I would fix the old one and keep using it. It's penny wise and pound foolish. You're spending billions to, to save money so it looks, it shows up in another part of a budget line when you should maintain the infrastructure you have. And we, uh, how many times did my colleague, my previous colleague, colleague from Northside Westbound bring up the stairs on the Northside General? How many times did he ask a question about that? It took a long time to get those repaired and I question the logic of that. I question uh, the logic of not fixing up and repairing the infrastructure we have, but rather uh, building the shiny new hospital and saying this is going to solve all our problems. And uh, if we don't maintain the new one, we'll rapidly be in the same situation. And uh, we go to, we see in other parts of the world, buildings that are hundreds of years old continue to be used, continue to be cherished. Uh, and even in the, uh, I can tell you, in the Annapolis Valley, many farmers use barns that are hundreds of years old that uh, you would look, you would go in and you think this looks like a new barn, but it's new on the, uh, it's new on the outside, but not new under, under the skin, so to speak. It's post and beams barns that have been renovated to have modern, cleanable surfaces on the inside and outside, and it's always better to maintain what you have than simply to uh, let it fall into disrepair and then build something new. It's always less money in the long run unless there's some overriding reason. And I can tell you that with, uh, when there's equipment changes, for instance, we, we went in the agricultural world from doing everything by hand to doing things with forklifts. Then barns had to be rebuilt to accommodate that. But that hasn't happened in the medical world. We're still walking around on two feet and uh, we still go into the hospitals. We still got to go through the front doors. Uh, and we, we need to do the maintenance in our hospitals. And when I look at that, 
$185 million budget last year, and I see that there was $60 million unspent in maintenance, but we're going to, in, we're going to build a new hospital. And I think about the places that I've been in, the hospitals that I've been in, visiting constituents in the city and in the valley, and the, and the obvious, obvious maintenance issues in those hospitals. I say to the government, shame on you. And my constituents, I can tell you, on roads, another issue, it's a big issue for us, we see the government building a new interchange, and everybody likes the new interchange, and I have people asking me, John, how come we're building a new interchange when we can't take care of the roads we have? And uh, we have serious, serious issues with the roads in Kings North and in the Annapolis Valley in general, mostly in general, I would say. Uh, parts of the Annapolis Valley seem to be very well looked after, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and um, further west, Annapolis County, 130 kilometers of new paving in the last couple of years. Uh, in Kings North, uh, no, not so much, nothing near that. Uh, and uh, we are very concerned about that. And I can tell you that what tears up our roads in Kings County is economic activity. It's 18-wheelers, it's tractors, it's heavy equipment. And that is contributing to the economy of Nova Scotia. And to turn your backs on that and let those roads fall into disrepair is a detriment to the owners of these trucks and vehicles. I've, I've had truck owners say, John, we're not repairing. My trucks are trimming the trees. And the 18-wheelers, uh, the trees that hang over the road, the trucks are the ones that are trimming those trees. And the damage to those trucks is significant to the, to the owners. And then a light gets smashed off on the top of the truck and they get stopped by maintenance, and the via, uh, maintenance enforcement, the vehicle's uh, enforcement. And uh, so we're not doing the maintenance on our roads. We're not doing the maintenance on our hospitals. And we have a $55 million surplus. Hurrah! But we're being, and then we're going to put add another billion dollars this year, a record investment, another billion dollars to our debt to build things when we could have repaired what we had for a tenth of the money. We could have repaired what we had for a tenth of the money, maybe, maybe 20% of the cost. But we could have kept maintenance up on what we have and been better ahead in the long run, better ahead. And if we don't maintain what we have, we'll never get out of this cycle of building new and ignoring the things that we have. What we have a projected, the projection is $2.7 billion added to our debt by 2024 for the new infrastructure. And uh, everybody loves new infrastructure. And I can tell you that the public, and I say, well, they say, yes, we're going to have new hospitals. That's going to solve our problem. The second fundamental problem we have in our hospitals is, besides maintenance, lack of maintenance, not keeping up with maintenance, is human resources. So how is a new building going to, uh, going to help if we're, we're not able to hire the doctors and nurses? And we're short of those uh, skilled professionals now in our province. And we're short the family doctors. So we'll have a new hospital somewhere, but we're, we're falling behind now on hiring those people. So building a new building is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily the solution. I can tell you that, again, in farming, we would plant the crop first and then build the barn. Uh, and that's what I see the apple growers doing. They know that they plant apples three years out, they're going to need a new building. They build the building three years from now. But they get take care of the crop first. We, and we need to have the, the human resources looked after in the buildings we have right now. Uh, rather than uh, offer to the public there will be a new hospital a couple of years from now, don't worry, everything will be okay. If we can't solve our human resource issues right now, if we can't get, the, get it right right now with doctors and nurses, how, is, how are we going to do it three years from now? What changed? We're looking at a government that came in with a platform with the probably, if you ask people, what is the one thing that people remember about your 2013 platform? And that was a doctor for every Nova Scotia. That was probably the singular, uh, singular platform piece. There were other pieces in that platform. You were going to keep the film tax credit for five years was in your platform. You were going to break the monopoly Order, of please, Nova Scotia like power. The honourable member to keep his comments directed to third party through the chair instead of referring to the members opposite directly. The honourable member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't hold you personally responsible, though. So. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> now you made me lose my train of thought. <laughs> I'll keep going. Let me, let me regroup. Mr. Speaker, let me say something about agriculture and go on to another topic in the minute and 57 seconds I have left. Uh, my farmers, the farm community is very concerned about a 10, over 10 billion drop in the agriculture budget. We have a $55 million surplus this year. We have huge issues in agriculture, but huge potential. And uh, I know there was a frost payout plan on uh, an, an agri-recovery that was uh, engaged from the frost of June of 2018, a once in, uh, more than a once in a lifetime frost. It was a once in 200 year frost, at least maybe once in a thousand year frost. But last year we had a tough year too in agriculture. Tough year in a couple of different ways. We had a very cold, wet spring. We had Hurricane Dorian and record rainfall around the time of Hurricane Dorian. And, and it has severely impacted agriculture. And for agriculture to have a more than $10 million drop from actual to budgeted this year, uh, when we have a $55 million surplus, uh, seems like uh, when almost every other department is seeing increases. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, and, and I, yes, we talk about food security. The minister talks about food security. I appreciate that he sees it as a concern, but I'm, I'm concerned that his colleagues don't. And, uh, and I want to give the minister, help the minister in, in putting forward to that group, to the Minister of Finance, agriculture is important to our province. I want you to listen to your own minister. I'm sure he asked for more money. He didn't get it. We got a more than $10 million drop in the budget. He's disappointed, I'm sure. I'm disappointed. We need to have uh, the basic pieces of our economy supported. And, and I'll circle back to what I said in the, in the beginning. We are not keeping up with the Canadian model. We're increasing our transfer payments. We see the highest level of child poverty in the, pro, in the country. Uh, and uh, Order, please. Uh, Time allotted for the member's comments has expired. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, two things struck me about this budget. Uh, the first is the economy. How is our economy doing? Mr. Speaker, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's doing uh, terribly, but Mr. Speaker, if we look at the fact that federal transfer payments are up 10% year over year, estimate to estimate, in this budget, that is an indication, Mr. Speaker, uh, that our economy is not uh, doing as well as other parts of the country. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting those transfer payments. The other thing that struck me about this budget, Mr. Speaker, this government has been I would say fiscally conservative when it comes to the debt up to this point. But we see in this budget a, a, a significant departure from that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know when the NDP were in power, they added $3 billion or 25% increase to the provincial debt, moving up from $12 billion to $15 billion. With this budget, Mr. Speaker, if we look ahead in the projections over the next four years, this government will be adding almost another $3 billion, about $2.7 billion to the debt. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the economy and the debt are the two things that strike me about this budget. And if we look a little more at the debt, um, you know, um, we've been experiencing pretty good financial times around the world. Uh, uh, we're seeing stock market activity the last uh, 10 days that's quite significant, though, Mr. Speaker. Uh, really, the biggest drops we've seen since the stock market crash in 2008. And that concerns me, Mr. Speaker, because um, if the economy uh, starts to fall off, that's going to affect tax revenues for the government. And, Mr. Speaker, I think about... Uh, the debt, and no one seems to want to pay it down during good economic times. Um, you know, we're not in, in, in really bad economic times at this moment. We've, we've been in a period, I think, around the world of, of, of some growth. Um, economy is always cyclical. We're always taught that. The, just when we think everything is great, sometimes things turn the other way, and vice versa. 
Uh, I remember, Mr. Speaker, when I was first running for office 10 years ago in our debate in Inverness, uh, the price of oil was rising significantly at the time and people were talking about $200 oil per bar price per barrel. And uh, I recall saying at the time, because I spent a lot of time uh, learning about this, I, uh, I, I made the statement that I didn't think that was going to be the case. Oil will often choke itself off uh, because as its price rises, uh, it gets harder and harder for people to purchase it and that helps the economy to contract back down. So my point here, Mr. Speaker, is we are, we've gone through a period around the world of, of economic growth. Um, our economy ha has not been too bad here. Uh, it's not as great as other parts of the country, that's for sure, as evidenced by the transfer payments, a 10% increase year over year here. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, now the government is looking at spending a significant amount of money and putting the province into debt by another $2.7 billion. Mr. Speaker, what happens if we do enter a period of time where the economy contracts? That's my concern, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our debt is going to be that much higher. Now, it's possible if this coronavirus uh, plunges uh, the world economy into, uh, into chaos, uh, as may be being predicted by the stock market in the last number of days, uh, that the province will need economic stimulus and infrastructure development will help, uh, Mr. Speaker, but um, these decisions have been made, I think, well before coronavirus hit. This budget didn't happen last week uh, or even in, in the uh, start of the year, Mr. Speaker. These plans were happening last fall, as, as every government does their budget planning for the year to come. So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, on, on a bright note, there, there is some luck here for us right now. Uh, I, I guess I shouldn't say luck, but uh, we are lucky that we are living in times of very low interest rates. And uh, while the debt is, is going to be significantly growing over the next four years, uh, the cost, the interest costs, the same as if we have a loan for a car or a mortgage on a house, the interest costs are low right now, and I understand the province is going to save about $85 million this coming year because they're going to be, uh, uh, debt is maturing that had an interest rate of about uh, almost 10%, and this was uh, related to bonds that were issued, I think, back in the 1990s, and that debt is going to be uh, repurchased uh, at a rate of much less than that, probably around, I think it was 2.25% or something like that maybe two and a half percent. So significant reduction in interest costs for taxpayers for that debt, Mr. Speaker. But um, I don't think because debt is cheap uh, should be the prime consideration for acquiring more debt. Because as I've said, Mr. Speaker, we do have to pay the debt down. And we've just gone through a period of good economic times where, uh, you know, if we were thinking really long term, we'd be thinking about trying to retire some of that debt. And I think, uh, I think back to uh, uh, Dr. John Hamm when he was Premier of the province and when there was a boon from uh, royalties, that some of that money actually went on to the debt. Didn't get much credit for that, Mr. Speaker, because nobody really sees that, nobody really cares, but it has tremendous impact on the future of the province because if you want to look how much it costs, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, in this, in this budget, uh, the coming year, the, uh, the cost of servicing the debt is, uh, is almost $760 million that is uh, essentially, Mr. Speaker, thrown out the window uh, because it's gone with, with no value other than uh, the value that has previously been, been in, extracted from the money that had been borrowed in the past, uh, Mr. Speaker. So... Um, what is causing the, or what is the, the impetus for this debt addition? Uh, you know, according to the documents, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's building new hospitals and building roads, which are good pieces of infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think a point that my, my colleague uh, from Northside Westmount uh, made, and if I, if I may uh, repeat the message he, he delivered, was that uh, in health care, which is the largest budget item in this, in this budget at, at 42 percent, 
Um, the challenges we're seeing in healthcare have nothing to do with the need to, specifically, with the need to build a new hospital, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I'm seeing, Mr. Speaker, is a lot of human resource issues in healthcare that are causing problems for people who need health care. And uh, so spending uh, $2.7 billion on hospitals and roads, Mr. Speaker, is not going to fix those issues. So uh, another thing I think about, Mr. Speaker, I've talked about low interest rates. Consider uh, right now, Mr. Speaker, if you're investing money, or if you have pension plans, which government is responsible for, and I think about the teacher's pension plan, Mr. Speaker, it is, it is significantly below uh, its 100% solvency rate. So the investments that are being made with the funds that are in that plan are also living in a world of low interest rates, which means it's harder to generate returns safely for the teachers and their pension fund. So, uh, and that's a liability for the government, Mr. Speaker. So. Uh, you know, um, government borrowing a lot of money to spend in the next four years, and possibly more. We don't, we don't know their projections beyond that. That's just what's in this budget, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, borrowing a lot of money, uh, adding to the debt. Meanwhile, we're in an environment where uh, it's hard to reduce the future cost to the government for pension plans it has liabilities under because of the low interest rates environment that we're living in um, presents a problem, Mr. Speaker. So, um, and I just want to state, you know, over the next number of years, um, the, the debt is going to grow by almost 18%. And if you just average that without any compounding over four years, that's about 4.5% per year increase in the debt. So <clears throat> this budget, Mr. Speaker, is balanced, but if you look at it, it is balanced uh, because of more federal sources of revenue that are coming in, Mr. Speaker, and that's a sign that uh, our province uh, is not able uh, to do this without that support, Mr. Speaker, and that goes back to our economy. Um, the economy this coming year, is, is a, it's admitted right in the budget here that it is going to be rather flat, uh, because the economy is going to be declining because of northern pulp. Uh, we don't have any projections uh, which may become very real, and we may know that over the next couple of months about the coronavirus. We see the chaos that's plunging other parts of the world into. How will it be any different here when it hits our shores, Mr. Speaker? And I've heard that it's, 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 in, it's in Canada now, and it's affecting the economy, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the stock market is a leading indicator, which means it is a predictor. And if you want to know what's going to happen in the economy, the stock market is often a good place to look. We've seen significant drop in the stock market. Uh, that could present problems for this budget, Mr. Speaker, and whether or not it's going to actually be balanced come the end of the year. Um, I'm concerned about the fishery in my area. Uh, prices of lobster have dropped significantly in, for uh, fishers in the southern parts of this province. Uh, our fishing season opens in May, and Mr. Speaker, we, we provide a lot of lobster and crab. Uh, we export a lot of lobster and crab around the world, and, and because of this significant demand for it, it's raised prices, but if coronavirus has its way, uh, we're probably looking at lower, uh, lower returns for the fishers this, this coming season. And tourism, I don't know what's going to happen with tourism. Maybe our tourism will be just fine. Maybe people will travel domestically instead of internationally. Maybe that will help us. But that's an unknown. And that's a big industry in my constituency of Inverness. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the economy is contracting this year uh, because of those issues. And the government's suggested economic fix is, is government spending. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, these have been good economic times. And, um, you know, government spending to lift the economy in, in bad economic times, we can understand, but we've been in good economic times. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we shouldn't just be looking to the government to fix the economy 
in relatively good economic times. But that's what this government is doing, and that, I think, is a, an admission of failure that uh, the uh, private sector of the economy has not had any tremendous benefit under their tenure over the last six years. And, Mr. Speaker, I'll point to, uh, you know, there's something else I've noticed in, in the budget is, uh, is the, uh, the fact that, um, the fact that uh, if you look at our economy, um, Is that point I was going to mention? I know it's here, and I, I didn't you see. I have it in the document here. Um, I'm going to move on from that. I think it's in my notes here somewhere, Mr. Speaker. But uh, um, if we look at the trade in our province, you know, we've seen international trade grow, which could be a good thing because it means diversification. But, Mr. Speaker, it's actually, in a way, become more risky. We're doing more trade with China, which is a communist country. I'm going to cite the coronavirus as a prime example of why it's risky to do business with a communist country. The culture in the leadership in China has led probably to a delay in the world's ability to address the coronavirus because we know there is a culture in that country, in that government of that country, to uh, lead people to want to please their superiors and tell them what they want to hear. And I, I think of the poor physician, Mr. Speaker, who has since passed away, um, who made that comment about the government uh, should have been acting on this and was essentially, in the early stages, seeming to hide it. Now, I don't want to quote him because I, I can't speak word for what he said, but that was the, his message, Mr. Speaker. And he was brave and he has since passed away of the coronavirus, Mr. Speaker. So in Nova Scotia, you know, our, our trade with the United States has gone down on a percentage basis and it's gone up with China. And we're seeing, Mr. Speaker, the risks of that. So uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I wish I did have more time and uh, perhaps I will get to continue this at some point, but uh, that's a good start. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion is carried. The House will now recess for a couple of minutes while it resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole on Supply.
Committee of the Whole House on Supply will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call the estimates for the Minister of Health and Wellness, Resolution Number E11. Uh, resolution number E11. We have 41 minutes left for the NDP. I recognize the member from Halifax, Needham. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the minister and his staff for this opportunity to ask um, a few questions of local concern. Um, to start, in the budget, um, there's money allocated for a certain number of residential care beds that are going to become long-term care beds, and I'm just wondering what that means. Can the minister describe what a long-term care bed looks like for the department in terms of space or equipment um, that distinguishes it from a residential care bed? The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank uh, the member for the question. Yeah, so in the continuing care uh, sphere of uh, services, uh, we have uh, from a facility-based uh, care environment, uh, two level, main levels of care. There's the, the uh, RCF, residential care facility, uh, which would be uh, mostly uh, a care environment providing uh, care of a non-medical nature and, and then uh, a, a higher level of care needs that may require uh, more medical care uh, moves up to a long-term care uh, facility. So it's, a, it's really a, a different level of acuity and uh, thus the... Um, the actual um, requirements for the facility is uh, a little bit different. I don't have the explicit list of the details differentiating between the RCF and the long-term care uh, with me at, at the moment, um, but uh, in a general sense, it's uh, the RCFs are less acute, um, and, uh, and again, the space and um, uh, infrastructure space requirements are different uh, between the two. So in the site, so specifically to those 30 beds, uh, what we had was a facility that has had um, um, long-term vacancies in the RCF. So it's a single facility that had a mix of a residential care facility beds and long-term care beds in the same building. Uh, they had, uh, for an extended period of time, vacancies, uh, not adequate demand uh, to fill the RCF beds. So with uh, some uh, investment to update the infrastructure, Mr. Chair, uh, they were able to bring them up to uh, long-term care standard requirements. Uh, we were able to license those additional 30 beds once those renovations are complete. Uh, and then uh, where we know we have demand uh, in the uh, metro region, uh, we're quite confident we will be able to now make use of those uh, 30 beds uh, as a long-term care uh, space. So it's adding higher acute uh, residential uh, needs without uh, impacting, uh, that is uh, because there's already, um, already uh, vacancies in those RCF beds. Member for Halifax, Needham. Thank you very much. Um, I, I am asking uh, about that because um, as I've, I've written to the minister, um, in December, um, I'm aware that Northwood in my constituency has currently um, long-term care beds that were built 40 years ago, so you know, facilities that were built 40 years ago which have um, double and in some cases even triple occupancy, um, which does not, whatever that standard might be that that you don't have available to speak to in detail today. Certainly, given the acuity of long-term care um, patients, uh, it is it is not. Uh, the, the, certainly, the board of Northwood has determined that they are not meeting the standard uh, required, and just even in terms of infection control. Um, in, in rooms that have double and triple occupancy in long-term care. And um, I, I, I know that they have submitted a proposal uh, for capital investment uh, through the regular, um, I guess, call for proposals. Um, it, I understand that it was submitted to the Department of Health and Wellness in on April 18th, 2017, and then subsequently in both 2018 and 2019, um, the initial proposal was for $13 million and would um, permit Northwood to replace those long-term care um, 
well, basically to, to maintain the same level of long-term care beds, but in single occupancy rooms um, that would, would meet the standard that um, we, we now require, again, given the increased medical needs and, and acuity of long-term care patients. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, if that proposal um, will be considered, or, and I guess why it hasn't been considered and why they haven't had any response to it over the last number of years. Minister Fowth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess uh, a number of uh, things to uh, tease apart uh, there. Uh, certainly each and every year, uh, the department uh, receives uh, proposals from uh, you know, uh, facilities uh, throughout uh, the province. Um, as was discussed uh, last night uh, in uh, a detailed review of, of the uh, continuing care budget, uh, we actually uh, uh, spent more in 1920 uh, allocating uh, about, uh, I think, uh, the forecast of about $15 million more than the previous year uh, in uh, capital investments uh, for uh, our uh, long-term care uh, facilities uh, in the province, uh, Mr. Chair. That uh, investment is something that uh, addresses the uh, some long-standing uh, needs uh, within uh, these facilities. Uh, what the member is uh, actually requesting is, is, uh, or referring to, I think, is a, is a scenario of uh, not to just uh, the investment in capital uh, upgrades, but uh, as uh, she mentioned, uh, a complete uh, replacement. Uh, we, uh, as a province, continue to look at uh, all of our uh, infrastructure, uh, the uh, replacement of uh, facilities and building of new facilities, uh, and the timing of uh, those uh, investments. Uh, we know we've already announced I believe uh, something uh, in the vicinity of 162 new beds being added uh, to uh, the system. Uh, most of those are uh, new uh, infrastructure builds. Um, there are uh, 10 additional ones in Metagon, which is the uh, replacement uh, and expansion of an existing uh, facility, uh, expansion by adding 10 additional beds in Cape Breton as part of the Cape Breton uh, redevelopment of uh, healthcare infrastructure. Uh, we're adding a number of beds in uh, that uh, in, in that region as well, uh, and then we have these 30 uh, beds that are uh, able to be converted uh, with minimal uh, capital uh, investment. Uh, I think the um, suggestion or the uh, the terminology that uh, the submission was not uh, responded to. Uh, in fact, uh, I know staff uh, continue their discussions uh, with the uh, facility uh, provider uh, as to uh, opportunities. So it would be inaccurate to uh, suggest that. Uh, the submission was not uh, considered. Uh, they continue to uh, have discussions uh, with the provider uh, about uh, their uh, proposal. Member for Halifax, Needham. I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that you know there are always decisions being made. Um, at the same time, as a nonprofit provider with a board of directors the members of the board are expressing grave concern about the standard of care that they're able to provide in double and triple occupancy rooms that were built in the 1960s. And so at the level of that nonprofit organization, which, you know, I don't have to say, um, I think a lot about its reputation, but you know, it, it's a really, it's a really great organization. It's, it's led the way in, in, uh, you know, being very responsive to challenges around pressure, pressure sores. They've, they've worked with the constraints um, of, of the government and of funding to really try to provide good care to people. And, and what I know from speaking with, um, with the management is that the board is putting pressure on the management to say we can't continue to provide long-term care in this in, in these sorts of rooms. It is not it is not an adequate standard of care to have two <coughs> and three long-term care patients mm -hmm. sharing a room, sharing a bathroom without enough space for the kind of medical equipment that that patients require today because we are not talking about the same sort of long-term care patients that we had when this was built in the 1960s. And, and so at the level of that nonprofit organization, they're looking at making this change themselves. And that would result in the loss 
of between 30 and 45 affordable below market um, apartments, independent living apartments, on floors below the long-term care beds. Um, because the proposal was to build up and they did the structural engineering work to, to show, you know, to like analyze, can they add, could they add beds, add floors on top of the current building? And the answer was yes, they could, but it would cost $13 million. I'm sure today it would cost more because that work was done four years ago. But if, if there isn't support forthcoming from the province, then they will look at expanding those that long-term care work, the, those long-term care beds down instead and remove affordable um, housing apartments. Um, and I obviously, um, I think we're well aware of, of how valuable every nonprofit social housing um, unit is right now. And, uh, and I would hate to see I would hate to see fewer places for, um, for seniors to live um, in my constituency. Uh, I'll, I'll just share with the minister um, before I turn over my time um, to, uh, to um, my colleague, but I'll, I'll leave again the, the letter that I wrote in response to this, and, and I hope that the department will consider it again. Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess um, you know uh, much of the uh, the conversation uh, uh, talks to and, and and the member referenced um, standards uh, within the uh, facilities. Uh, there, there is no provincial standard. I mean, just to, to be clear, uh, the, the detailed standards that I don't have. Uh, but I can advise uh, the members that there is not a standard that requires. Um, single patient, uh, single resident rooms. Uh, it's not a standard uh, requirement within the licensing of uh, facilities. So uh, while uh, there are certainly uh, aspects of preference, uh, it, it, it is not uh, currently a standard that exists. So uh, again, it would be uh, not accurate to state that uh, having uh, long-term care facilities that do have uh, rooms other than single rooms uh, within their facilities as not meeting a standard. Uh, they, they in fact do, they continue to be licensed and the, uh, the requirements are not defined in, in such a way. Um, we do certainly recognize that uh, with our evolving society. Uh, we do have, for a variety of reasons, uh, preferences uh, in many cases for single rooms and that's why you see, I think, Mr. Chair, uh, new builds having far more uh, single room uh, availabilities uh, within them uh, to um, contemplate the uh, redevelopment and the investment in redevelopment of existing infrastructure to uh, accommodate uh, single rooms, as the member herself uh, highlighted, would result in a reduction of uh, total bed capacity. Uh, we, uh, we would be spending that money not to uh, add beds to the, to the system, but uh, certainly it you know, may um, uh, increase uh, some levels of satisfaction and, and what have you, um, but not actually add uh, to the net to capacity for the same investment. That's why what we've been doing, uh, as we saw in, in Matagan, uh, we see in Cape Breton, when we're looking at those opportunities for redevelopment, uh, we're assessing and saying, so how much new development uh, do we need to do to add capacity uh, while we're doing a rebuild to meet the needs within those uh, communities? So that's one of the reasons why these conversations do take some time not just uh, for the, the many other infrastructure um building up, building out, building down, uh, what uh, opportunities they have from an engineering technical perspective, uh, but also in, in terms of uh, what the, the system uh, demands and, and needs are. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I'll reiterate that, uh, in fact, uh, discussions continue and are ongoing. Uh, I believe uh, in, in, in conversations uh, with uh, representatives from Northwood, uh, I'll, I'll uh, share the members, uh, uh, I guess, gratitude and acknowledgement of of uh, the great care that they provide within their facility. In fact, uh, when we were developing our uh, provincial wound care strategy, uh, we leaned uh, heavily and, and leveraged much of the fantastic work that was done by the Northwood uh, organization to help inform uh, the uh, what, what eventually became the provincial uh, approach, uh, which was rolled out uh, to others. Uh, so uh, I would also uh, like to note that uh, it's my understanding that uh, representatives from Northwood, uh, again, on this case, 
case, uh, conversations continuing. Uh, but broadly, I think, uh, and, and uh, leave it to the member to uh, uh, dispute this point, uh, that they also recognize that uh, the investments and the attention that uh, this government uh, over the last uh, number of years has been paying, and in, uh, in particular attention to the continuing care and the long-term care sector, uh, is uh, far greater than they uh, have seen in a positive way uh, for many, many years. And I think that uh, is included in uh, operational structures, the, the investments uh, that uh, stem from the recommendations out of the expert panel, the fact that we established that expert panel uh, to help form and, and guide our direction forward and our investments both operationally uh, and with infrastructure and equipment. So uh, again, uh, it is part of a system that uh, um, has a lot uh, of work uh, to be done, um, but uh, that should not overshadow the great work that we have been doing uh, and are committed to continue doing uh, with our partners at Northwood and uh, other long-term care facilities as well. Member for Halifax, Needham. Thank you, and, and I do appreciate that, you know, um, making making such changes across the province could result in, in a net loss of long-term care beds. I guess my concern is um, that it looks likely because of um, because of the particular nature of this 40-year-old uh, facility that, that we are looking quite possibly at a net loss of, of housing for seniors, even if it, even if um, we, we are just replacing one for one long-term care beds and uh, and so that's that's my reason that I'd uh, you know really I guess urge the department to look one more time at that request and maybe maybe visit the facilities and see exactly what the the challenges are I haven't heard it expressed in terms of residents preference I've heard it expressed in ter um, in terms of the challenges of providing care um, and infection control so thank you and I'll turn it over to my colleague the Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And just uh, briefly, um, in fact, uh, as I d indicated the discussions with the proposal, uh, staff have v visited. I've been uh, to uh, local uh, Northwood uh, facility. Uh, they uh, staff uh, have been to uh, the facilities as uh, uh, that I'm uh, the last one I recall, although it's uh, not necessarily the only visit, uh, was uh, in December uh, with uh, staff uh, to uh, evaluate and assess. Uh, as, as part of those ongoing discussions. So as the member suggested, those uh, visits have already taken place. And as it relates to housing, uh, as uh, I'm sure my uh, colleague, uh, the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, Nova Scotia, uh, will speak uh, more in depth. But again, uh, during question period, we've already had many discussions highlighting the investments uh, that are being made uh, to uh, in that part of the provincial budget focused on housing uh, supports. Member for Halifax, Shibakto. Oh, thank you. Um, the minister will probably remember last night we were uh, uh, speaking about a, lo a number of things about long-term care um, and uh, pretty near had come to the conclusion of the things I uh, wanted to ask the minister to speak to. There's just one or two more. Um, I'm thinking uh, first about the, the question of... Um, elder abuse within institutions. Um, we, uh, we, we hear it said uh, by um, advocates for those in long-term care facilities that uh, only uh, a minority of places, uh, of instances of um, elder abuse reported in our facilities are, are actually investigated. And I'm wondering if there is any provision in the budget um, allocated to the whole matter of uh, reporting, um, uh, investigating, and attending uh, to uh, complaints brought forward about uh, uh, abuse of residents in homes. The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I, thank, I, I sincerely thank the member for uh, raising uh, this question. Uh, of course, uh, within uh, our long-term care facilities, uh, uh, which uh, are the homes of some of our most vulnerable uh, population, our, our aged and, and frail uh, population, and, and it is uh, incumbent upon us as a society uh, to um, support and, and care and, and provide the appropriate uh, 
services uh, to meet their needs and uh, absolutely um, there would be consensus uh, across the province, not just on this floor, that um, the situations, abusive situations, uh, are inappropriate and, and should not be tolerated. And that's why we, we have legislation governing um, the uh, protections of Persons in Care Act. Uh, this applies to our residential facilities, but also uh, other um, uh, facility-based um, uh, accommodations. They, uh, Mr. Uh, that uh, act uh, does require that uh, any, um, well, number one requires that uh, facilities that are aware of need to report uh, and, and individuals need to report it uh, so that uh, it can be looked into. Uh, and in fact, um, every time that there is a uh, reported uh, allegation under this uh, piece of legislation, it is looked into. Um, I think uh, where the member has uh, indicated that uh, some uh, are not, I think the language he used, investigated. Uh, in fact, the uh, the work is done at the as as is done in a, in a preliminary investigation. I believe is very similar to an investigative approach with uh, within our, our criminal justice uh, system, where um, you know the initial work is done uh, in a preliminary way to determine uh, first if a a more uh, robust, uh, detailed investigation is uh, necessary or appropriate. So again, that preliminary work uh, for every case uh, is uh, done. Um, as far as uh, the um, investments, uh, we have um, in the area of adult protection, because uh, the member is uh, interested in uh, the financial investments, uh, we're seeing an, an increased investment of uh, about those thousands. Uh, an increased uh, investment of about uh, $84,000 uh, to the team uh, within Adult Protection Services, so about $84,000 increase uh, in our budget uh, this year to that, uh, that team of, uh, of uh, support work. The member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Uh, th thank you for that explanation. Uh, the only other question about uh, um, people in long-term care I wanted to ask the minister and uh, the staff is a, a numbers question. I'm wondering about the number of people uh, waiting for admission today on, on formal waiting lists for our long-term care facilities uh, in each of the four zones. And uh, I understand you, that may not be uh, uh, available right in front of you and we could receive it later, but if it were available in front of you, uh, it would be good to have. The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the member's correct. I don't have uh, the data on the, the wait list broken down by zone, but we'll endeavour to uh, see if we can uh, pull it out uh, accordingly. But we do have, uh, as of uh, February 19th, 2020, uh, 1,267 clients uh, on the wait list for uh, initial long-term care placement in either a long-term care or RCF uh, facility. The member for Halifax, Shibakto. Th thank you, and uh, thanks to the minister for that answer. Those were the things I wanted to ask about long-term care, and uh, Mr. Chair would be acceptable for my friend, uh, the MLA for Dartmouth North, to uh, ask a couple of questions? Yeah. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it'll be one, but there may be a B part, so. Uh, Mr. Chair, last year I asked a question in estimates of the Minister around collaborative care centres. Uh, last year there was, a, I believe it was $10 million of new money that was allocated to collaborative care centres throughout the province. And I'm pretty sure that at the time when I asked about this, he indicated that um, 
that, oh yes, at, at the time in estimates, he indicated that um, you know, it would, the, the, that money would be determined or allocated based on a, a number of processes. Um, uh, throughout the year, I had a meeting with um, uh, senior level staff at the NSHJ who indicated then that the, that, that money had been sort of allocated uh, to different collaborative care centres. So I'm, I guess it, my question is, uh, what money is there in this budget, 2021, uh, f new money specifically for new, new uh, um, collaborative care centres, either bricks and mortar centres or um, sort of collaborative care models in um, in existing uh, buildings, and uh, of that money, how is it being allocated? What are the what are the um, what are the uh, aspects of the decision making process uh, going into how that money will be uh, allocated? Sorry, <laughs> the Minister of Health. One second. Turn the mic off for the Minister of Health. Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank uh, the member for the question. So uh, this year, I believe, uh, going towards uh, the, the comprehensive uh, primary care uh, funding uh, for uh, collaborative uh, centres and, and targeted uh, is about $27.5 million uh, total. Uh, now, that uh, includes the uh, increased investments we've been making over the last uh, number of years. Uh, I think the uh, increased investment uh, for this fiscal year is about 750,000 in growth uh, over the uh, investments we've made over uh, previous uh, years. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we're uh, going to be investing in uh, 2021 uh, a total uh, increase uh, in that area of uh, uh, 27 uh, based upon investments we've made the last uh, few years in, in growing our collaborative care practices. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, the um, the breakdown and the uh, criterions that are, are focused on, uh, we certainly uh, focus on uh, two things. Uh, some are, are establishing new collaborative uh, care practices uh, and uh, others are based upon expansion of existing uh, practices. Uh, one of the uh, early stage was about ensuring that we, we get practices up. The, the care needs were quite evident uh, throughout uh, the province. Um, now we've, we've seen the positive progress of the investments we've been making the last number of years, um, particularly and perhaps uh, in a good way uh, for the central uh, region, uh, the, um, the uh, rate of improvements in attaching and providing care to uh, residents uh, has increased as measured by uh, the number of residents um, registered on our 811 Need a Family Practice list. Uh, a couple of years ago in the central zone uh, on a per capita basis uh, was uh, relatively relatively on par with the rest of the province. Uh, that is representing 50% of the population. They uh, also represented about 50% of those residents registered on the 811 Need a Family uh, Practice list. That has uh, shrunk significantly uh, based in, in part on, on the growth of uh, investments and incentives uh, that have been well received in this area. Um, and now, uh, in fact, our attention is shifting to those zones uh, that uh, have not seen the same degree of improvement such as the western and the northern zones. Uh, uh, our uh, focus uh, on investments for attachment and, and primary care, while we continue our, our investments and continue to support those investments that have been made uh, in uh, other parts of the province and will continue to expand uh, and uh, fill vacancies and, and uh, meet the uh, attachments within those communities, we do have to uh, put, uh, which is uh, ongoing, uh, a new focused uh, lens, uh, seeing the disproportionate uh, needs in our western and northern zones uh, as it comes to primary care attachment. So that's uh, becoming, a, in this year, uh, a particular lens that we'll be uh, applying or expecting to be applied by the health authority. Member for Dartmouth North. 
Well, thank you, the Minister for that answer. Um, it makes me feel very worried about uh, some communities in the central zone, Mr. Chair, because uh, as we know, uh, zones are big. <laughs> and so within those zones, the four zones that we have, uh, four zones? Uh, um, you know, there are a numbers of, like with, even within one zone, there's a number of disparities. Uh, of course, I represent a, uh, rep, a community of Dartmouth North, uh, where there is a higher than normal or higher than average social deprivation. Um, we have a number of uh, folks who have serious accessibility issues uh, due to, um, you know, physical uh, disability, but also um, uh, accessibility in terms of uh, basically inability to, to leave the community or, or leaving the community makes it very, very difficult uh, for, for folks in, my, in, some, in parts of my community. Um, I just wanted to ask the minister if when deciding uh, where collaborative care centers are placed in the province or expanded in the province, is the only metric uh, the department is using uh, attachment to the 811 list or attachment to a primary care provider or are there other factors that are being considered? The health minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, again, in the, the Dartmouth uh, area uh, alone, I know that uh, there are uh, several collaborative uh, practices uh, uh, with uh, a number of um, physicians and healthcare providers. Uh, just uh, some of those uh, include uh, the Albert Lake Medical Clinic, uh, the Cole Harbor Family uh, Medicine, uh, the Dartmouth Medical Center, uh, Forest Hills. Um, Pleasant Street uh, Medical Group um, that uh, have been uh, supported uh, here, and of course uh, the uh, the fantastic uh, Woodlawn Medical Clinic. Uh, so we know that there are a lot of um, a number of these uh, facilities within the Dartmouth uh, region. So yes, it's it's true the central zone is fairly large, but if we narrow in specifically on the Dartmouth area, um, that's a. Uh, it's about six, uh, I believe, um, uh, collaborative uh, centres. Uh, that's almost 10% of the, the collaborative centres uh, that we have. Uh, we have about 85 now in the province uh, operating, and uh, so six out of those 85 are right uh, within the uh, Dartmouth area. Uh, no, uh, the attachment is not the sole uh, criteria, Mr. Richair. Obviously, there are a number of uh, variables that uh, have to come into play. Um, what uh, we are uh, focused on uh, throughout the system is uh, improving uh, the, uh, the care and the outcomes. Uh, one of those areas, uh, and just happens to be one of the, the large areas uh, that we focus on, is uh, patient attachment because we know uh, how uh, important that is um, to so many aspects uh, of the um, health care, primary health care needs uh, for citizens. The primary care providers are the uh, are the uh, entry point uh, to much of the healthcare system, and we recognize that. Many of the concerns that have been brought to the floor of this legislature on behalf of constituents uh, who have uh, are in the unfortunate situation of not having a, a primary care provider uh, has been that kind of uh, entry point. So getting people attached is a, a critical uh, and important one. To, because we know that attaching patients, we know will address many of those other underlying health uh, concerns. The member did reference um, other variables that go beyond just primary care attachment uh, that also have impacts on health outcomes that are some of the values of our collaborative practices tying into social workers and other allied health professionals as part of the collaborative care teams. That uh, includes really what much of our conversation uh, in the estimates discussion so far with with the uh, New Democratic Party rightfully focused on is social determinants of health and, and those uh, broader um uh, variables that uh, impact one's health and wellness and that's why it's not just the Department of Health investing in those upstream uh, supports but in fact we see investments in this budget uh, in the education department and community services in housing Nova Scotia to help address some of those other I issues uh, to also support so it's not, you know those uh, I think concerns that the member was uh, uh, suggesting as to what we, we consider or should be considering again as a government we recognize those and as a government 
government we are investing in those areas, Mr. Chair, and uh, and we'll continue to do so. But as it relates specifically to collaborative care centres, um, it is not the only. Um, there obviously has to be physician interest and, and, and healthcare provider interest. There has to be physical space available. Uh, in, and, and so there are a number of other variables. From a population perspective, it is one of the, the high uh, priorities that we do have, but not the only one. The member for Dartmouth North. Uh, well, thank you. Thank the minister. I thank the minister for those answers. Um, yes, I'm glad to hear him mention the social determinants of health. I, I do uh, think that the collaborative care model works very well, and uh, especially in my opinion, the NSHA sort of turnkey model of a health home uh, is one where um, a community like like Dartmouth North would th would thrive uh, with uh, such a health home, um, given uh, the severe impacts of poverty, uh, high levels of chronic disease, uh, la uh, issues with accessibility, um, and mental health and addictions issues. And so, uh, you know, um, I think that those things need to weigh uh, strongly when uh, when these types of decisions are being made. And I hope that. Um, the minister will will see how beneficial a uh, health home in Dartmouth North, and uh, oh yeah, I would say that the, the, the thank you for listing all of the great collaborative care centers in Dartmouth. But Dartmouth North is a specific community unto itself, between the bridges, uh, uh, with with very specific uh, and different needs. Uh, and so I just want to um, I'll end there and pass the mic back over to my honourable mem uh, colleague, the member from Health Shabakto. The health minister. Oh. <laughs> After the health minister speaks. <laughs> The Health Minister. I thank uh, the member uh, for the questions. I uh, appreciate uh, duly noted uh, and uh, recognize uh, again the importance uh, for each of us in uh, in the legislature advocating on behalf of our uh, specific uh, communities. And uh, again, I assure uh, the member that the um, uh, the uh, characteristics uh, and, and profile of, of uh, the community of Dartmouth North, uh, but again, indeed, uh, each community and each member here, I'm sure, will stand up and uh, express uh, their uh, community's uh, interests and needs uh, uh, equally as passionately and advocately as the member did. Uh, but again, uh, community profiles um, as well as the physician availability uh, do tie in. We want to make sure that the services and, and certainly the profiles tie in to the services that are offered uh, when a collaborative uh, practice is established. Um, so I do thank the member for the questions um, and, uh, and, and advocacy, and uh, again, duly noted as, as requested. Before the, uh, the, the next member uh, gets up, I, I actually have the answer to the previous members, the leader of the NDP's uh, previous question, uh, if he has a pen and paper handy. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the wait times for long-term care, uh, again, this I think was uh, maybe a week or so ago, in the West... Uh, February 19th, uh, the same date uh, I had previously. In the Western Zone, Mr. Uh, Chair, it was 243. Sorry, uh, the Northern Zone is 176. The Eastern Zone is 349. And the Central Zone is 499. And if my math is correct, that should be a total uh, wait list for initial placement of 1,267, as I responded in my previous uh, answer. Member for Halifax, Shabakto. Um, uh, th thank you. Um, so I, uh, I'd like to direct some questions to the minister on the uh, general world of physicians and physicians' uh, recruitment and retention. There's no, um, there's no area that uh, figures more prominently for people when you talk about health care and you ask them about their satisfaction of their health care, the, the, the issue comes up over and over. I have or I haven't got a doctor, I, or I got a doctor at this point, I, did, I lost a doctor at that point and so on. This is at the, at the top of the list. So we, we see the matter addressed uh, in the budget with this 75.3 million figure. Um, for the improvement of recruitment and retention of medical professionals, including physicians. Uh, I'd like to ask the minister if you, would, uh, if you could provide a breakdown of what this uh, more precisely includes. Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I, I believe uh, that uh, figure uh, relates uh, most significantly uh, to the uh, fulfillment uh, and compensation for the uh, master agreement. Uh, the full uh, details of uh, how uh, that uh, is expected to play out uh, would be uh, detailed in that agreement uh, with physicians, um, but it does include an, an, an overall increase of about 2% in physician compensation, uh, as well as additional adjustments uh, to ensure that uh, family, emergency and anaesthetists uh, within the province will be uh, the highest paid in Atlantic Canada. Uh, these uh, increased remuneration uh, compensation uh, opportunities uh, outlined in the uh, agreement is uh, what we heard from uh, physicians and doctors Nova Scotia that uh, would be uh, appropriate and, and really the best means uh, uh, in that uh, particular uh, area for uh, helping with recruitment and retention of physicians in the province and uh, thus far uh, feedback uh, has been very positive by physicians uh, as I think is reflected in over 90% of them voting in favour of this uh, master agreement so uh, we're quite uh, confident uh, that this uh, commitment, uh, this agreement and these financial resources uh, will facilitate uh, those uh, uh, progress, uh, but it does uh, also include uh, money, um, uh, about $9 million to create new specialist positions across the province, again uh, having these additional uh, support positions uh, to provide care and, and uh, services in the province uh, helps uh, maintain that work-life balance that we've talked about for some of the other uh, healthcare professionals. Is also a concern for physicians and specialists, so we need to make sure that uh, we have the uh, the appropriate uh, supply and allocation in our uh, hospitals uh, across uh, the province, uh, so that's additional investment that's uh, been committed to as well. Member for Halifax, Shabakta, with about a minute left. Uh, thank you. Uh, so am I, am I understanding correctly that minus the nine million for the new specialist positions, uh, the entirety of the 75.3 million uh, is to be accounted for by the master agreement? Minister of Health, 25 seconds. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, not the entirety. I think about $69 million uh, in the coming uh, fiscal year is targeted toward um, master agreement commitments. But those uh, commitments are uh, to uh, some are direct to just wages on the bottom line, but some are new programs within the physician community that are designed in partnership with physicians to better deliver care. For example, the uh, the CHIP uh, program time in community hospitals. Time has expired for the NDP caucus. It's now time for the Conservative Party. Uh, I recognize the member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Progressive Conservative Party. Um, I'd like to talk about the one patient, one record system. Um, the province, the province is, um, is, is allocated billions of dollars, really, to, to infrastructure. There's been very little transparency around most of that. Uh, indeed, some of the first things that have had lights shined on them around this parkade situation, and we, we know what happened there. Uh, the one patient, one record is, is certainly a, a, a project that, that I'm very concerned with. I, I understand the RFP was issued many years ago, somewhere in the range of 10 years ago, and that um, there's been quite a few million dollars in, invested in the, the procurement process. So I wonder if the minister can, uh, can just provide some clarity on when the RFP was issued and how much has been invested in the procurement process to date. <clears throat> Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I believe uh, the official procurement went out uh, in 1819. Uh, that procurement is uh, nearing the uh, end stages. Uh, uh, as the member, I think, uh, can appreciate uh, as the negotiations are ongoing with uh, vendors, uh, it's important uh, for uh, those details um, that uh, uh, support our negotiating position to be uh, managed at the negotiating uh, table uh, with uh, vendors. And uh, again, once uh, an agreement is reached, as uh, is the case uh, with procurements, uh, that uh, information on the procurement uh, details would uh, uh, be made available at that time. <coughs> Member for Picto East. 
Thank you. Um, how many vendors is the province negotiating with at this time? <coughs> Minister of Health. Uh, I believe uh, it's already uh, been publicly reported the uh, the process uh, that uh, was undertaken uh, for uh, this particular project was uh, uh, a process uh, that uh, was also uh, recently undertaken with the um, highway twinning uh, on the 104. Uh, that is a pre-screening uh, stage took place first. Uh, that's uh, called a, a request for qualified uh, bidders. Um, I believe there were four or five uh, um, submissions uh, for that uh, submission. Uh, two uh, of the uh, submissions uh, were deemed eligible for the uh, actual RFP phase. Both of those um, qualified uh, bidders uh, submitted uh, bids um, and uh, at this stage of the RFP process um, they are uh, in the latter stages of uh, work with both of those bidders to ensure we get the, the both the, uh, the I guess at the early stage we know they meet the technical requirements uh, of the province. Uh, we're working to ensure we get the best uh, value out of those uh, providers and will determine uh, the one that has the best value for the province uh, will be the one we would uh, consider proceeding with. Member for Pictou East. Thank you. Is there, uh, would the minister, in the minister's view, would it, is this a, a custom build from scratch or are some of the, is, is this technology being used in other jurisdictions where a lot of that can be ported here with some, some process uh, changes or how would the minister describe this? Is this a full on custom build or what, what, what has been done in other areas that might provide some value and benefit to us? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll just, um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll put a, I guess an, an asterisk or a, a caveat at the front end. Uh, I think I can answer this question uh, at a high enough level that I hope meets the member's uh, inquiry. Um, but I put the, the caveat that, uh, uh, again, given the uh, sensitive nature and, and, again, as the member rightly uh, indicated, the importance of, of this particular procurement, um, I, I, there's, there's a certain level of detail that uh, I'm not going to be prepared to go into uh, while the uh, discussions and negotiations aren't, are, are still going on. Um, but uh, for the specific question that was asked, uh, really, this is, uh, by and large, an, an off-the-shelf, uh, the two uh, submissions are, are both uh, exists uh, you know, uh, off-the-shelf uh, providers, not a custom uh, system uh, developed. Uh, that said, uh, any time a, a system is uh, implemented, there's often uh, configuration uh, adjustments to ensure that it, uh, respond, the needs of the system respond to the uh, specific uh, operational configuration. So uh, you get a, a system that's uh, installed and then you uh, get around to configuring. Um, in a very simplistic way, that's like uh, you get a cell phone uh, and you can go through and, and tweak your configurations uh, so that uh, your cell phone doesn't necessarily look uh, quite the same as the, uh, the person uh, sitting next to you. Member for Pictou East. Thank you. Thank the minister for that response. Um, I, I do want to talk about um, uh, the MSI. So MSI has to approve all practitioners and give them a billing number. Um, and I just wonder if the minister can give us some numbers on like um, how many family physicians were recruited uh, last year and how many of those got a billing number. I just want to, I'm just trying to see, are those in sync? Does a, does a recruited, when the government reports a recruited family physician, does that mean that that family physician also got a billing number or is it possible that there's some time lag in between those two things? Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, that's not information that I've uh, brought uh, with me here and, and have off uh, the top of my head uh, in terms of uh, aligning uh, those two uh, figures. Uh, I know from a physician recruitment uh, perspective, uh, we have uh, recruited uh, over 100 physicians uh, this uh, year since uh, April of last year um, to uh, the province uh, through various uh, streams. Uh, the, um, and, and those would be uh, physicians, I believe, that uh, have already started, uh, which uh, if they've started uh, practicing, they do have a billing number. Uh, in some instances, uh, there, there are uh, recruited uh, 
to physicians uh, and there's often a, a lag time or a lead time from when someone uh, commits to starting a practice uh, to actually uh, coming here and, and that would be uh, for those uh, particularly who are coming from another jurisdiction as I'm sure the member uh, would appreciate uh, giving notice in, in such an important uh, role as, as a health care provider if they're coming from another jurisdiction they would give uh, adequate uh, notice sometimes in the range of uh, a month to, to sometimes it could be as much as six months notice um, that gives us uh, lots of time to complete the appropriate licensing uh, as well as uh, ensure that they get the billing numbers to uh, provide the care in the province. Member for Picto East. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe the minister can follow up with some. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that, minister. Um, is there a cap on the amount of uh, allowable billings that a general practitioner can have in Nova Scotia? Is there a cap on, on the allowable billings for general practitioners? The member for Picto East. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just wondering, if, in terms of general practitioners, uh, is there a cap on the amount that they're allowed to build? Uh, allowed to bill, sorry. The health minister. The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. In a uh, general uh, perspective, uh, over uh, kind of uh, you know the uh, suite of services, uh, I would say no. I don't. I'm not aware of any caps on uh, the amount that a uh, physician uh, could, general practitioners in this case, primary care providers uh, can uh, bill uh, the province. Um, but I want to uh, put a couple of clarifications in there. Uh, obviously, uh, physicians are expected to provide care that meets their uh, professional expectations. Uh, again, uh, in, in uh, just the very uh, nature of um, human capacity to provide safe, adequate care, um, their uh, clinical uh, and professional obligations to provide that care uh, would put some upper limits. So uh, again, it doesn't. You know, theoretically, one couldn't even achieve uh, infinite, but there's no cap per se, uh, and that would be uh, particularly noted in a fee-for-service model. Uh, I also put a, a caveat uh, only because I'm not certain. Um, in a fee-for-service environment within the master agreement and in the fee codes, there are many different uh, fee codes. So my statement that globally there's not a cap does not necessarily mean, and I, and I don't say that there is, but I don't want the member to take this and, uh, as an, a statement that there is not on a particular fee code that may have a cap on it. So um, I, I, there may be a specific instance where a particular service or procedure uh, may have a negotiated uh, maximum uh, billable amount. And, and that's in the fee-for-service environment. The other uh, side of the equation where about 10% of our, our family physicians uh, providers are in a uh, contract uh, or salary-based environment uh, known as APP, uh, in those instances uh, they have a defined salary that they work towards. Uh, so again, it's not really a, a cap, but it is the salary that uh, was agreed to be uh, services provided for. Member for Picto East. Thank you. I, 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 I'm hearing from physicians that there, that there is a cap um, on allowable billings of 275,000, and that um, if they if they submit more billings than that to MSI, that MSI will claw back 50% of it. Um, so maybe I'll just leave that with the minister to to confirm and 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 respond to us that. So that would be a cap on allowable billings of 275,000, and that MSI would claw back 50% uh, of any excess amount over that. So I'll leave that with the minister to, to, um, to maybe investigate and respond back to us. Um, I just want to read uh, something. This is these are the obviously we're all we're all we're all hearing these types of stories, but this is from a lady that said I have I have severe arthritis in my foot. I was referred to a surgeon at the Halifax Infirmary. I need to have surgery. I was told there was an 18-month uh, 18 18-month wait from my first consult. I called to see if a date was now available. I've been waiting 15 of the 18 months, but I was told the wait list is now extended to 24 months. 
Um, they're on a cancellation list, but but no one cancels Order. because of. The member from Par Pic to East has to table that document with a name on the document. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. The member for Pictor East. Um, well, I'm just speaking hypothetically. Uh, I want to ask about wait times. Order. Uh, Order. No, nope. the member from Pictou East read an actual email, word for word, that uh, has to be document that has to be tabled with a name attached to that email. This has been we've gone over this several times. Member from Pictou East. It's, it's actually not an email. <laughs> it's just some notes I have. I'm um, happy to table it, but or I can just disregard that, and I'll ask the minister a very direct question. Um, this is a, we have people in this province that were told a wait time for certain <coughs> surgeries was 18 months, uh, and now a, a year later they're finding out the wait times are increasing. So the minister's been the minister for quite some period of time now, um, I think four years, uh, maybe five. Um, this government has, has been there for almost seven years, it's invested maybe $35 billion in health care, and wait times are continuing to go up. Uh, I'd like to ask the minister, what does the minister say to those people who today are waiting for surgeries and, and hearing that wait times continue to increase? One second, please. That, so just to be clear um, to the member that you uh, quote it from a document, you quote it from an outside source that needs to be tabled. Um, Please let me finish. This is something that we've gone over a few times here. Uh, so if in the future, if you are going to quote from a document, you need to table it. These, and it must identify the author. We've gone over this several times. Thank you. The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess uh, I, I will get to the, the answer of this one, but uh, the member had asked a, a question uh, to follow up, uh, and that was uh, related to the billing codes uh, information. Uh, so uh, in 1819, uh, we had 130 physicians, and they all received billing codes. And uh, so far from 2019, we have 108 uh, physicians, all with uh, billing codes. Um, so. Um, uh, again, running it on, on kind of fiscal year, so we're not quite done this fiscal year, uh, and we're at 108. Um, and, and to the, uh, the other question where we wrapped up, uh, providing a little additional detail, um, I'll, I'll take a look. Uh, again, that scenario doesn't uh, ring a bell uh, to me, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, but I'll look into that notion of the 50% uh, scenario uh, to see if there is a, a scenario where that uh, happens. Um, uh, but uh, I would assure uh, the member that uh, anything uh, that uh, gets established, if such a, a, a scenario did exist, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it would be in accordance with the master agreement that was negotiated and accepted by over 90% uh, of uh, physicians. Uh, so it's important uh, uh, to recognize, and, and if it is a scenario that is inconsistent with the master agreement, uh, I would uh, certainly uh, be moving to, uh, to rectify that. Uh, we expect uh, our systems to uh, adhere to our contracts. To the question uh, in the specific round, about uh, surgeries, uh, particularly those in the orthopedic uh, space, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the member's right uh, that uh, there are, are challenges uh, with the wait list. That's why uh, in uh, 2018, I believe, uh, I um, established, 17 or 18 in the fall, uh, established a new um, program under the, the leadership of clinicians uh, uh, within the uh, health authority uh, to focus on our orthopedic surgeries. We've invested uh, by hiring more uh, surgeons and anesthetists. Uh, we established uh, clinics and additional support people to help them do the work. Uh, and in fact, we've been completing more surgeries as well. Uh, just uh, on a calendar year, uh, the year ended December 18. Uh, we had about uh, 3,100 uh, uh, orthopedic surgeries, uh, and in the uh, current year, uh, as of December uh, 2019, we had 3,400. Um, so we are increasing the number of surgeries uh, that are being provided, um, but again, uh, demand also is going up in, in many cases. So we're making every effort, we're making the investments, and we're streamlining our processes and, and, and protocols uh, to provide the care. So uh, to those uh, on the, uh, that, that may be on a wait list, uh, the other thing I would highlight uh, for people on the wait list is um, they can go to our website for surgeries uh, uh, looking at the wait list. Um, the wait lists are, are 
are uh, allocated uh, by uh, regions but also by uh, surgeons. Uh, it is uh, possible, Mr. Chair, that there may be another surgeon within the province uh, who may be able to complete that surgery uh, more uh, uh, timely. Uh, and in that case, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the uh, individual could request to be referred to a different location um, where the wait times may be shorter. Um, so there are a number of options uh, where, uh, again, one of the advantages of having a single health authority uh, and one of the streamlinings we did with uh, orthopedic surgeries was to allow people to, from different areas, uh, get put on the wait list in other parts of the province. So uh, to the member, if they know, uh, you know, hypothetically or actually of an individual, um, I would encourage them to take a look, have that conversation, and they might be able to be referred uh, to a site uh, with a shorter wait time and get that surgery as soon as possible. Before we continue on, I, d I would like to clarify one last thing. Uh, the member for Inverness and the member for Pictouise had asked to, uh, and this is for the entire House, to uh, to what, to uh, remove something from the official Hansard record. You don't have the ability. We don't have the ability to quote something and then one second, please let me finish. Um, to just say, well, just remove it from the record. You don't have the ability to do that. Um, so to be clear. If something's going to be quoted, then it must have the source must be tabled. Uh, members don't have the ability to re to just say, "Well, just remove it from the record." The member for Inverness. Mr. Chair, I, I certainly respect your position. In fact, I just come over to you. I didn't disagree with you. I was just trying to explain that was was referenced as an email was not in an email format on the paper. Okay. So that was the purpose of my conversation. Well, I would never suggest something be struck. So I appreciate that, but the comments that were made from this side was just, just to remove it from the record from both yourself and the member from Pictou East. I heard that. So, so what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is we don't have the, you don't have the ability to do that. I would say the same thing to you that I would say to any side of the house. So I appreciate it. Uh, and we'll move on to, uh, who's, who's up? I'm actually not putting words in your mouth. If the conversation's over, thank you. The yeah. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. S uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Just participating in uh, estimates yesterday in the red chamber. Uh, a little different etiquette over there. Um, my first <laughs> first time uh, taking part in our provincial uh, budgetary process and the estimates process. Uh, process. And it's my uh, honor and pleasure to be able to ask questions that are uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, today, I'm speaking as our caucus's critic, as uh, for pre-hospital and preventative care, and having had first-hand knowledge. Uh, an experience in our provincial ambulance system, um, greater than four years. Uh, I've continued uh, my consultations with some uh, stakeholders, including colleagues, to hear their uh, first-hand experiences. I want to be on the record stating that things have changed uh, significantly in my career as a paramedic, and the minister spoke about uh, changes um, between for himself and another member uh, in emergency care from funeral homes, which uh, initiated diesel therapy to drive to the hospital, uh, to the uh, high quality uh, care that uh, paramedics deliver in our province today. So I'd like to uh, begin by asking uh, the minister, uh, looking at the first line of the uh, provincial budget for ambulance services. Um, ambulance services of 128 million 993. Uh, I was just wondering if the minister could explain uh, what that line there uh, in fact entails. Thank you. Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, that uh, is for uh, the ground ambulance services. Um, 
sorry, that was the ambulance services or the ground ambulance services uh, line item? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just uh, can I just double check which which line item that was again? The member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The ambulance services line, the first line in the uh, budget. Minister of Health. Yes, yeah, that uh, line uh, relates to uh, the services uh, provided through uh, our EHS uh, EMC uh, services um, that uh, that uh, provides our uh, emergency uh, ambulance services uh, in the province. So that uh, would uh, essentially uh, be the uh, um, predominantly, but uh, the predominantly the contract uh, with uh, EMCI. Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So I guess I'm trying to uh, differentiate between line of the ambulance services and line of ground ambulance operations. So uh, is operations more of the management of the operations? Um, maybe, you know, there's maintenance, uh, fleet maintenance, um, repairs, for example, um, equipment and supplies, uh, medications, all that of that nature. I'm just trying to have a better appreciation of that. It's a medical quality control, sort of an idea there, and provincial programs we'll, we'll get into probably later on. The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, the uh, the member is correct that uh, the ground ambulance uh, operations line uh, does refer to, excuse me, <coughs> does uh, refer to uh, services outside of the MCI uh, contract, uh, uh, things such as patient care equipment that are not in the budget, uh, research or new programs, uh, emergency equipment, uh, disaster preparedness uh, things. Um, so uh, there's a number of uh, things like that. So they're uh, there to support um, and they are things that fall outside of the uh, EMCI uh, contract, um, but uh, we think that are important uh, for uh, the care and, and the uh, service uh, provided by our paramedics. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we won't disagree on the fact that paramedics deliver uh, high quality, exceptional care, uh, but I guess we will disagree that we're in a health care crisis. Um, the government is, is presenting this budget with the statement of better together. Uh, but the sentiment, I believe, felt um, across the paramedic community, or most of the paramedic community, is uh, do more with less. Um, you know, we're experiencing, there's announcements, capital project investments uh, regarding the infrastructure in this, pro uh, this province. However, there exists uh, huge staffing uh, challenges across various professions, including the paramedic profession. So paramedics for years now have been feeling the pinch. Uh, they've been picking up the slack of uh, different aspects of the healthcare system. So um, I'm, I'm concerned to see the budget for EHS, uh, despite the increased uh, call volume, despite the increased uh, transfer volume, despite all the challenges that paramedics face day in, day out, uh, that budget being slashed uh, 1.2 million dollars. Um, so I, I guess, uh, can the minister uh, try to address that, please? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I, I assure uh, the member and, and uh, all of the paramedics that, uh, in fact, uh, as I said, that uh, line item uh, reflects uh, the uh, amount that uh, we pay into uh, EMCI. Uh, we absolutely are committed to uh, ensuring that the uh, ground ambulance and our uh, ambulance uh, operations are funded to uh, meet the uh, needs uh, within the uh, province. Uh, and in addition, as the member uh, started in, in uh, the question uh, background making reference to investments in infrastructure uh, as the member would know I believe uh, you know we've uh, announced uh, investments in important infrastructure upgrades for our paramedics uh, including those power lifts uh, uh, to get uh, almost 50 percent of the fleet uh, outfitted uh, this year uh, with those uh, power lifts so uh, we certainly haven't forgotten uh, our paramedics uh, and in addition uh, some of the investments that we're making uh, are to help support some of the most critical concerns raised by paramedics uh, that I've heard uh, certainly about offload times. Uh, we have, I think, about uh, four million dollars being invested, uh, not necessarily in the EMC EHS uh, budget, uh, 
but rather in uh, in our budget uh, with patient flow uh, support so that that uh, should feed back uh, to help uh, with those uh, patient transfers and offloads uh, at uh, hospitals which we know is one of those critical areas so again the investments are being made uh, to help actually improve uh, the frontline work and again I absolutely want to assure the member that the operational budget uh, are no cutbacks uh, or concerns uh, with funding the operations uh, this uh, adjustment uh, relates to our contract uh, work uh, with the uh, service provider the member for Argyle Barrington uh, thank you mr. chair and for correction of, of the record miss uh, spoke rather than a $1 million uh, cut to the budget, $6.3 million cut to the budget. Uh, I guess for, for paramedics and for the general population of Nova Scotia and my constituents, because I've, I've heard it before, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter which way you try to spin it, a cut to a budget a cut to the budget. And there's, uh, with the increased uh, burden on the system, uh, there's some grave concern about that. Um, so uh, the question for the minister is what information does uh, his department uh, use to make budgetary decisions for the EHS uh, system? The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, what we have is a uh, service provider that uh, provides the, uh, uh, the work uh, on behalf of the province uh, for uh, emergency ambulance uh, services. Uh, that uh, contract uh, stipulates um, the uh, criterion. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are uh, criterion about uh, the number of uh, uh, calls that, that come in that uh, inform uh, the rate uh, by which uh, we pay. Uh, they're recognized as bands. Uh, I believe off the top of my head, uh, 1,200, I think, uh, 1,250 uh, thereabouts uh, is, is equivalent to one band, and, and we have a rate to that, uh, that we pay. Um, so uh, previous year's uh, information uh, comes in and informs uh, future year's uh, obligations uh, underneath uh, the contract. So as, as uh, essentially as we see demand going up uh, in the province uh, for the care uh, based upon call volumes, uh, that is a significant uh, contributor to uh, the drive of the, uh, the costs uh, with, uh, within our, our contract. Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll get about the increased demands uh, later on. but. Uh, for the record, you know, uh, I've mentioned it before, and my colleague from Pictou West has mentioned it before, that Nova Scotians from uh, Yarmouth to Sydney and the paramedic community uh, were very eager to hear that a review, systemic review of the ambulance service was conducted, uh, and after numerous delays, uh, finally completed, and then the minister stated after the FOIA pop process that it would be made um, public on a certain uh, format. But uh, you know, the Nova Scotians paid $145,000 for this uh, report. Uh, so with the Fitch report in hand, uh, I'm curious to know how much did the minister and his department consult the Fitch report for this year's budget? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, as I've uh, noted uh, with the uh, Fitch report, uh, is uh, really uh, informing the negotiations that uh, we uh, have with the uh, service provider uh, to update uh, the contract. Um, so uh, that's uh, what we're using that uh, for improvements uh, throughout uh, the system. Um, and uh, as I've previously uh, mentioned, uh, we aren't uh, waiting. Uh, we didn't wait uh, just for uh, a budget year. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, to make investments uh, to uh, power stretchers uh, when uh, we identified an opportunity uh, for uh, funding. Uh, through uh, the, the bilateral uh, program with the funding from the federal government. Uh, we're able to invest uh, and, and take advantage of that and direct those funds uh, to our, our paramedics. Uh, we didn't wait uh, for budget uh, cycle, uh, Mr. Chair, to uh, help inform and influence the uh, patient uh, uh, offload uh, direction to the health authority and uh, EHS to uh, work together to m improve the situation. We've seen improvements, I think, here in the central zone where the uh, challenges were the worst. Uh, the average time has uh, decreased from you know something in the vicinity of 90 minutes to to less than.
than 60 now, still not uh, good enough, uh, but it is uh, certainly progress that was made uh, based upon those. And uh, as I've previously mentioned, uh, we've uh, looked at that and the concerns from paramedics to uh, inform uh, the budget, uh, recognizing that patient flow challenges impact their ability to efficiently transfer patients into a hospital setting so they can get back out to the community to do their work. Not just, uh, Mr. Chair, and this is really just uh, because I know that the member uh, has uh, a, a practice here. I want to want to really use this to to illustrate that I've heard uh, again. It's not just about how much time they spend during their shift uh, there, uh, but a real frustration is also uh, when they, they they kind of miss the end of their shifts, uh, or uh, they finish their shift and they have to get back to their community because they came from outside of uh, the the urban centre uh, to do the transfer, and the transfer takes uh, too long. Uh, that's why, Mr. Speaker, we've prioritized uh, funding uh, into patient flow uh, services and support to continue that uh, work to try to continue to uh, see these improvements uh, and and the great thing about these investments Mr. Speaker and, and as we recognize in the same way that these challenges developed over time because of an integrated health system that challenges in one area have an impact in other areas uh, this patient flow investment uh, should help uh, not just for the paramedics and the transfer offload uh, but other parts of the uh, health care system in the hospital as well. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quickly on the topic of power stretchers, uh, noting the bilateral funding uh, opportunity, and uh, you know it's a, a request that's been long coming uh, from the paramedic community. Uh, but uh, I think the question that, uh, that remains is when can the paramedic community uh, expect the remaining fleet to be equipped with the power load systems and the power load stretchers? The health minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We don't have a defined uh, period of time. Uh, we know that uh, with the investment uh, right now, uh the, um, ab about almost half the uh, ambulance fleet is being uh, retrofitted uh, with the equipment uh, uh, and uh, retrofitted to have the uh, capacity to work with the uh, power stretchers. Uh, that uh, is uh, the first step that's uh, ongoing uh, throughout uh, this year. Um, we don't have uh, defined uh, for uh, the future years uh, where uh, the investments would be, um, but uh, as we discussed uh, last night, I think operationally, uh, we think potentially three to five years uh, uh, but if we find opportunity uh, to advance uh, more quickly than that, uh, we would do that. Uh, but uh, again, that's not a, a commitment that would happen. But operationally, we think uh, that uh, staff have, have suggested they think they might be able to do it in, in roughly that uh, time period. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the Minister for that response. Um, I want to say that I appreciate the Minister's uh, knowledge of all the issues or a lot of the issues that paramedics uh, face uh, day and night um, but i'm not sure if the picture is being properly painted uh, in this department um, you know paramedics in nova scotia have one of the leading scopes of practice in north america um, but with the increased demand such as call volume transfer volume the offload delays um, all of that's <coughs> causing this system to be overburdened. The system that's created 20 years ago, um, a system that hasn't really significantly uh, had any um, increased numbers to reflect the call volume that's exponentially increased. You know, we've seen a, a significant decrease in ambulance availability across this province. Uh, I brought it before to the floor of the legislature regarding code critical. I know it's not a term that the department uses, but it is to sound the alarm regarding ambulance availability. You know, when you hear of an ambulance parked in Yarmouth and one in Blockhouse and the next one in HRM, that's very frightening to me. And I know that this system is very complex and it's not a, an easy fix, but this is a matter of public safety. Uh, lives depend on these decisions being made and appropriately made in, in a timely fashion. Uh, bases are not being covered due to the ambulances being spread thin. Um, Bases not being staffed uh, because of staffing issues. Paramedics are ending up spending hours on end parked on the side of a highway with no access to washrooms. Um, so my question for the minister at this time, you know, I have three paramedic stations in my community, uh, Pumnico, Woods Harbour and Barrington, and a big portion of my constituency is covered by, by Yarmouth. But what, what does the minister have to say to my constituents that 
uh, have a, a paramedic base in their community but do not have readily access to an ambulance and wait uh, exponential wait times for, for that ambulance to arrive on their doorsteps. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, first and foremost, as, as the member uh, is familiar and, and explained uh, not just the, the complexity in the system, um, but some of that complexity uh, in the system is uh, uh, based upon the design and the dynamic nature of uh, redeploying, as I'm sure the, the member is uh, aware, uh, and those uh, ambulance uh, resources that are in communities uh, throughout the, the province uh, that re get redeployed so that they're stationed at uh, locations based upon uh, anticipated uh, areas of high uh, higher call uh, demand um, so that uh, it uh, does m ensure the fastest uh, response time possible. Um, so it's important uh, for residents to be aware of that, uh, that uh, just because uh, an individual doesn't see a, a, an ambulance uh, doesn't mean one uh, is not uh, dispatched uh, to uh, the community or to the emergency in a, a timely fashion. Uh, and in fact, uh, again, uh, with that uh, dynamic nature, it's also worth noting, uh, again, investments that we've made in the last couple of years, not just for ground ambulance, uh, but also our investment in air ambulance uh, support services uh, for those uh, regions of the, the province further away, or, or particularly with emergency, uh, highly uh, acute uh, needs that need to bring them into uh, the, the Halifax region of the QE2, Mr. Chair. We have uh, invested, we now have two uh, uh, helicopters uh, available uh, that uh, as part of the uh, upgraded contract from a couple of years ago uh, and uh, the fixed wing uh, that's uh, on, on uh uh, uh, available as well uh, for uh, the life flight uh, services. So uh, again, uh, we're investing in emergency uh, services. Uh, we recognize the importance of uh, rapid uh, response. And uh, again, we've been uh, uh, investing uh, to support those uh, services. The member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank the minister for that response. So. Um, I have a hard time justifying to my constituents, uh, you know, often Pomnico doesn't have uh, a, an ambulance parked in that station, neither does Woods Harbour. So four or two out of the four stations, I'm just talking about my constituency, uh, don't have uh, quite often uh, an ambulance parked in that station. So, and this is all uh, due to increased demand on the system. Uh, so, and I can, uh, I appreciate the justification of uh, the the best deployment with what we have, uh, but I, I, it's hard to agree that let's do the, great, that, the greatest that we can do with what we have. So wouldn't all this, uh, the overburn system, the decreased ambulance availability, the increased offload got, uh, times, wouldn't that be indicative that the system needs to change and that we need more resources such as more ambulances, more staff and more shifts? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. In fact, uh, in, in the list uh, uh, cited uh, there, uh, the member uh, uh, indicated increased offload times. In fact, uh, with the efforts we've been making, we've been decreasing uh, the offload uh, transfer times into hospitals, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so again, uh, the, the seeing increases was certainly indicative of, of uh, cause to uh, uh, look at and evaluate and, and work with the system. Uh, that's uh, why we, we made the, uh, I, I provided the direction that I did uh, last spring uh, to both the Health Authority and DHS uh, that uh, uh, for too long I felt that uh, or it seemed to me that uh, uh, the parties were operating their uh, respective systems uh, and not enough attention uh, paid to where those systems uh, intersect and the responsibilities overlap. So the, the essence of my direction at that time was to uh, mandate those uh, two parties to uh, work together. Uh, recognizing the challenges of, of both parties to see improvements and uh, and, and they didn't uh, necessarily uh, require uh, the, the improvements of, of uh, uh, more ambulances but we have seen the reduction time which means that time that they haven't been waiting uh, this year from those reductions means that they were back out. We've actually increased the availability uh, because we've uh, reduced those uh, wait times so uh, before uh, expanding the hiring and the establishment of, of more um, infrastructure and, and, and systems uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, uh, an efficient uh, operating uh, uh, system throughout the entire uh, health system. That's why, uh, again, uh, we continue to focus. Uh, we believe that there's more opportunity there uh, to do, uh, make more improvements. That's why we uh, invested in the patient flow 
uh, program uh, this year uh, to see if we can get some, some further advances with uh, an increased budget uh, to see those benefits uh, flow back uh, into, uh, through the system, including to uh, frontline uh, paramedics. Uh, so that, uh, I think, is a, an important part of it. And as far as recognizing that, uh, you know, after 20, 25 years uh, from the last major re redevelopment in our, our uh, ambulance uh, paramedic emergency services, um, in fact, that's why we, we established uh, the Fitch uh, report uh, you know, the Auditor General had made a, a suggestion, uh, I believe, to, uh, to uh, uh, perform such a review. Uh, we've uh, conducted the review and recognized that uh, some of those uh, changes that are recommended uh, affect uh, you know, the contracted service delivery with our, our service provider. Uh, so we will uh, take that uh, as we have uh, under advisement to help inform our negotiating strategy uh, as we update uh, our contract uh, with our uh, paramedic ambulance uh, service emergency uh, service provider and uh, I think that uh, again is indicative of, uh, of uh, again I think a, a joint uh, recognition of, of the need to make changes uh, and we're committed uh, to doing so. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, just want to note that the last time a Fitch report was done was early 2000s and that report is in fact available online and unredacted. Uh, I have to respectively disagree with the minister that offload guidelines from what I've been told uh, are working. Um, I've heard that the offload, guide, the offload times have since risen. Uh, so my question is what data does the minister have? Uh, what's the most recent data um, that he can provide? The Honourable Minister of Health. As, uh, as I think I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the most recent, I think, uh, compared it to um, December of 18, the average time in Central was 90 minutes, uh, and now it's at about 58 or 59 uh, minutes. So uh, that uh, would be uh, the data. I don't have the exact date of when that 58-59 uh, uh, minute uh, uh, came, uh, came into uh, the department, um, but that's uh, the data I have. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, memory serves me correctly, those offload guidelines were implemented in a certain number, uh, five uh, uh, maybe, uh, hospitals across the province. Uh, is the minister and his department considering of expanding that, uh, those guidelines right across the province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Our focus uh, on those uh, six facilities, uh, which uh, we recognize take up about 82% of the provincial uh, offload time at those six uh, facilities. So our, really our intensive focus is on those sites because that's where we're going to get the most value um, within the system. Uh, so they're uh, both most frequent and the longest uh, durations. Um, so to make sure that uh, we make the uh, greatest uh, value with our investments. And it's important to recognize, again, particularly since uh, many most of these facilities are in the uh, central uh, region, uh, you know, in part of the QE2 system, uh, that uh, it's important to recognize that it's not just uh, an investment that uh, supports uh, paramedics that service the central region because many uh, paramedics from outside of the Halifax providing transfers uh, from communities uh, across the province are actually transferring and driving and, and being caught up in those uh, uh, central zone uh, offload uh, delays. Uh, so these investments in, uh, in the central zone, uh, again, and those other sites uh, do have a positive impact on paramedics who do work at uh, other uh, regions uh, as well. So uh, this is not, uh, this is recognizing again, uh, we're trying to invest uh, to support uh, all of our, our paramedics. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's talk about the increased demand on the system. In part, is increased um, call volume. So, uh, doing some research over the last few days, uh, looked online. The last published uh, EHS annual report, which goes over all the whole system, is I think from 2012. So, nothing published online. I guess we could try to foil pop that. But uh, we know that call volume, I've heard that, you know, back in the day from the older generation medics that if you did 200 calls a day, that was a busy shift, a uh, busy day. Uh, but now we're seeing days with 500, 600, probably eventually creeping up on 700 calls a day. Um, that's quite significant. Uh, so my question for the minister is why is this increase? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and and I think uh, those. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about the earlier numbers, uh, but uh, certainly uh, uh, those peak call uh, volumes uh, in that uh, 500 uh, plus uh, range uh, is, uh, is is as consistent uh, with uh, the information that I would have uh, as well. Um, and uh, that that is uh, the challenging uh, challenging part uh, as far as uh, reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, the reasons would be uh, variable, uh, various communities. Uh, but at the end of the day, it boils down to uh, citizens who are calling to uh, receive emergency services, and uh, the system has to be there uh, to support them. Uh, what we've uh, looking at it uh, recognize is that uh, perhaps there are other ways uh, that we can be more efficient in uh, managing calls where we can do a better job in, in supporting uh, people at home so that um, we can uh, provide care uh, in an altered setting and also so that that care doesn't necessarily require transport. Uh, so uh, if you look at programs like the, uh, I believe it's called the uh, uh, special, special patient. I think it's a special patient care program, and I have to double check if that's the the official uh, title for it, uh, where uh, patients can can register and, and uh, can receive uh, uh, care within their home and, and don't necessarily need the uh, transport. You look at what we've uh, rolled out uh, last year in uh, the Cape Breton region as part of the uh, redevelopment in Cape Breton for the community paramedicine uh, program. You look at uh, how that special patient program supports the palliative care patients, uh, which may otherwise require transport uh, to a hospital for, for for their management. Instead, uh, we can have uh, dedicated uh, paramedic uh, experts, uh, healthcare providers go into the, the home, provide care and support with uh, oversight uh, through uh, dispatch or phone calls back to uh, medical, over, uh, medical oversight from a physician. Um, so these are some innovative uh, programs. So uh, I guess in, in recognizing those programs, I should note uh, to the member's earlier statement uh, that the system hasn't evolved. In fact, uh, we continue to be pretty innovative here in Nova Scotia. Uh, and evolve our system, um, but uh, again, we, we just haven't uh, recognized all of that. We've done them in certain parts of the community. Uh, communities, uh, we need, uh, as part of our going forward, is identifying those ones that have the biggest value, uh, do the most to improve the system and the health of our patients, uh, uh, citizens, uh, so that uh, we can roll up. But we're still committed, I think, as shown with our, our community paramedicine program, to leverage the uh, skill sets of our paramedics uh, to help uh, in the delivery of care and reduce the number of transports necessary. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Talking about people that don't, or no Scotians that don't necessarily require <coughs> transports. Uh, as the idea circulated around the minister's department um, about uh, deviating people that don't necessarily, maybe not need 911 uh, and paramedics, and that those types of calls could be uh, deviated through another path, such as a improved, uh, efficient, and effective 811 system or another uh, allied agency. The honourable, the honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And indeed, uh, we have a number of uh, of uh, initiatives and suggestions. Uh, that have uh, percolated uh, certainly uh, the opportunity. Um, and again, this isn't just about our EHS uh, system, but uh, to leverage uh, virtual care opportunities uh, for uh, our, our citizenship. Uh, we hear that uh, from uh, physicians uh, as well, um, which would be similar to leveraging a, a telemedicine, uh, which is a, a form of virtual care um, that is non-face-to-face -face, uh, care uh, provision. So uh, we do have work ongoing to, uh, to uh, really pl plot that course in what is uh, a relatively new area within uh, the healthcare system. So uh, we do have work uh, ongoing to establish uh, the plan uh, and chart a path forward, uh, again, not just uh, for, um, you know, within uh, the emergency kind of health services space, but in the broader uh, health services space as well. The member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, part of the increased demand on the system and the increased call volume is reflective in the increased number of, of transfers, uh, notably interfacility, return to residences, uh, medical appointments, dialysis. Um, so has there been any uh, consideration or discussion within the minister's department to uh, potentially separate the emergency from the non-emergency 
um, systems and have that difference and have a separate transfer service so the transfer service can uh, deal with the transfers and the emergency service can, de uh, can deal with the 911 emergency calls. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As I've uh, indicated, we have a, a large number of uh, initiatives uh, that uh, have been flagged uh, throughout uh, the last uh, year or so. Uh, those uh, details are informing uh, the work uh, that uh, we will be doing. Uh, what I can assure the members uh, for all of those uh, recommendations and the uh, actions we'll be taking, uh, we will uh, be informed and guided by uh, really a, a desire and an objective uh, to uh, ensure that we have the most efficient and effective care uh, delivery uh, provided to our patients. That's a, a principle that's guided us uh, through all aspects of our health care system, uh, uh, in the primary and acute care system, as well as our emergency system. So uh, without uh, getting into to uh, all of the details. Again, I'll assure the member that uh, uh, we're, we're taking a, a look at uh, many opportunities uh, to improve, but uh, again, many of those uh, require negotiations uh, with our, our service provider, and uh, and that, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, would be ongoing, so I won't be uh, going into details as to what specific details we may have uh, uh, specifically uh, on the table uh, with them at this time. Member for Barrington Argyle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can make the hypothetical argument that such uh, evidence may be being withheld in uh, the Fitch report, but well, I guess that'll be a conversation for another day. Um, let's talk about um, the paramedic morale across this province. And as I've stood in my place before, uh, talking about the, uh, the circum not only are the circumstances of the job um, above and beyond, uh, but the current state of the system is having a negative impact on the overall mental health and well-being of our first responders. Um, the minister alluded that you know they're missing the end of their shift. Um, you know they make plans. It's hard to make plans in, in, as being a paramedic. You miss birthday parties uh, and hockey uh, and, and sporting uh, games for, for your children and whatnot. So the average uh, paramedic career is around 20 years old or 20 years, and new and the older paramedics are unsure if they'll even make it to that 20-year mark. So, as we know, there's a huge staffing uh, challenge in Nova Scotia for various uh, healthcare uh, professions, but uh, in including the paramedic one. But has the minister considered the impact on the system if a number of current uh, paramedics were to leave the profession? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and I do appreciate uh, the member uh, for, for raising uh, awareness uh, here on the floor of the legislature um, uh, about the the challenges, uh, particularly uh, the member uh, alluded to um, some of the uh, uh, mental health and, and stress uh, stressors that uh, affect our, our frontline uh, paramedics and, and other healthcare professionals and emergency responders as well. And uh, it's, I don't think we can raise that uh, topic and, and awareness uh, too often. And, and in fact, um, uh, without uh, using uh, the individual's name, I. I uh, perhaps uh, the member may be uh, a little too young uh, to be aware of uh, a particular uh, paramedic who uh, is from my constituency um, who uh, actually uh, through his uh, challenges with mental health uh, on, on the front line actually established a, um, a, a, a PTSD uh, conference uh, which uh, is, is hosted in, in my community uh, annually. Um, uh, I, I, he's, he's a fairly well-known individual especially within the paramedic community so he, he may be aware um, and, and so uh, again I just want to give a, a nod there to um, to those paramedics uh, who are suffering, um, and in particular to those who have made it through their challenges. Um. The mentorship that they provide to others uh, in the system. Uh. 
So the challenges are real, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we recognize that. Um, uh, we uh, we continue to uh, focus. I, I think uh, again when it comes to the morale. Um, uh, I know in, in my conversations, uh, again, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, we're, we're committed to uh, continuing the, the work that we've uh, commenced. Um, I, I want uh, the member and, and all paramedics uh, out there to recognize that uh, uh, they uh, are uh, recognized, their concerns are being heard, uh, and we are uh, taking efforts to uh, address them. Uh, as with many of the challenges within our healthcare system, there's no single solution, uh, there's no immediate uh, solution, um, but uh, we are taking those steps. And in, in my conversations with, with people on the front line, uh, and this is not to diminish uh, the, the frustrations and the challenges that are out there, but they are recognizing the good work and the investments uh, that we've been making and, and our focus. Uh, to the specific question that the member uh, raised, um, about uh, workforce planning. Um, in fact, uh, we do have a, a team within the Department of, of Health and Wellness uh, that is focused on health human resource planning, um, and that's uh, what their, their roles and responsibility are, uh, is to do the planning uh, and uh, forecasting of anticipated uh, needs within the uh, system, and they do that uh, for uh, all of our health uh, professions, uh, which uh, would include uh, paramedicine. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the minister for his response. You know, I'm concerned for the well-being of paramedics, not just because they're uh, regular Nova Scotians, it's because many of them are uh, my friends and close friends and former colleagues. Um, I don't feel what I understand from from the that per, the paramedic population is that they're not being heard and that their, their calls for help for mental health and their overall well-being um, are not necessarily being supported at, at the best that they can be. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about mental health on the floor before and uh, we've, we've, we've noted the, the I guess, uh, insignificant increase uh, in mental health services in the budget of 550000 So I, I think it seriously has to be considered on how government uh, can take a proactive approach of uh, addressing their concerns of well-being um, and that's reflective on taking significant and immediate steps to address the system because the system's taking a toll on their day-to-day -day life. Um, they're on the go all day, they're in a truck all day, dealing with all kinds of things. Now we've heard increased instances of, of um, verbal and physical assaults and abuse, and that should not be tolerated. So um, maybe to wrap up my, my questioning, uh, the minister could comment on what approaches should government be taking um, to recognize that paramedics are, are facing um, verbal and physical assaults, um, and that should not be tolerated. Uh, you know, if you assault a police of officer, you're going to get charged differently than if you f uh, assault a, uh, a general uh, citizen. So maybe you can address that. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank uh, the member again uh, for raising uh, these, these important uh, questions. Uh, again, uh, I think um, the actions we've already taken shows uh, our commitments um, uh, in, in being heard um, consistently. The offloads has been the number one. Uh, I've heard this uh, directly from union representatives. If you can do one thing, make some improvements in the offloads. That's the, that's, that's the, the number one stressor. It's not the only, um, but it's the, you know, at that moment in time last year uh, was the biggest. We need to see that, 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 uh, that change. Uh, as the member said, Mr. Chair, a system needs to change. Well, that's exactly what we're doing with the patient flow. That's exactly what we're doing uh, to address that, what was flagged for me. If that's not true, if that's not the number one issue and number one concern, um, then, uh, 
uh, certainly I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to receive others, uh, but that had been uh, consistent uh, from frontline paramedics I spoke to as well as their union representatives, uh, and that's why I made that direction, because I did hear them, I did take action, I brought those people together, and I continue to invest in doing that. Uh, as it relates to uh, hearing from them, we also hear, again, the, the pressures that come from the injuries, and the workplace injuries, and the impact that uh, paramedics being injured has on the availability of workflow. Well, that's why we're investing in the uh, power stretchers. So again, we're hearing and we're uh, taking action and investing. So again, it's the start, not the finish. Thank you. The time has elapsed for the Conservative Caucus. Uh, I'll ask uh, uh, the Minister, members of the House, if they would like a five-minute health break. Okay, uh, the House will recess for five minutes. Order. Uh, now call upon uh, the member for Halifax, Shibukdo, with well, the NDP. 
It could be in the course of budget estimates that a person simply just standing up seems quite dramatic. <laughs> I, uh, I'd like to, to go back to uh, where we were uh, an hour ago when we were thinking about uh, questions about physicians. And where we left this, uh, the minister had given me an explanation about the 75.3 million uh, and uh, I was asking what of that um, could be um, attributed to things other than the master agreement allocated for recruitment and retention and the minister had explained to me about the 69 million from the master agreement and had spoken about as I understood it 9 million allocated for uh, new specialist positions, um, but it would be easy to see where I'm getting lost in the arithmetic of that. That 69 and 9 comes to 78, not 75, so I think I've misunderstood. Um, I'm, well, it's all, my question is really simple. I'm just trying to understand the part in addition to the master agreement that that 75 would include and how it's allocated to this purpose. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I think uh, I think I may have uh, misinterpreted uh, uh, or misspoke uh, uh, in my previous uh, response um, because uh, the, the commitment on specialty uh, seats uh, is actually, uh, I believe, reflected in the, the master agreement as well. Um, so for the math uh, arithmetic, uh, what I was referring to, I think, was um, uh, items within the, the within the investment that aren't necessarily just directly to remuneration uh, wage increases uh, aspects because I think those are our service and program delivery things that would be different so um, collectively in the master agreement the the, the number stands that uh, we've uh, estimated and budgeted uh, 69 point three million dollars uh, for this fiscal year um, but in a, in addition to that uh, we have so just outside of that additional funding for uh, uh, a locum incentive program, um, uh, locum program of about 2.8. Uh, I should just uh, just give me one second here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Sorry, I was just reading the uh, the sheet uh, incorrectly. Uh, items that uh, would fall outside of the master agreement would be uh, the uh, residency uh, seats uh, that would be coming on stream. Uh, so 1.9 million for 15 specialist uh, residents and 1.3 for the 10 uh, new family uh, medicine residents uh, starting in July. Uh, so that would be uh, what's outside of the master agreement. The mem the member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm thinking back to the uh, report that Doctors Nova Scotia then brought forward um, about satisfaction within the profession in the province. From, uh, this going back to May 17. I'm sure the minister is aware that the the report uh, from Doctors Nova Scotia spoke about the the struggles with workload that are very common in the profession. Um, and the very high levels of exhaustion and cynicism and also a general sense of, uh, I think the survey had put it, inefficacy, uh, which I take to mean a, a sense that one is not making much headway uh, uh, in, uh, in general. And, and also, um, this, um, that report talked about physicians experiencing a lack of respect. Um, and. Uh, uh, th these are the words of the report that uh, only 40% agreed it was possible to provide high quality care to all my patients. Um, and I'm sure the minister is aware too that the report did speak about one of the most potentially fruitful ways to address all of this identified by physicians there was to improve the relationship with the NSHA. Uh, so I, I want to speak to that concern and ask first, what specifically is being done to address physician burnouts at the moment? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, at, at the, the highest level, uh, and we can tease in perhaps a, a little bit more if, if desired, but uh, I think uh, a lot of the work of, of teasing out and identifying what uh, investments and steps that uh, could be taken um, for Doctors Nova Scotia on behalf of physicians uh, would have uh, manifest itself at the negotiating table uh, leading to the uh, master agreement. Um, I can't speak uh, for Doctors Nova Scotia but uh, as they uh, represent the interests of their membership uh, and uh, had authored a report based upon a survey of their membership uh, I would uh, have expect that uh, the um, items they bring forward to, to be negotiated would also be informed by that uh, same material. Uh, so uh, we do have uh, some uh, changes within the master agreement, some with remuneration, some uh, actually relate to, to uh, new programs for the delivery of, of uh, services that uh, meet both the needs of, of uh, government and the health authority to ensure continuity of, of care, uh, for example, in inpatient services at some uh, community hospitals. A new program is developed uh, to support that uh, through the negotiations uh, that's been well received uh, by uh, physicians. Uh, so uh, I think, again, the master agreement uh, does a, a significant part of uh, of contributing to that and of course recruitment and retention as we build the supply uh, reduce as we've seen over the last year or so uh, as the member noted uh, that uh, report he was referencing was from back in the fall of uh, I believe fall of 17 uh, when you uh, actually look here we are in the uh, spring of 2020 uh, so about uh, you know a couple of years later we uh, we actually had a lot of, of change uh, we've had uh, success with our recruitment new programs and initiatives and as I just mentioned in my last response we have uh, new residents uh, who will be available to come on stream uh, in just uh, a couple of years, uh, which will, uh, I think, give some hope uh, and support uh, to uh, the work. Um, and uh, one of the other contributing factors, I think, uh, that was flagged uh, by, uh, by uh, physicians was administrative bur uh, burden uh, and that uh, one of the underlining uh, um, concerns uh, about uh, being able, as the member referenced, Mr. Chair, uh, being able to provide the care, having adequate time to provide adequate care, what have you, uh, to their patients, uh, part of the frustration stemmed back to spending too much time on paperwork and administrative burden. Uh, that, uh, Mr. Chair, is why as part of the master agreement as well. We re recognize that as government. Uh, we have uh, an Office of Regulatory uh, Affairs and Effectiveness that was already established in government. They obviously have shown uh, major strides uh, when it comes to uh, engaging and, and efficiencies uh, within the uh, private sector. So we're engaging them to lead uh, work and help guide us uh, through uh, the reduction of those administrative burdens while uh, at the same time ensuring that all of the necessary uh, oversights and uh, administration that is necessary, but only that administration that's necessary to inform uh, the uh, the appropriate uh, care and administration of our health care system. So we should see reduced administration, which should also further help uh, reduce uh, burnout based upon the information that's come to us, Mr. Chair. The member for Halifax, Shabukdo. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate that explanation. So when we look to the budget for... Um, uh, government initiatives and spending that uh, address the physician burnout question. Uh, are there lines elsewhere beyond the master agreement that we ought to be looking to? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, the master agreement uh, really is that overarching uh, agreement that uh, governs uh, our uh, compensation and, and relationship uh, with physicians and their uh, bargaining agent, uh, Doctors Nova Scotia. Um, so uh, while, uh, again, uh, we have a number of initiatives in there, that's uh, probably the most significant uh, area uh, of investment. As I've said, uh, we do have uh, you know the regulatory uh, 
efficiency piece uh, or the administrative efficiency piece that uh, we uh, are bringing in uh, as well. Uh, that's uh, conversations I believe have already uh, started. Uh, so I think, uh, again, uh, what were flagged as the top areas of priority uh, that uh, have come uh, forward to us uh, from physicians uh, really uh, does uh, help. Uh, another area uh, of investment uh, is the uh, investments we've been making and support of collaborative practices, collaborative teams uh, within our healthcare system. That's something we've heard uh, from physicians about being able to provide uh, you know, a, a more uh, sustainable uh, environment. We do have additional funds funding, uh, supporting collaborative teams this year. I think uh, based upon um, the last number of years of investments, uh, we're upwards of, I think, uh, sustained investment of something in the vicinity of $27 million uh, to support our, our uh, expanded uh, collaborative care practices uh, throughout the province. Um, these are, are, are some of those things. So uh, again, they show up in different ways and different forms uh, and different areas, but uh, you know, in a broad context, uh, I think the master agreement will be the biggest uh, that you would point to uh, for uh, the members' uh, interests. The member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm sure the the minister recognizes what a what a major area uh, of research and and concern this whole question of vocational exhaustion has become, uh, and that. Uh, and that in the world of healthcare, and that in our world, in Nova Scotia healthcare, the matter of uh, vocational exhaustion and, and burnout of healthcare providers is a, a, a very major consideration. Um, is, is the government undertaking, specifically thinking about phys, this whole matter of physician burnout, is the government undertaking, the department undertaking, uh, any research at this time uh, on the subject of uh, professional exhaustion and, and burnout within Nova Scotia health care, particularly with reference to physicians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, in fact, uh, I know that uh, there's uh, work uh, with uh, partners. Um, I know I know this uh, because I have a, uh, a local physician who's uh, part of it, uh, kind of a mentorship uh, type of program uh, within physicians, physicians helping physicians. This is uh, part of uh, the work uh, that uh, gets undertaken uh, within uh, the physician community uh, that uh, um, it takes place uh, the uh, work uh, uh, as well broadly speaking we invest in in um, uh, mental health uh, programs <clears throat> and and supports uh, as well uh, mr. Uh, chair um, so uh, yes uh, we take uh, those concerns very seriously um, some of the areas again is trying to tackle root causes uh, and that's where the earlier questions uh, I think uh, focused on um, but there's also the need as the members uh, referenced to uh, have uh, supports available and, and in place so uh, we do uh, work uh, to in, in ensure that um, uh, appropriate uh, programming, uh, again, uh, within the system uh, for uh, mental health uh, services as necessary, uh, EAP programs or, or what have you, uh, throughout uh, our uh, employment uh, places. Uh, we also look at um, again, uh, really the, the feedback, it's, it's such a diverse uh, way of um, recognizing where the challenges are uh, you know if it's uh, uh, the stress of, of being um, asked by many people in your community mr. chair for um, because there's a high demand uh, or, or a high number of people looking for a primary care provider uh, so that's the feedback we get in, in some parts of the province with some providers I you know I get a call uh, you know how many calls a week um, being asked or I bump into them at the grocery store um, well how do we address that root cause, Mr. Chair? Uh, the only way we can address that is by uh, attaching more Nova Scotians to primary care. So our recruitment, retention uh, initiatives, our training programs, those are how we're addressing that root cause. Um, how uh, do we address uh, those who uh, feel that uh, managing the uh, top, the, the um, 
managing the uh, work that uh, they have before them within their practice. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, reducing the administrative paperwork burden gives them more time to give them the space to, to do work. Uh, how else can we support that? It's with, through the collaborative practices, uh, bringing other healthcare providers no longer uh, viewing our primary health care system as uh, individual physicians or, or, or physicians working alone in our health care system, but rather uh, recognizing that our health care system has many health uh, providers with a diverse range of skill sets, that actually the best outcomes for all, uh, both the providers and the uh, patients, uh, is through that uh, collaborative work. So again, that continued uh, efforts uh, in that space. I think all of those things help contribute to address uh, the concerns that uh, the member has uh, raised. Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Thank you. Um, am I right then in, in understanding that the department doesn't have at this point any ongoing research in uh, provider burnout, particularly physician burnout. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess uh, if uh, looking at uh, research, and, and I apologize uh, again when, when when I think of uh, research, uh, I do think of it in a in a true pure academic uh, or clinical uh, sense um, that. Uh, we fund uh, this. This came up, I think, yesterday uh, with a member on, on on a different theme about the notion of research projects or programs that get funded uh, by the department. Uh, really, we, we provide funding uh, uh, into Research Nova Scotia, and, and Research Nova Scotia uh, administers uh, funding for research projects uh, for a variety of uh, disciplines, including uh, the health field. Uh, so, as far as specific research uh, programs, we don't. Uh, I'm not aware of one uh, specifically. Uh, that doesn't. Mean that there aren't uh, researchers within the province undertaking this uh, work uh, to provide the feedback. Uh, what uh, we have done, though, uh, now if, if he means uh, research in a, uh, a less specific or, or formal sense, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, I guess, research in, in so much as we review information uh, that comes into us that we're aware of, that uh, we engage with uh, participants uh, and receive information and assess that information to help inform uh, the actions that. That we take. So if it's in that more generic sense of the term research, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, of course that's uh, the nature of the work that we do each and every day, uh, not just in the area of, of, of burnout, but in all areas of concerns being raised by our, our health care providers, physicians and, and others. The member for Halifax, Shabukto. I think the minister just said that research in a more generic form is actually called life. <laughs> I guess that's right. Um, going back to the uh, to the doctors Nova Scotia physician satisfaction research, um, and that that key point identified there of um, uh, unhappy relationships identified by physicians with the with the health authority, um, and how how prevalent that was out of out of that research. Um, and how underlined it came forward from that. Um, can the minister speak to what the department uh, is, is doing uh, with an eye specifically to um, uplifting and improving that relationship, which uh, has surely not been at a satisfactory level to anyone? The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I believe that um, within the uh, Health Authority, that, that is an organization uh, governed uh, by a, a board that uh, does report back uh, to uh, me through the department, uh, through me, uh, Mr. Madam Chair, uh, the, um, the uh, work and uh, the changes being taken uh, within the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority, I think, have uh, been uh, well uh, noted. Uh, I believe that uh, where uh, concerns, we talked a bit about these in our earlier uh, discussions uh, here uh, during estimates, that uh, many of the concerns uh, and frustrations stemming from uh, communication uh, challenges and flows and decision-making uh, processes, um, that uh, process is uh, well underway for significant uh, uh, changes uh, within uh, the health authority. They were announced uh, back in the fall. 
um, to uh, to uh, respond to those concerns. Uh, so I think uh, again, uh, work is being done within the health authority. Uh, we continue to uh, monitor uh, the proposals that uh, they bring forward to uh, address those concerns. Uh, I think uh, we have a, a new uh, chair within the Nova Scotia Health Authority. I guess I maybe uh, note uh, some of the uh, the changes uh, uh, that uh, were noted. Uh, again, keeping in mind this is a report from 2017. Um, things that have happened subsequently. Uh, we've appointed uh, for the first time um, a physician to the uh, board of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority has hired a CEO who happens to be a physician. Uh, a deputy minister has been appointed, uh, although has not yet started, in the Department of... Uh, uh, actually, we did have a physician, for, uh, a, a, a former physician, uh, as the deputy minister uh, for six months on an interim basis, uh, and the successful candidate for the position as deputy minister in the Department of Health and Wellness uh, is a, a physician who's winding up their practice. Um, so an active physician who will be transitioning uh, into uh, a administrative role. So you'll have uh, then a physician, uh, deputy minister and CEO of the, uh, both of our, our health authorities. Uh, that, uh, Madam Chair, I think uh, um, certainly ensures that uh, those uh, concerns and, and communications and relationships um, uh, have the opportunity uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the lens uh, of physicians um, are brought to bear. Uh, at the same time, it's important to recognize that we have many other health care providers within our health system uh, and that we need to hear from uh, them and, and, and their voices as well. Uh, that uh, is why, again, there are uh, former nurses uh, appointed to, to the board of the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, as well, uh, those with uh, that expertise. Uh, and, uh, and again, we, we have uh, uh, a, that opportunity for those lenses uh, to uh, be presented uh, in the uh, senior uh, ranks of, of both uh, uh, the health authorities. So uh, again, I think uh, that uh, if you go back to that report that the member is referencing, um, that was a, a significant piece. They didn't feel that doctors' voices, uh, now doctors' voices are, are literally at uh, the tops of these organizations. Um, they're, um, they're, uh, you know, that uh, is in the early stages of, of, of rollout. The CEO just started uh, in uh, the middle of December 19, uh, and uh, the deputy minister uh, is only slated to start in a couple of months. So uh, again, I think that uh, will go a long way. On top of all of the other um, initiatives we've been talking about, I'm not going to rehash those uh, changes and responses we've made, Madam Chair, uh, in the master agreement, but again, that master agreement itself uh, and uh, the relationship with Doctors Nova Scotia, I, I think, uh, is uh, reflective of uh, significant shifts and uh, feedback uh, that I've been hearing has been uh, quite positive. All issues for all individuals, not necessarily uh, addressed and resolved. I'm not suggesting that, um, but uh, I am saying that uh, broadly, people are, are seeing on the front lines the changes that are being made, and they believe those changes are good. Thank you. The leader of the New Democratic Party. Sure. Um, uh, thanks for that answer, uh, and I'd like to just then go back to where we. Uh, started a few minutes ago uh, thinking about the amount of the money that's in the budget uh, allocated for physician recruitment and retention. Um, could the minister characterize the trajectory of budget spending over the last five years? Uh, are we seeing uh, a parallel amount being spent on retention and physician uh, recruitment? Or are we seeing an increase, a small increase, a large increase? Could the, could the minister speak to, let's say, the trajectory of the last five years? The Honourable Minister of Health. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, again, as uh, as yeah, sorry, uh, Madam Chair, the. Um, the breakout again, I think, uh, as we've had uh, several uh, discussions back and forth about uh, what is or what isn't uh, recruitment and retention, I think uh, 
our budget line items don't uh, line up exactly uh, with that uh, category. So uh, to do uh, uh, an, an historical approach would take uh, some time to uh, uh, answer that more broadly because, uh, as I said, uh, investments in Dalhousie Medical Schools, uh, residency and uh, medical training seats, we believe is a very significant investment that supports recruitment and retention of physicians. Um, that that doesn't uh, tie into uh, you know a line item that says recruitment and retention. It actually is a line item about an investment uh, for uh, physician education and training. So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, for that reason, it becomes very difficult. But uh, as I said, I mean uh, we've invested uh, millions of dollars uh, to the uh, just the uh, training seats, uh, uh, residency and medical seats at uh, Dalhousie University. Uh, we've invested uh, in this most recent master agreement, uh, what amounts to, I believe, about $135 million increase uh, in uh, financial uh, supports and, and programs uh, to support physicians. Uh, now, that would be on the go-forward side of things, but that does show an, a significant uh, increase uh, for uh, physicians in, in that area. They they flagged, again, if we go back to, to the report and the uh, information that was floating around in 2017-18 about the concerns and, and issues uh, raised by physicians, remuneration was a significant one. That's why uh, we didn't wait until we had a new master agreement in 2019, but rather took steps in, in March of 18 uh, to uh, actually um, do some a, an interim top-up uh, to physician uh, compensation. Uh, so, uh, you know, has it increased? Well, if you factor in those uh, increases in compensation in 2018, uh, the master agreement, which does even more, uh, I, I think that very clearly shows a, a trajectory and a trend in, in um, again, root causes, root supports uh, for recruitment and retention. Uh, now, as it relates, uh, if we narrow in and go to what would be traditionally considered recruitment and retention, the actual recruitment team uh, that is on the ground doing recruitment, active recruitment activities. Uh, those, Madam Chair, are activities and uh, actions taken by the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, and the IWK uh, within their respective organizations and, and the uh, line items there would show up in, in, their, uh, in their budgets. The leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Um, just to think further about this same question then, is the province of Nova Scotia spending significantly more in the upcoming budget year for physician retention and recruitment uh, than it has uh, over the previous five years? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think, uh, as we noted, uh, that's uh, about uh, $80 million, $78, 79000000 million uh, investment uh, that uh, uh, goes towards a number of things, including detailed uh, items detailed within the master agreement, uh, contract uh, with physicians, the expansion of residency and medical seats at Dalhousie uh, Medical School. Um, so uh, I would say uh, pretty definitively that that would be a significant uh, new monies that uh, have been invested this year that uh, were not uh, part of uh, compensation and investments in uh, uh, year, five years ago. So that would be, a, a, I think, a pretty definitive yes uh, in uh, the broad sense of supporting those uh, things that support recruitment and retention. The leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, and, and thanks for that explanation. So continuing to think about this uh, whole area of professional satisfaction and professional morale in uh, the whole healthcare world in the province, I'd like to turn and think some about nursing. Um, we know that uh, this is a, a multifaceted concern, but that in the world of nursing, a, a great deal of the concern that's been expressed uh, has to do with nurse safety. Uh, you know, I'm referring to that 2019 Nurses Safety Survey re uh, review. Uh, everything okay? All square? Yeah. Uh, referring to that uh, 2019 Nurses Safety Survey uh, that uh, was presented to the Minister of Health when it was done last year, uh, note that 93% of the nurses surveyed said that they felt that their patients were being put at risk because they, as nurses, were working short. 92% uh, said that in the last five years, for them, 
their workload had increased, and uh, only 12% of them said that they feel safe at work. Uh, this was a, a pretty dramatic revelation, I think, for a lot of people when the, when the survey was, result, well, was uh, distributed. Uh, at the time, I'm, I'm quoting from NSGEU President uh, Jason McLean, he said, the, the results of this survey show that nurses are struggling to provide safe, safe patient care, uh, given the consistent staffing shortages that they're facing on the front lines. Something must be done immediately to address the very serious concerns that are being brought forward. So I'm sure the minister will remember that at, at the time when the, the survey was released by the union, uh, there was a call uh, to him to establish a working group uh, in order to identify solutions to improve morale in the nursing profession, but in particular to address the, the specific concerns related to safety in the nursing profession in the province. So I want to ask first, has such a comprehensive team to address these concerns been um, put together? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, in fact, yes, steps uh, were uh, taken uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, to um, evaluate uh, security and, and security uh, provisions and, and so forth. Um, in fact, uh, just uh, recently, um, uh, we had a meeting uh, joint uh, with uh, the CEO and uh, representative of the Nova Scotia Nurses Union to, to uh, talk in part uh, about this uh, very thing. Um, and, uh, and I believe there have been uh, some additional meetings uh, set up and established uh, between the union. I think uh, where perhaps some of that work may have been challenged, Mr. Chair, was that um, uh, where that engagement uh, with the union. So I don't think uh, unions uh, were necessarily uh, kept up to date as to the work that the employer was performing. And, uh, but the, the reality is that uh, the work, uh, a lot of work has been done um, and uh, I, the new CEO is certainly committed to uh, um, trying to bridge those lines of communications to make sure that uh, uh, the uh, nurses' uh, representatives are also aware uh, of the work that's ongoing and uh, next steps. So again, it is an area that was taken uh, seriously and, and work's uh, uh, started and uh, will continue. The member for Halifax, Shabukdo. Thank you. Um, then could the minister following along this line then uh, identify uh, how much funding in the current budget is being allocated to respond to these particular nurse safety uh, concerns and to move towards possible solutions? The member for uh, the health minister, sorry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we don't have uh, a specific uh, line item uh, targeted uh, uh, to uh, what would be that uh, specific uh, report uh, uh, broadly uh, because that uh, particular uh, response is, is, is focused uh, responsibility of our health authorities uh, who uh, would be the employers of uh, the nurses. Um, we know uh, that there's a significant increase in our, our funding to the uh, health authority to uh, deliver their operational services and delivery of care uh, to, um, and, and part of that care of course is uh, supporting those health care providers uh, within their system to, uh, to deliver that care. Um, with, uh, with respect to uh, broadly uh, the importance of health and safety within our workplace, I know uh, we've uh, spoken about this uh, and uh, we have uh, been investing in, in programs and in, in uh, other areas as well for equipment and uh, there is a, a, broad, uh, a broader initiative around workplace safety within the healthcare uh, sector. Um, much of the focus has been uh, uh, with partners like Aware Nova Scotia um, and our unions uh, really coming together to provide uh, input uh, along with the employers uh, within the sectors uh, to uh, ensure uh, that we have um, um, uh, recognized our shared responsibility and, uh, and the importance that uh, health and safety and uh, 
uh, and it is our, all of our responsibilities. And that's why, as we talked about yesterday in the long-term care sector, continuing care sector, the investments we've been making there. Uh, but again, as it relates to the action, and I think the uh, uh, workplace safety uh, concerns being raised in the report that was cited, uh, I think these are more, um, less kind of the workplace safety in the traditional sense, and I think more violence-related uh, uh, workplace safety uh, incidents and concerns, which picks up on the remarks that uh, uh, the last uh, member of uh, the PC uh, caucus uh, who had been uh, at, inquiring, uh, but as it related to paramedics, it is certainly a growing concern uh, for government uh, that um, our, our frontline healthcare workers uh, being subjected to uh, verbal and, and sometimes uh, physical um, um, uh, incidents that uh, uh, no one uh, going into the, their workplace should be subjected to. We recognize that uh, and that's why we, we support this uh, work that's uh, ongoing with the employers. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Thank, thank you. Uh, then further to that, is, is there then within the department uh, any a specific evaluation work or research work being conducted uh, around this uh, issue nurses have identified as paramount for them, the question of their safety? The Health Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I think uh, as far as uh, research, there's uh, within uh, the department, uh, we rely uh, often on, on uh, uh, other research that's uh, conducted um, to help inform strategies uh, for, for solutions uh, for moving forward, but also um, when we look at uh, our nursing strategy and the partnership uh, that uh, exists where uh, all stakeholders that uh, represent nurses come together at a table uh, to share information, insights and, and a path forward. I think that's uh, an area where uh, a lot of that uh, sharing of information and, uh, and solutions and there is a uh, financial contribution to that uh, strategy uh, that allows us to prioritize some uh, investments targeted improving uh, circumstances uh, for uh, our uh, nursing uh, workforce. Um, and uh, that includes uh, some support in investing for nonviolent crisis intervention training and, and programs uh, like that. The member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Uh, th thank you. Uh, then, uh, thinking about nursing, I I'd like to just ask some, some more um, uh, empirical and specific questions. I don't expect that uh, the Minister of Staff would have the uh, answer to this just to hand here today, uh, but would it be possible to supply for us uh, the number of emergency room nurse vacancies that there are in uh, each of the emergency rooms in the province? Uh, is that a figure the department would have and that uh, could be made available? The health minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, given that the emergency departments are uh, uh, the purview of the Nova Scotia Health Authority and, and the IWK for their uh, emergency department, uh, we, the member's correct. We don't have that uh, information uh, here today. We'd have to reach out to the health authorities to uh, obtain it. The member for Halifax, Shibakdo. But, but the minister is saying it would be possible to do that for us. We could take that as a, an undertaking to do that, I think. Um, um, then, then also thinking about nursing vacancies uh, in general, um, on the same list, it would be useful to know how many nurse vacancies there are at, at each hospital in the province. Is that a figure that the minister could see we could be supplied with? The health minister. Again, uh, we'll, uh, we'll connect uh, to uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority to uh, see uh, what uh, vacancies uh, are established. Uh, again, uh, uh, in the interim, as a, perhaps a, a bit of a proxy, uh, the member can certainly look at uh, the um, job postings uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, those, those job postings would be publicly uh, available and certainly would reflect uh, vacancies, um, but those would be uh, predominantly permanent vacancies. You also have some short-term 
long-term ones. Um, so again, we'll uh, we'll make some inquiries to see what kind of uh, vacancy data for nurses uh, that we have uh, that can be uh, made available. Um, but again, in the interim, uh, for short-term proxy, again, the member can, can look at uh, job postings as well. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, thank you. And, and on that same list of information about nurse vacancies, uh, would it be possible for us to be supplied uh, with how long the longest nurse vacancy in the province at the moment has remained unfilled? The Health Minister. We'll, we'll take a look. I, I uh, again, can't uh, state uh, definitively uh, what uh, uh, that the health authority has that exact uh, data, but uh, we'll certainly uh, uh, connect with them and uh, see what uh, data is available. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Thank you. Um, thinking about the, this uh, problem, which comes up not in, that infrequently, about uh, provision of nursing, the situations in the province where we have um, uh, shortages of nurses in regional hospitals, but we don't have shortages of nurses in uh, community hospitals, in particular in uh, with collaborative emergency centers. Uh, I want to ask the minister, is it a common practice that uh, in the province, we're in effect pulling nursing staff from CECs to cover regional ERs where we have nursing shortages. The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I can't uh, say definitively that, uh, as the member phrased it, a common practice uh, or not, um, but it is uh, something that I believe uh, occurs. <laughs> Uh, number one uh, priority is, of course, uh, ensuring that our, our, uh, our acute uh, care uh, facilities and uh, regional uh, hospitals uh, have uh, the fully uh, functioning uh, staffs uh, available uh, that serve uh, an entire region. Um, but again, as far as the uh, specific um, circumstances that the, the members uh, described, I can't uh, um, articulate at this point uh, whether that could be classified or char characterized as a common uh, uh, practice. The member for Halifax, Shibakto. Uh, thank you. Uh, could I also ask the minister to see if we could make available uh, for us figures about uh, where there are uh, any wards in the province's hospital uh, in the last year that have had to close by reason of nursing shortages? Is that a, a um, metric that the department would be able to get its hands on. The health minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, I, I think I can uh, say that uh, there have been instances of, of closures due to uh, the unavailability of, of nursing uh, staff, um, just as there have been uh, closures due to the unavailability of uh, physicians. Um, I think uh, that uh, information is often uh, provided uh, when the NSHA uh, posts uh, the uh, closure notices uh, for uh, facilities. Uh, I believe they usually uh, indicate uh, the, uh, uh, the reason for that uh, closure, whether it's uh, unavailability of physician or, or nursing uh, staff. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Uh, uh, thank you, and thank you for those uh, those answers and making that information available about uh, nursing positions and and vacancies and staff uh, 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 staff vacancies in general. Uh, so I'd like to uh, shift gears then and, and think some with the minister, if we could, for the time remaining or some of it at least, uh, about the uh, the whole world of mental health. Um, and we do know that in, in our province, um, the number of people who report the prevalence of uh, the, the, the presence of uh, mental health disorders in, over their lifetime is a lot higher than the Canadian average. Um, that this is a very significant part of the, of the landscape um, of health care in our province. And one of the things about it that is particularly difficult is that unlike many, most parts, in fact, of our health care system, uh, in the world of mental health, uh, 
The care that is available in the province varies according to uh, a person's financial means. Um, and what I'm referring to here is the fact that um, we have a, a growing sector in the province of uh, private clinical, psychological, and, and counseling services. Um, uh, normally, the, the rate uh, that people pay is between $100 and $200 an hour. But one of the features of all of these uh, facilities, at least as I have experienced them, is that they are um, available uh, on very short notice, and, uh, and a person can be seen quite quickly. Uh, but this is, this is not, of course, um, the case throughout our province in terms of wait times for mental health in the public system. Um, and so when we try to think about what is the, what is the cause of the problem here, um, one of the things that's often identified by people who talk about this area and study this area is the, the percentage of the global health budget that is devoted to mental health. Um, so here in our province, we, we know it's uh, between 4 and 5 percent. We know that there are other provinces where it is um, much higher than that, in some uh, close to double. We know that the World Health Organization speaks about the need to provide adequate provision uh, for mental health requiring a 10 percent allocation of the global health budget. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask the minister first, uh, in general, uh, what is his sense about what would be the right percentage of the global health budget? What ought we to be moving towards in Nova Scotia that would allow us to get on a footing where we could provide the mental health services that we would want to? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I think, uh, uh, and, and I'll put an, an economist's uh, hat uh, on uh, now, um, based on some some previous uh, experiences I've had with uh, some uh, uh, economists um, in a in a previous role, uh, the the notion of defining a hard um, percentage uh, to um, a service like this. Uh, uh, is sometimes problematic. Uh, the reason being that uh, over time the needs uh, of investment may change. So once you establish uh, what may uh, be uh, uh, an artificial um, target uh, comparator, um, perhaps at some times it should be higher than that and, and at some times uh, it can afford to be lower uh, because of the whole system. And so I think, uh, broadly speaking, uh, my response to the member's question is that uh, what we need to do is uh, continue to focus on uh, advancing improvements um, as we've done in each, uh, each of our, our years uh, over the last several years, continue to increase our investments in mental health uh, services and supports. Uh, we uh, this year have the largest amount of money ever uh, committed uh, in the province uh, to go towards mental health uh, services. Uh, we know there's still more work to, to be done, um, but uh, we will continue these investments. And, and, and I think it's also important to note the, the effects that these investments uh, and the attention of the, the government and our partners in the health authorities, both the NSHA and the IWK, uh, as well as our partners, the education system and uh, in other parts of government, uh, by paying attention and investing in these areas Areas, we've seen improvements. So, for example, uh, in the last four years, the IWK has seen a 75% improvement in wait times um, based upon uh, investments and, and, and new ways of uh, delivering mental health services. Uh, they have a 98% patient satisfaction with their first uh, uh, appointment. That's a 24% improvement uh, since 2016. So, in fact, they're actually being more efficient and more effective simultaneously in the delivery of their mental health uh, care services. Uh, we see uh, Mr. Uh, 
chair that uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, that uh, you know emergency uh, emergency mental health services uh, being seen, uh, which are true uh, emergencies uh, right away throughout uh, our, our, our system, um, but for urgent care. Uh, within the uh, the clinical time, I believe it's 98% uh, of those at the IWK are being seen uh, within the uh, targeted time period, and 95% uh, for for youth uh, being seen in the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority. 98% of uh, urgent care uh, mental health uh, referrals are being seen uh, within the target in 2019. That's up from 85% uh, meeting that uh, clinical uh, threshold the year before. Um, so again. Again, uh, is there more work to do? Yes, there is. Uh, are we making significant improvements? Yes, we are. Uh, and uh, are we going to continue to uh, work uh, to meet the uh, mental health care needs of uh, the citizens of Nova Scotia uh, co collectively uh, through our investments? Uh, again, not just through our partners in the health authorities, but also through education uh, and, uh, and other uh, avenues of government? We most certainly are. Um, that includes investments uh, in, in some of those social determinants areas, helping with housing security, uh, is the uh, investments in uh, municipal affairs uh, through uh, Housing Nova Scotia, investments in uh, pre-primary programs uh, to support uh, those uh, those children uh, uh, across the province. Um, so uh, yes, as a government, we collectively continue to invest. Uh, I won't uh, put a definitive uh, number as a percentage as the, the member has uh, uh, inquired, uh, but I will uh, reaffirm uh, our commitment my commitment uh, to continue to make uh, mental health uh, investments and improvements a, a priority for uh, health care in this province. Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, certainly the, uh, the presence of that commitment in the minister is not what I would, uh, uh, was meaning to question. Uh, and I also don't question that there are uh, areas of significant improvement. Um, I think that uh, there's lots of evidence about that, but I think we also cannot uh, uh, fail to accept, uh, we have to face the fact that uh, over the last seven years, the numbers of people in our province with perceived fair or poor mental health, uh, that these have increased uh, as I, uh, presented the minister with the data about this yesterday. Uh, so in light of this, I, I want to ask the minister if he will outline uh, the specific programming costs that are related to um, mental health spending in this budget and what there is uh, newly, uh, with new initiatives, uh, addressing this sharp problem. of health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, first off, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, one of the most significant uh, things we're doing uh, for mental health and addiction services uh, in the province is continuing the, 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 the very good work and continuing those investments uh, that we've been making over the last number of years into uh, new program uh, areas and, and, and program services. And uh, those continued uh, investments, uh, in fact, uh, will continue to uh, provide uh, improvements. Uh, some of those examples, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, include uh, programs like the Adolescent Outreach Model that's been expanded to the northern and western zones, modeled off of the Caper Base model in, in Cape Breton. Uh, I believe that's now in over uh, in, a, in, in a, about 100 schools across the province uh, where youth have access uh, to these services. Those uh, youth then, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, are able to, uh, if they're having uh, mental health uh, issues, uh, uh, to be identified uh, earlier. We know that uh, early identification uh, does uh, result in the uh, greatest uh, positive uh, health outcomes uh, over uh, the uh, course of one's life. Uh, we also know, Mr. Chair, that the um, 
those uh, who experience mental health challenges, particularly chronic ones, are often uh, first manifested in their youth, in their adolescence. Um, so by, by focusing those uh, investments, uh, uh, as well as the uh, Youth Health Centre uh, program uh, that uh, was recommended by Dr. Stan Kucher, uh, the evaluation of those uh, investments is uh, ongoing to help uh, inform uh, the best practices to be rolled out in other community uh, schools and, and health centres. Um, we uh, continue to uh, invest and, and uh, work with e-health innovation in the mental health space uh, as well as in uh, other uh, areas of our healthcare system when it comes to uh, technology to support the delivery of care. Uh, we uh, continue, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to uh, recruit uh, um, uh, professionals. Uh, we know that uh, within the master agreement, uh, the compensation uh, for psychiatry uh, would have uh, increased uh, as well uh, to help uh, with that support. Uh, I think that uh, builds on some changes we made uh, a couple of years ago in, in particularly regions that have high demand, uh, that is, or high vacancies for psychiatrists um, to uh, help uh, support the recruitment uh, but we're also seeing again things that don't cost money uh uh, but uh, again, is the advantage of having a single health authority. Uh, there have been efforts uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, to um, really rally the uh, clinical expertise uh, that uh, may be uh, in areas of the province, uh, like the central zone, uh, to support uh, those uh, in other communities uh, that may not have the uh, existence of the uh, higher level um, uh, medical professionals available to provide those supports. So through that rallying, it's not necessarily a need for, for more investment, but it is a change in the way that people uh, perform their practices and, and leveraging technology like telemedicine to provide those consults remotely uh, from areas that do have the expertise uh, into communities that may not have them. Uh, so this, to, this type of work is ongoing as well. The member for Halifax, Shabakto. Th thank you. Then following on that, could the minister please uh, uh, outline uh, what mental health programming is newly being supported by increases in mental health funding uh, for the coming year in this budget? Health Minister. So some some examples, uh, I guess, uh, include um, uh, community-based uh, mental health uh, services uh, expansions, um, hiring additional uh, clinicians uh, in the community through our, our partner organizations. Uh, I believe we have uh, three point about three point two. Uh, million uh, dollars there. Um, I guess uh, new, I guess, is uh, 2.7, another half a million uh, to continue uh, the work of uh, some clinicians that uh, were recently hired. Um, expanding uh, urgent uh, access to urgent services, uh, investment of uh, 1.5 um, million, uh, another $900,000 investment towards uh, virtual care services options. Um, so that's uh, an example of some of the uh, larger uh, dollar amount uh, contributions. So uh, most significantly uh, going towards uh, uh, additional clinicians to support, uh, but they're in community spaces. So it's not uh, necessarily new programs specifically, uh, but rather uh, continuing our investments in those programs we have to ensure uh, that we uh, expand the uh, care and, and support options uh, that are available. Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the couple of minutes that are left, uh, that we might uh, think together about this, uh, I'd like to ask the minister to speak to the question of wait times uh, to be seen in mental health and and the regional variation in them. I'm sure that the 
the minister is well acquainted with the numbers, how, uh, how really um, stark and unacceptable the, the range is that in some parts of the province a person can be seen really within a couple of weeks, but that there are very significant parts of the province where it's, uh, it's measured in months and some parts of the province where it's measured in a lot of months before uh, you can be seen. Uh, can the minister provide his sense of why there is such um, dramatic inequality in mental health wait times in the province? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, that there are merit of, of factors uh, at play, as there would be uh, with uh, many uh, regional variances uh, in any uh, number of uh, um, areas one uh, wishes to assess, um, and, and not just in health, uh, in, in other uh, aspects, whether economic or, or otherwise. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, uh, one contributing factor uh, would relate to uh, demand. Um, uh, so when you look at demand, what are the underlining factors that uh, result in an increased demand or need for mental health services uh, within uh, regions? Um, uh, we've talked about some of those socioeconomic uh, conditions, uh, certainly uh, for acute, very acute uh, mental health conditions, there are, uh, there are genuinely uh, genetic factors uh, at play. Uh, so uh, there are uh, uh, variables like that that uh, feed on the demand side. Uh, when it uh, relates then to the uh, supply of services side, uh, part of that uh, relates to uh, you know, uh, historical variances in uh, where and how um, our health authorities uh, would invest in, in providing uh, services. Uh, this is uh, part of the uh, work that's been undertaken uh, at the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, over the last number of years to standardize the uh, care path and, and delivery of uh, mental health services uh, throughout uh, the uh, province. Um, so it, it did take some time uh, to complete the um, uh, formal structuring of the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority, then to uh, gather up the information about the merit of practices that were taking place. Time uh, has expired for the New Democratic Party. We are now going on to the Progressive Conservative Party for one hour. We'll start with the member from Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wondering if uh, the minister and his guests would like to, uh, a quick health break. Let's continue on. Very Member good. for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, during my last uh, line of questioning, I, I expressed my appreciation to the Minister of his knowledge on the various issues that are facing uh, paramedics uh, across our province. But although I'm not an artist, I want to try to paint a picture um, of the current situation. Um, you know, I, like I said before, paramedics or ambulance drivers back in the day, worked in funeral homes, delivered uh, a ride to the hospital, uh, delivering diesel therapy like I've heard it re referred to uh, multiple times. But that has since changed uh, to one of the leading scopes of practice uh, in North America. Uh, you know, gone are the days of, of ambulance drivers. Paramedics are not technicians, they're clinicians with, who are highly skilled uh, individuals that are feeling the pinch of our healthcare crisis in our province. And I understand and appreciate that our healthcare system is, is complex and, and it takes time to implement changes and it, time, it takes time to, to see those changes reflected in, in uh, hopefully positive effects. But uh, Mr. Chair, the increased call volume, which I've referred to previously, you know, it's doubled at least in, in the last 10 years with a very slight increase in resources. And if the minister can, uh, could provide, um, I guess, any evidence contrary to that. But you know, we've seen uh, increased number of emergency call volume, increased number of transfer call volume. That uh, leads to my point maybe to, uh, for the department to examine the uh, uh, separation in emergency services and, and transfer services. And all this increased demand on, on the system has caused 
that uh, the minister had to react and implement these offload guidelines, which um, I'll, I'll speak to a little bit after. But you know, the increased demand results in a decreased ambulance availability, which uh, there causes increased response times. S ambulances spread thin throughout the throughout the province. Uh, you know, paramedics are thus um, missing breaks, missing lunches, uh, being tied up in, in hallways, and, and they don't, they didn't go to school to uh, do hallway medicine. They deserve, they went to school to be in the ditches and in, and in homes, uh, delivering the, the care that they are, are granted through their scope of practice, which is, um, you know, anything from advanced airway management to seizure control to or management, uh, advanced cardiac life support from trauma to obstetrics. So all with that, um, that overburdened system impacting their mental health and well-being, like I've mentioned. Uh, and then on top of that, um, being faced, unfortunately, like I mentioned, with more um, occurrences of physical and, and verbal assaults and abuse. So this is a matter of not only public safety, but also a matter of safety for our frontline workers. So going to the availability of ambulances, um, which I've heard that ambulances have been spread out, like I mentioned, one in Yarmouth, one in Blockhouse, one in, in HRM. Uh, what confidence does the minister have in the system that uh, our, the ambulance system could properly respond to a mass casualty incident? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, and uh, I think as uh, the member uh, mentioned um, here, and I think it was the, the last uh, part of uh, our previous uh, conversation inquiring about um, the notion of um, workplace uh, verbal and, and, and other uh, assaults uh, or, or actions uh, taken. I just want to go on the record being very clear, uh, as I did uh, with the member from the NDP uh, caucus, uh, raising questions uh, similar vein as it related to other health professionals like nurses. Uh, and I want to be absolutely clear for the member, Mr. Chair, that uh, uh, no one uh, working in the province uh, should be subjected uh, to uh, abusive uh, situations, uh, least of all uh, those uh, who are working in, uh, in, in a capacity to uh, help uh, support uh, individuals. And we know that uh, in some instances, uh, these uh, uh, instances are, are not necessarily by the patient. They could be others uh, around the patient in a very highly uh, stressful uh, situation. Uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, um, but do not uh, in any way uh, condone uh, that uh, environment. Um, we know that uh, there are programs uh, throughout uh, the EHS uh, system uh, to provide uh, peer support networks uh, to, to help uh, each other uh, uh, within and, and, and support that, uh, those, those challenges. Uh, within uh, EHS, there's also a, a program called uh, R2MR, the Road to Mental Recovery. Uh, that's the same program used by the Department of National Defense uh, that uh, has been rolled out uh, to support our, our emergency of responders, again, back to uh, the mental health uh, challenges of, of being in emergency uh, situations. Uh, to uh, the specific question uh, brought up in, in this uh, uh, last question about a mass casualty. Uh, the the system is, is designed uh, to uh, respond to uh, the emergency situation. Um, the system will respond to uh, the uh, situation that's presented to it. If there's a mass uh, casualty, uh, how the system would respond in that instance uh, would uh, be um, through, uh, through, through the system and the resources uh, within the system uh, to respond. Uh, in order to uh, prepare for such a, a situation, uh, we do have uh, annual uh, mass casualty uh, exercises. We know that uh, mass casualty uh, scenarios are not uh, something that's uh, just restricted to uh, our emergency responders in EHS to respond to, but in fact is a, uh, a pressure drawn upon uh, our entire health system. Um, so uh, mass casualty exercises actually do uh, draw a, a collaborative, uh, integrated um, exercise to uh, test the protocols and systems that are in place. So uh, 
again, uh, I would have confidence again that uh, we have the systems and uh, the protocols uh, to respond in a mass uh, casualty uh, situation. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, minister stated that the system will respond, is designed to respond, and it will respond. But if it responds as it currently stands um, at present and as exists with the system demands, I'm very afraid that lives are going to be lost. Uh, there will be patient safety, Nova Scotian safety uh, at risk. So I just want the minister and his department to be cognizant of that. Uh, going back to the assault um, aspect of my my little my brief introduction there, um, and I alluded to it in my last line of comments. Uh, does the minister believe that uh, the assaults uh, and the verbal, physical assaults and abuse that uh, paramedics are facing uh, should there be any legislation to uh, uh, handle these occurrences similar to? Uh, uh, law enforcement. The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar uh, with uh, legislation uh, respecting uh, law enforcement uh, officers, so I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, really able to comment on, on, on something uh, comparable uh, or not. Um, do I uh, believe that uh, um, Paramedics and others should uh, be free uh, of, from from that kind of scenario. Uh, I, I would uh, agree with that. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And what I'm referring to is that um, if you assault a police officer, it's a different charge than if you assault uh, uh, just a, a public citizen. Um, I guess we'll change past a little bit and we'll refocus, but. Uh, our caucus has been strong advocates, and including myself, about uh, public access AEDs in our communities. Uh, thus, that we've introduced legislation uh, to have them in our schools, mandatory in our schools, uh, and myself having uh, introduced legislation to amend the Building Code Act uh, to make them uh, mandatory in, in particular buildings. So, um, I guess, should, can the minister uh, provide a response to the House uh, regarding? Um, current initiatives for AD placement in our communities. I, I am very well aware and well versed with the uh, EHS registry, uh, AED registry because I sat on that committee previously. But uh, is this department looking to either A, adopt one of our um, uh, piece of legislation or, or to introduce one of their own to make uh, public access AEDs uh, more readily available and legislated in Nova Scotia? The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I think um, on, a, on a, a slight technicality, the department uh, would uh, have no role uh, in uh, approving uh, a piece of legislation on, on the floor of uh, this uh, legislature. Uh, so that uh, I think I would defer as to uh, the passage uh, or uh, debate of any pieces of legislation to uh, the 51 members uh, here as opposed to uh, the department. Um, uh, so, uh, as far as uh, programs and initiatives, uh, I believe, uh, as, as the member uh, mentioned, uh, very aware of the work with EHS to uh, map and, and make available uh, and integrate. Uh, so that work is uh, ongoing. Consider. Uh, ongoing and uh, that uh, I think uh, helps promote uh, not just uh, the um, uh, good value of having the, the map available to uh, direct people but also is uh, a good value because uh, through that uh, initiative they've actually uh, promoted AEDs as a, a general concept. I believe there's also uh, programs in place to support uh, some community uh, uh, locations uh, with uh, refurbished AEDs uh, as well uh, that are made available um, to uh, some some facilities, uh, including fire halls, um, that uh, are uh, already in place uh, through uh, the EHS uh, system. Um, so uh, again, there are some initiatives already out there to help uh, expand uh, the availability of AEDs, uh, but also uh, I think most importantly is supporting uh, the uh, tracking and uh, notifications of uh, where uh, AEDs are, are already available. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, go, going back to preparedness and mass casualty incidents, I had a, a question that I want to ask regarding uh, coronavirus and, and our province's preparation uh, throughout the healthcare system. Um, so I guess this question could be, uh, uh, could be widespread throughout uh, all professions. Um, How is the province preparing um, for, uh, I don't know, rather, I know that the minister has indicated in the House previously that the province is looking at measures of preparation for the coronavirus uh, arriving on our doorsteps. However, uh, what pre preparations uh, for frontline staff are, are being taken, such as, you know, if we are hit with coronavirus and we have 20% uh, of frontline uh, healthcare workers that are unable to go to work because they're now quarantined, uh, how is the pr province going to mitigate that solution when it presents itself? The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I thank uh, the member uh, for uh, the question. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, protocols and the approach uh, the public health, uh, led by our, our public health office, uh, are following those uh, standards and protocols that have been designed uh, and enhanced uh, over time uh, from past uh, uh, situations like with H1N1 and SARS um, and, uh, and informed by what they know about uh, the current uh, virus, uh, COVID-19, uh, that is expanding uh, around the globe. Uh, I think it's important uh, to remind uh, people again, although the risk uh, remains uh, low, we haven't had any cases here in Nova Scotia and only a, a handful uh, for, uh, for testing. But uh, the, uh, the reality that we uh, have seen, uh, we put out, uh, actually uh, the public health officer put out a, a notice earlier today, I'm not sure if the member uh, saw it, uh, but it is reflective of the evolving situation on a global scale, um, just advising that we are approaching that point uh, where um, containment, as we're seeing, uh, to the original uh, origin uh, uh, province, uh, country uh, is uh, now expanded uh, to other countries uh, as it expands further. It, um, public health officials uh, internationally are monitoring to see if it reaches pandemic. Again, pandemic levels simply meaning that it is spreading uh, across the province. It doesn't change the acuity of the uh, virus uh, infection, but just the uh, scope and the spread uh, of it. Um, so uh, we are recognizing that as it uh, continues to spread uh, across the globe, uh, the probability of seeing a case in Nova Scotia does also go up. Uh, those protocols for our frontline uh, healthcare workers uh, that are uh, currently in place uh, were triggered again by public health planning so as it relates to uh, quarantines, uh, again, uh, within our health environments uh, that, uh, again, have protocols in place for uh, people who have the acute uh, symptoms of the condition um, to uh, be uh, managed. Again, those are clinical uh, aspects. Uh, as it relates to, uh, I guess, uh, what the member has described, a worst case scenario uh, occurring, uh, again, the uh, work uh, within the public health uh, system uh, to uh, prepare for such uh, um, a scenario, uh, as unlikely as it may be, is uh, again uh, part of their planning uh, process. Uh, how we execute and the steps that we uh, prepare for that, uh, really we move through the steps of the preparedness uh, as information evolves and becomes more relevant. We're not at that uh, stage of, of uh, preparation uh, yet, um, but we are at the stage of, uh, again, uh, uh, looking at evaluating, making sure uh, you know, our contingencies in place for equipment uh, requirements and, and needs, uh, um, having discussions about um, you know, if uh, high volume uh, instances uh, required uh, dedicated space uh, outside of hospital environments or what have you, those discussions are, are ongoing. So again, uh, planning for and preparing for worst case scenarios uh, really picks up on as the the, the member uh, the member's previous line of question about mass uh, casualty or mass you, you, you always uh, prepare for the worst um, but uh, and, and and then don't uh, you know uh, in, in um, you prepare for the worst and, and uh, hope for the best uh, at this stage again we are uh, working our way through those uh, prepare those levels of preparation member for Argyle Barrington uh, thank you mr. chair um, I want to go back to to offload guidelines, and um, you know, in it was, I believe, in March of 2019 that there was uh, five hospitals announced 
uh, taking part in these new offload guidelines, being the Halifax Infirmary, Dartmouth General, Sydney, Truro, and Kenville hospitals. Um, so I want to know, can the Minister confirm that all five of those hospitals are still taking part in the offload guideline process? The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe we had, uh, uh, although initially it might have been uh, five as, as work uh, proceeded, uh, the uh, Health Authority uh, went at uh, six, I believe Valley Regional, Cape Breton Regional, uh, Colchester Regional, Cobequid, uh, Dartmouth General and the Halifax uh, Infirmary. Um, so uh, again, as they, they did more work, uh, as I said earlier, the intention here uh, was to uh, focus on those uh, sites that have the uh, greatest uh, impact uh, of, of delays in the transfer of patients uh, into the hospital. Uh, that That is the, the offload time that we're referring to. Um, so uh, as they uh, continue to uh, be uh, outside of the norm for or expectation for offloads uh, that they would uh, continue to work uh, to uh, improve uh, the situation at those uh, sites and as I uh, previously mentioned uh, we did see uh, a, a reduction in uh, offload time uh, improvement uh, here in the in the um, central zone uh, which I think represents three of those uh, six uh, sites uh, from 90 minutes down to 59 minutes member for Argyle Barrington so, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If memory serves me correctly, from our last, uh, my last line of questioning, that uh, data supporting the the um, improvements in offload times was reflected from September uh, 2019. So, I guess here we are, end of uh, February. Um, so, I'm just wondering if the uh, Minister of Health could um, provide at a later date uh, the most recent. Um, data on all the hospitals that uh, are still taking part in the offload guidelines. Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I believe uh, the data was uh, from December to December, so December 18 to December of 19. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and again, I, I've heard from, from frontline workers, those are, that are working on the front lines, that uh, the guide that there is some deviation from the data that the uh, minister has at, at his disposal. So I'm just wondering what may be the cause for for that uh, for that deviation. Uh, that's not reflective to um, the accuracy, possibly. Um, on the same topic of offload guidelines, um, guidelines are guidelines. You know they can be bent and broken. Um, what are the repercussions for not respecting those guidelines, and who's responsible? Um, at the hospital if uh, we're not meeting these targets. Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, to uh, the first part of the question about uh, what might uh, explain variances, I, uh, I don't uh, have uh, the variances that the, the member's uh, referring to, um, so I, it'd be hard to, uh, to speak uh, to them. Um, with uh, respect to uh, the uh, work, again, uh, we know that uh, the system uh, was not uh, operating efficiently uh, when we came into office. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, even in, in talking to frontline uh, uh, paramedics and uh, their uh, union representatives, uh, that this is a, a, a challenge that was, uh, you know, 15 years in the in the making. That it was just continuously uh, growing as a challenge. Uh, that. Uh, 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 so recognizing that uh, again, this question of, of, of reaching uh, the, uh, the the guideline uh, right now, uh, particularly in those sites uh, most uh, acutely impacted, uh, the uh, the measurement and focus is on improvement, uh, on driving the uh, offload time uh, improvements uh, at those sites, uh, so that we get uh, the results uh, that we're looking for. Again, uh, it's not uh, something that's uh, an immediate. Uh, this has been less than a year in uh, in. Uh, effort of work uh, and again I think uh, we've seen some Im improvements and uh, uh, but at the same time recognize there's still a, a lot of work and improvements uh, that can uh, be made uh, further and that's why we invested that four million dollars in patient flow uh, 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 the patient flow uh, space uh, mr. chair the member for Argyle Barrington uh, thank you mr. chair uh, you know it's 
since the conception of, of EHS system, which I, I, I praise the, that doesn't matter if you're in my constituency in the southern part of the province or if you're in, in Meat Cove, uh, you call an ambulance and whenever it shows up, uh, you will be giving, uh, getting the same level of care. Um, but the problems that are present, present today, the solution exists much more than just offload guidelines. So I just want to be uh, very clear on that point. And you know, it's nice to wait and see that the offload guidelines see their, their effect. But uh, we're at a point where we need to be implementing much more, uh, much more changes. Um, I'd like to speak about the um, briefly about uh, some of the programs that are uh, currently uh, offered through the EHS system, such as the community paramedicine, uh, the extended care paramedic program. Uh, so the community paramedicine program in, in Cape Breton. Um, so uh, we can focus on that one a bit, and then we can uh, move on. The health minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if there's a, a specific uh, question about uh, the programs. I'll just speak uh, broadly about it uh, for uh, our members uh, here. Uh, the community uh, paramedicine uh, program is something that uh, was uh, born out of the uh, Cape Breton Redevelopment uh, Project uh, work uh, that uh, identified the uh, opportunity to uh, leverage, as the member has uh, rightly uh, highlighted, uh, the uh, uh, scope and the uh, uh, skill set of uh, our paramedics are uh, very, uh, uh, very different, uh, far more evolved as uh, healthcare professionals uh, than uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, I know 20, 30 years ago probably uh, predate uh, the member opposite, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But the, uh, the reality is that uh, this program is designed to uh, help uh, with uh, discharge of uh, patients uh, from the hospital uh, so they can be supported in their home uh, earlier. So we're earlier discharge, uh, but they may require a little bit of uh, uh, support that falls within the scope of the, the paramedics uh, to, to do that. Um, so that they would be on shift uh, to respond to those community-based calls, do the follow-up. Um, this is, uh, you know, some, some aspects uh, uh, would be like the uh, extended uh, care paramedic uh, program where they could uh, evaluate uh, the home environment uh, for, um, you know, in some cases, uh, frequent users of the system uh, that uh, in those cases uh, may be a, a bit older, uh, may have trips and, and falls, uh, resulting in, in the frequent uh, or, or multiple calls. Um, and uh, so they can evaluate the home environment uh, for hazards uh, uh, that might be easily addressed. Uh, they can uh, you know, take a quick look uh, to support the, uh, uh, w what the medication situation uh, looks like and, and so on, um, to then uh, engage uh, with the health system to try to address uh, if there are root issues that uh, other health providers wouldn't be aware of. Because the paramedics are the health care providers who show up in the home uh, and, and see that environment. And, and, and the physician may not necessarily have have the information the paramedics able to provide and, and bring back. Um, and again, it does go to show ha how uh, really uh, uh, the future of our healthcare system, uh, which we've started uh, already here in Nova Scotia, is about uh, integration. It is about uh, respecting the um, uh, scope of practice and the capacity of our uh, healthcare workers. And it is about them coming together collaboratively um, and, and, and recognizing it's not about uh, turf wars, about who, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, whose uh, responsibility a patient is, in fact, uh, uh, all of the uh, health care providers and partners uh, have a responsibility for the care of Nova Scotians and it's about coming together and providing that care. Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so looking at the, um, at the current uh, model that's implemented in, in uh, Cape Breton for the community paramedicine, um, has the department uh, looked at any cost uh, that would be required or amount of money that would be required to expand this program to other regions um, in the province. The Health Minister. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, not uh, in this uh, year's budget, uh, but certainly uh, because the, the program uh, really only launched uh, about a year ago. Um, so we wanted to run the program, monitor uh, the uh, effectiveness of it, uh, identify um, and, and tweak uh, where we see, you know, if you see uh, some challenges, uh, important part of the program. It, uh, it really uh, works and requires some uh, cultural change within the hospital environment as well. Um, the paramedics are there, ready, eager uh, to provide the services, but uh, uh, we do need the the, uh, the the nurses and the doctors within the hospital to uh, participate and refer into the program. Um, so we continue to engage and work there. But what way the education and and, and sharing the information to allow them to know that this is a new pathway uh, for them within the system. Uh, so we want to make sure we figure out how it's uh, and, and optimize the program uh, before we start expanding it out. Because uh, if we uh, roll it out uh, before all the kinks are, are rolled out uh, or ironed out, I should say. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, then we roll out an inefficient uh, program. We want to get the best uh, program possible and then uh, roll it out and expand uh, for others. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, regarding the extended care uh, paramedic program, I've never uh, worked in the central region, um, but my understanding is that that program uh, permits a paramedic to travel solo and uh, frequent uh, nursing homes that um, where there's a potential patient that requires transfer uh, or transportation rather to a hospital that they'll coordinate uh, at a better time that's can more convenient for the system. So um, has that program itself been uh, uh, investigated to or examined uh, to be uh, ex uh, implemented in other parts of the province? The health minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and, and yes, uh, that's uh, roughly where the extended uh, care program, uh, as it relates to our, our long-term care facilities, uh, would uh, see uh, a paramedic uh, attend to uh, a, a patient uh, within uh, or resident to, who would become a patient in a long-term care facility to do an assessment. They have clinical uh, oversight that they can call back into uh, to uh, help uh, with the, the assessments uh, to see whether they're, they're, they need immediate uh, transport or not. Um, that uh, is, is the approach. I think uh, as uh, we uh, do our work uh, both within uh, patient flow but also in our continuing care space, uh, we continue to uh, look at and evaluate uh, the best programs uh, and uh, processes. Uh, so again, in this budget we don't have exp explicit uh, expansions, but as part of the overarching uh, work in our continuing care branch as well as uh, patient flow, uh, we see uh, opportunity uh, uh, for programs and uh, initial exactly like this uh, to help uh, address some of those pressure points uh, in critical areas again in both in the acute uh, system the emergency system uh, and in our continuing care long-term care uh, segment the member for Argyle Barrington thank you mr. chair uh, quick question regarding uh, uh, general revenue uh, for the department pertaining to EHS. Uh, in 2019-20, it was estimated that uh, there would be a general revenue of uh, $1.9 million, and the forecast amount for this fiscal year is uh, $2.2 million, so $200,000 more, and then the estimate for the upcoming fiscal year is, is the same as the forecast for this year. So what's uh, indicative of that, uh, that figure there, please? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just for expediency, uh, can, can you refer to the page if you have it uh, there, just so I can cross-reference the line? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I think uh, that uh, would be recovery uh, for, uh, I believe, for life flight uh, services uh, predominantly uh, that uh, other uh, jurisdictions uh, uh, leverage uh, our services uh, for uh, within the region. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
A uh, question for the minister and his department. Uh, so where would the fee recovery for the ambulance, so the $146 for uh, Nova Scotians and the other fees through uh, workers' comp and NBCs and out of province and out of country, where would that uh, fall into the revenue, please? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, that uh, fee, I believe, uh, along with some, some other uh, fees and, and uh, charges, uh, shows up in the first line item, other fees and charges. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the topic of fees, uh, with the current revenue and the current expenses of the department pertaining to EHS, uh, does the department and uh, does the minister and his department uh, foresee any changes to the current fee um, fee structure for EHS? The Honourable Minister of Health. And uh, at uh, this point uh, of budgeting uh, for uh, fiscal year 2021, uh, uh, we're uh, basing our uh, forecast, uh, or our, sorry, I should say our estimate for 2021 uh, based upon uh, the past performance uh, of the system. Again, uh, the uh, amounts uh, do vary. Uh, they vary based upon a number of variables, uh, such as uh, the volume. Uh, we see it uh, change based upon uh, recoveries. Uh, we do each year when public accounts uh, uh, comes to be in the summer have uh, adjustments, Mr. Chair, to uh, write off. Again, there are programs for those who can't afford uh, that, uh, that uh, fees uh, were waived. So uh, again, uh, we, we follow uh, a protocol that seems to have been working uh, well uh, within uh, our province uh, for the last uh, number of years. Um, so uh, there's no forecasted uh, changes to the actual uh, fee program. Um, but again, the dollar amounts may vary uh, from budget to uh, estimate at the end of the year. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is going to go back to uh, one of my interview questions when I was hired uh, by the operating company as a paramedic, and it has to do with response time. So in our province, if you live in an uh, urban uh, area, the response time is 9 minutes and 59 seconds or less. If you're a rural area, it's uh, 1959 or less. And if you're super rural, which is... Uh, like what happens around in Nova Scotia, it's 29 minutes or uh, 29 minutes and 59 seconds or less, and that's 90% of the time. So I'd like to know if the minister has uh, data that indicates are we making the mark for for that, uh, and how often are we deviating from those response times uh, when responding to calls for Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have uh, that uh, information uh, at that uh, level of detail uh, here with us, uh, but uh, the last time uh, I believe uh, his uh, predecessor inquired, uh, I did uh, retrieve uh, the reports and, and report back that uh, we were uh, broadly meeting uh, those uh, standards uh, uh, within uh, the system. Um, but again, I just don't have uh, the reports and that uh, detailed reports uh, with me. The member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, ministers for uh, the minister for his answer. Just wondering if at a later date he could provide such information and possibly also uh, include the uh, most recent annual report for EHS. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll uh, endeavour to uh, track uh, the information down. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've mentioned re uh, staffing challenges in our in our province, and we've talked at length about uh, doctor uh, recruitment and retention, and uh, the thousands of Nova Scotians still without a without a family practitioner, and uh, you know the the uncertainty or the end. Uh, and uh, how it's not clear if Nova Scotians have a family practitioner or if, or if they have a family physician or if they have a, a nurse practitioner when they uh, come off the uh, 811 list. But uh, I want to speak.
speak specifically about the staffing challenges uh, facing paramedics and um, the recruitment initiatives uh, by by this government. Uh, you know, we've spoken, or it's been said on said on this uh, on the floor of this legislature that there's incentive programs for other professions. Um, so, just wondering if the minister could uh, speak regarding the current need of primary care paramedics, advanced care paramedics, and how the government's supporting uh, the, its their recruitment. The honourable minister of health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, at, at this point, uh, uh, the uh, employer uh, would uh, perform the uh, hiring of, of paramedics. Uh, not familiar with what um, incentives or hiring incentives they may have uh, within uh, uh, their system. Um, they're a contracted uh, service provider uh, that would uh, manage uh, those programs a little differently than a, a government-created uh, service provider that uh, is a consolidated uh, government entity like the Nova Scotia Health Authorities, where we have uh, significantly more um, insight uh, and uh, support. In fact, uh, physicians, uh, for example, um, some of those incentives actually do rest with the department, and we uh, roll them out in partnership uh, with uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority that's uh, responsible for for uh, the delivery of the recruitment and, and uh, retention. So again, that's uh, something uh, managed, managed and administered more with the, uh, the, the service provider, EMCI. The member for Argyle, Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been uh, brought to my attention a couple times about uh, the Cobbequid Hospital and how it closes, it closes at night. And then the, uh, the transfer volume uh, exiting that uh, hospital being sent to uh, hospital uh, in Halifax. So uh, I guess is uh, the department looking at how efficient that, uh, that current structure is working for the system and how that could be improved because uh, sometimes by the time a patient uh, exits that hospital uh, and makes it to the QE2, it's, uh, they wait hours on end uh, in a hallway before actually ending up back at uh, Cobbequid. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, that uh, scenario was something that uh, I, I can recall uh, having come up in some broad discussions um, about uh, whether or not uh, restructuring, um, and it was broad discussions as it would be with uh, within the scope of the Nova Scotia Health Authority and, and the work they do around uh, patient flow and, and responding to offload times. Uh, at this point, I haven't uh, seen uh, any or heard anything definitive of uh, any uh, forthcoming changes, um, but I, I can confirm the notion or the concept has been floated and, and, and discussed. Um, that's not to say that it will or will not uh, be pursued. Uh, again, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of initiatives uh, in this space uh, to try to improve uh, the uh, performance of uh, our hospital systems to support our, our ambulance offloads. Uh, as was noted uh, earlier, I, I think uh, I don't think Cobequid was on the original uh, list uh, of direction, but uh, through the work of the uh, groups uh, focused on uh, improving offload times, Mr. Chair, uh, they did recognize that Cobequid was an important uh, participant in the system. Um, so I think that's where some of those discussions were, but if not, uh, seen or, or, or received anything formal about uh, such changes uh, coming forward at this time. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, we're my constituents and uh, neighboring MLA from Queen Shelburne are, uh, know too well the effects of uh, ER closures, uh, notably at uh, Roseway uh, Hospital in Shelburne. And there's, of course, there's numerous ones across the province. and. Uh, Know, some so frequent that they're part of the uh, weather report on uh, various radio stations. So uh, I'm just wondering if the minister and his staff are, are having a, keeping a close eye on the impacts that uh, these extended ER closures and prolonged ER closures are having uh, an impact directly on the EHS system. The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, the uh, the work uh, throughout uh, the health authority to uh, manage their uh, hospital uh, infrastructure to uh, provide uh, the care uh, to uh, residents um, throughout the province. Uh, we work with them to uh, minimize those impacts, uh, as we've uh, talked extensively about. I won't go into to all the details again, uh, but we've st spoken uh, extensively about uh, our investments and supports for recruitment and retention of the healthcare professionals, uh, which are ultimately at that uh, root cause uh, challenge for keeping uh, facilities, uh, particularly emergency departments, open uh, in uh, some of our, our communities. Uh, with uh, respect to uh, the uh, integration, the connection uh, between facilities and uh, uh, the EHS uh, system, uh, that uh, interface uh, between EHS and uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, our partners uh, there and at the IWK, um, obviously as part of their operational uh, ongoing work uh, that they do. Um, again, that's uh, the type of thing and, and relationship that allowed uh, a focused effort on uh, uh, making changes within the hospital system to help improve the transfer of patients from paramedics into the hospital system around offload times. Uh, so uh, again, broadly speaking within the system, these are two partners providing critical services to the uh, care and the emergency uh, services uh, for patients. Um, so they uh, would continue to work together uh, to uh, address uh, um, any of the concerns or challenges that come up. Uh, and I would expect uh, both parties uh, to maintain uh, open dialogue should one see uh, challenges from the other that they might be able to collaborate and, and work with. And uh, again, if, uh, if they ever have uh, challenges or issues, uh, we're here as a department to help facilitate uh, if necessary. But uh, I do see, the uh, again, the success uh, within uh, the... Um, you know, first year of the offload uh, changes uh, shows that they do have uh, 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 the capacity to have effective uh, engagement to uh, improve and, and uh, first recognize and then improve uh, um, the situation for our paramedics. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the minister for his response. It's a scary reality for for paramedics across this province, and particularly in uh, in rural Nova Scotia that. Uh, not only are they spread thin through uh, through the uh, areas, but then have to uh, keep in consideration when and when are not hospitals closed. So um, I just want to make sure that the minister and his staff are cognizant of, of that impact uh, for uh, paramedics and the, and the care that they're delivering to uh, to Nova Scotians, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, paramedics, like I said, have a, a highly uh, they're highly skilled with an advanced skill set. Uh, but uh, you know their 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 interventions are limited, and obviously they want to uh, transport to definitive care, and that the increase in uh, in transfer time or transport time to that definitive care can uh, unfortunately have a negative impact on uh, on for Nova Scotians. Um, you know. The department has three options when investigating or, or examining the future of, uh, of EHS. It's either one, the status quo, and we cannot afford this. Um, we have the increased demand, which I've gone over uh, a couple times uh, this afternoon. Uh, the, the challenges with an aging population and, uh, and ER closures, for example. But we also have option B, which is expand the system. So like I've mentioned before, more trucks, more staff, uh, and more shifts. Now, it's easy to get somebody, to, uh, get a company to build ambulances, but it's difficult to, to recruit them, uh, recruit the staff, rather. And the third option is, is a reduction in services, and I know that's certainly not something that the, the minister want to, to implement, or at least hope not to implement, and that's not what my constituents want or deserve, and neither do, uh, the, do the paramedics, and so I don't think we should be moving, moving backwards. Um, with that being said, uh, I just want to ask a couple questions, uh, again, about the budgetary lines for, the, for this year. Um, We've seen a $7.54 million reduction in ambulance services and a very slight increases of 
for ground ambulance operations, an increase of 283,000 for medically, uh, medical quality control, and an increase of 851 million uh, for provincial programs. So, um, noting that we were on pretty much uh, slightly over budget for uh, the ambulance uh, services by a, a couple hundred thousand, uh, under budget for ground ambulance operations, um, on par with uh, medical quality control uh, budget and over budget on provincial programs. I guess maybe line by line we can start exploring. So on par with ground ambulance operations, why the significant decrease of $7.549 million for that budgetary line? The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank uh, the member for the question. I think uh, we talked about uh, this uh, line uh, previously that uh, uh, this uh, relates to uh, the contracted services uh, with. Uh, that uh, that uh, amount is uh, again uh, reflective of. Uh, the operational uh, services uh, provided by our paramedics uh, on the front line and uh, I can assure uh, the member that uh, that uh, fund uh, will continue to respond 100% uh, to them. Uh, there are other uh, aspects uh, within the contract uh, uh, that uh, included some um, uh, funds uh, for uh, strategic uh, initiatives and, and, and others. I believe uh, there uh, continued to be a bit of a balance uh, in that account uh, that uh, allows us to continue to do some innovative uh, work uh, without needing to uh, put the additional funds in uh, this fiscal year while we uh, continue our negotiations uh, with the uh, service provider. Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That $7.549 million uh, cut to what the minister is saying is operational services, that's nearly 9.5% um, of, uh, of that budget line. I, 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 I fear that that's going to have a reduction in service and impact for frontline workers and most importantly a negative impact for Nova Scotians. So uh, I'd just like to see uh, if the minister can provide some clarification uh, to that line and that, that uh, reduction. Minister of Health. Uh, I want to be uh, very clear. Uh, in fact, uh, what I said was there is not a reduction in the operational services. Um, that, uh, that within that same uh, line item, it included a uh, fund uh, that uh, rests for essentially uh, unanticipated um, uh, responses. That fund uh, that uh, was contributed to uh, annually uh, had a balance uh, within it, uh, so uh, those uh, unanticipated investments uh, hadn't been uh, drawn down upon, um, so there was not the need to put uh, funding uh, into it uh, this year uh, while it still uh, has the capacity to respond should those uh, scenarios. So again, I want to reiterate very clearly, uh, particularly for those uh, paramedics on the front line, this uh, in no way re reflects a reduction in uh, the operational uh, investments uh, to support uh, their core uh, operations of services. The member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the minister's clarification. Uh, you know, with uh, a system that we've explored this afternoon uh, fairly in depth, um, and I Pretty sure we can, or at least I'll agree with myself that it's in dire straits. Um, I'm just curious why the department would opt to even consider slashing the budget by that much money. And if it, if it's not required, if it was just a uh, fund for anticipate, unanticipated responses, uh, couldn't that money be invested for the remaining fleet of, of uh, power stretchers and power load systems? Couldn't that provide extra staffing? Couldn't that provide uh, increased infrastructure so as uh, more ambulances on our streets? The Health Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As we've uh, discussed uh, at various points uh, throughout uh, estimates uh, thus far, 
we uh, recognize, uh, and I believe uh, here, I, I'm not just agreeing with myself, but it's a healthcare is an integrated system with many uh, players and, and skill sets that uh, that uh, contribute to uh, the care environment. Uh, we also, I think, uh, even uh, just in, in this uh, hour of, of questioning with the member from Argyle Barrington, Mr. Chair, uh, recognize uh, and reflect that one of the uh, most uh, challenging areas, uh, areas challenging uh, for paramedics is the um, inefficiencies, uh, particularly around uh, the transfer of patients into hospitals, uh, otherwise referred to as the offload time. That uh, creates a, a situation that uh, to address some of those most pressing needs, uh, the investment uh, wasn't necessarily uh, directed towards uh, the uh, paramedics, but rather in the patient flow space. Uh, so uh, by uh, taking this opportunity without uh, jeopardizing the operations and, and the investments and the availability to respond uh, within uh, the uh, EHS uh, budget space, we're able to support the work and the investment Investments within uh, the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority and our partners broadly around patient flow to support those needs. So uh, again, I want to reiterate uh, this is this is uh, one of perhaps those challenges or problems of integrated systems where the the problems may uh, rest uh, and how we may address some of those root uh, challenges. Um, might be up or downstream from where a particular uh, service provider is present. Uh, I think that's really what uh, is transpiring here in, in this year's uh, budget. So uh, w w again, we, we felt uh, in doing our analysis and due diligence uh, with the budget this year uh, that uh, this uh, could help support uh, uh, other investments, uh, again, that will have, uh, uh, should have an impact, a positive impact uh, on those uh, paramedics and the delivery of services while there uh, remains a balance that uh, can be drawn down if necessary. The member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll agree with myself on certain things. The minister will agree with himself on certain other things. But we will both agree that uh, health care delivery is a complex and integrated system. Uh, the second line, ground ambulance operations, sees a slight increase of $79,000. Seeing as it was under budget last year um, by uh, nearly a couple hundred thousand or 190,000, um, I'm bad at math right now on the spot, but what's the uh, reason for the increase this year? The Health Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, some of those uh, changes, because uh, we're talking about uh, the increase in the uh, medical uh, quality uh, control uh, line item. Uh, no. Uh, he's looking at the ground ambulance. Uh, uh, again, uh, so uh, w we uh, have a forecast, so we want to know why the increase from the um, from the forecast. Again, uh, we use the, the best information uh, we have uh, available uh, for uh, our uh, systems. Um, these are for investments that are outside of the provincial uh, ambulance system and, and supports. Uh, in uh, this year, uh, we've uh, transferred some of that money down to the increase in the medical quality control. Um, so it's really just a shift between those two line items, uh, and that's uh, investments uh, in um, uh, programs like um, uh, within Life Flight, uh, Night Vision Goggles, and actually, sorry, uh, my mistake, that was uh, to the uh, provincial programs uh, within EHS, so uh, supporting uh, some of the Life Flight uh, operations this year. Uh, so that came out of the provincial programs fund uh, instead of the ground uh, ambulance operations. So uh, total investments uh, toward emergency uh, response is still uh, there, but uh, to cover some new uh, Night Vision Goggles for our new, uh, uh, relatively new helicopter fleet, uh, uh, we uh, moved some of that funding in to provide those uh, system, those uh, uh, that equipment uh, for that uh, cohort in this uh, coming fiscal year, if that makes sense. Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It does make a little bit of sense, but uh, so the increase of two hundred eighty-three thousand dollars for medical quality control um, forecast estimate for this uh, this year's uh, matching up. But uh, what's the uh, the reasoning behind a two hundred eighty-three thousand dollar increase? The health minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's uh, part uh, of uh, the uh, medical uh, oversight uh, team 
uh, that uh, supports our, our uh, emergency uh, services. As the member would know, we entered into a new master agreement uh, with physicians that uh, saw a significant increase in, in compensation. Um, this is uh, reflective of uh, changes uh, within that uh, space uh, to be uh, consistent uh, with other uh, health uh, changes in the system. Member for Argyle Barrington. The time's taking a, just shy of five minutes. Um, well, I want to bring back. Um, so I think <laughs> so is Monday. <laughs> yeah, four more hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to see um, what insight the minister can provide to not only members of this house but uh, to Nova Scotians regarding the accessibility of the Fitch report. Um, Again, uh, I've stood in my place in this legislature uh, about that it's a taxpayer-funded report. And there's some concerns, uh, positive and, uh, and negative, about that report. Uh, but mostly that there are very good and positive outcomes that could be uh, hidden in that report uh, right now. So, um, you know, the Minister said that uh, it would be, after the FOIPA process, it would be made uh, public under a certain format whether redacted or not, then after, uh, said in December that after negotiations were completed with the operator, then it would be made public. So um, can the minister provide insight to the House uh, if yes, uh, if the report will be made public, if yes, when will it be made public? The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate uh, the member's interest, uh, and, and I want to assure uh, the member um, that uh, my public comments on, on this uh, stand, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, the way that uh, proceeded uh, was uh, I was uh, asked if uh, I, I w this uh, report would be made public. Uh, I indicated, as I always do uh, when uh, asked about uh, uh, documents uh, within the uh, government's uh, domain, uh, that it would uh, be subjected to a, a review under uh, the FOIPOP uh, provisions. It's really important, uh, Mr. Chair, to remind the members of the legislature uh, that FOIPOP has two components to it. There's the freedom of information and making uh, documents within the uh, control uh, of ownership and control of the uh, government uh, available to the people. That's the freedom of information part. The second part is the protection of, of privacy and those provisions that uh, would uh, create scenarios uh, that may uh, delay or prevent the disclosure of information. Uh, that's why I have a tendency to, uh, and, and when I look at uh, information disclosure, uh, I tend to err on the side of having it go under the lens because if we proceed with releasing the information um, in advance of getting a, 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 an adequate lens on it, you can't put the toothpaste back in the bottle. If privacy is violated, if, if that information is, is violated, um, then you can't put it back. There's always the opportunity um, to complete the release uh, and exposure. So that's why uh, generally, and it's not unique to this report, uh, I often uh, respond uh, when asked that question uh, to put it under the review. What did happen in this particular report is recognizing the public interest, uh, I had uh, it go through that lens without an actual FOIPOP application. Uh, so I, I did uh, trigger uh, myself uh, the staff uh, review of the uh, report um, to provide then the recommendations as to the uh, disclosure publication process. What came out of that process uh, was uh, a recognition uh, by staff uh, who uh, were working on uh, preparations for negotiations uh, of uh, the contract with our service provider. Uh, they felt that uh, the information and the, some of the recommendations within the report uh, would help frame those uh, negotiations strategies and, and uh, recommended uh, that uh, the uh, maintaining that information so that it can um, be used as strategically as possible at the negotiating table to ensure that we uh, obtain the best possible negotiating position uh, with our service provider uh, was uh, reason to uh, retain it until those negotiations were, were completed. Uh, what I can assure the member and others uh, within the legislature, what I've also uh, indicated was that uh, we recognize the important need to uh, continue to invest and make changes within uh, 
the uh, emergency uh, services uh, space. That's why uh, we didn't wait for the Fitch report to be completed and make recommendations around offload times. We saw it, we brought parties together, uh, we invest in it. Uh, so uh, again, I, I, I know this is a question of, of suggesting to, to the member opposite to trust me on this. The report will be made public uh, after the negotiations are complete. Um, I'm not uh, withholding uh, good action uh, that uh, doesn't need to go forward. The time has we'll expired for the Progressive Conservative Party. There is 16 minutes left for the New Democratic Party, and I will open it up to the member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and I'm pleased to let the minister know and less pleased to alert his staff that we won't hear the resolution today. <laughs> so, as he, as he has as he so greatly desires, we will be here on Monday. Um, but I want to take these last few minutes and ask some questions. I know my colleague already did, but to go back to the COVID-19 issue. Um, we know that COVID-19 is here in Canada. We know that we're getting closer to pandemic phase. Um, there was an article yesterday in the Herald entitled COVID-19 could hit Nova Scotia's aging population hard, uh, where the chief medical officer of health talked about how, as we all know, we have a very high percentage of seniors as a portion of our population um, and that they are at greater risk. Uh, that our hospital systems, our emergency departments are already stretched with things like the flu. Uh, and so we could be facing some big challenges here. Um, and so I guess my question is, um, given this, uh, what is the department doing specifically to prepare for the arrival of COVID-19 as it relates to, this, to seniors in the province? The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, indeed, again, uh, uh, with the uh outbreaks uh, such as uh, COVID-19 when a new virus uh, makes its uh, way into the human population. Um, the uh, public health uh, sphere uh, have um, many uh, protocols in place uh, and, and the first uh, you can look back in, into uh, January when it first uh, started becoming publicly aware uh, that the first response is containment. Uh, if you can contain uh, you limit uh, the spread and, and so on and, and, and follow the news stories, uh, public health officials, uh, you see those updates and, and see how that works. As the member referenced, uh, more recently including a news release that uh, the public health uh, officer here in Nova Scotia put out uh, today, does acknowledge uh, that uh, area tr in an effort to keep Nova Scotians informed uh, accurately uh, that, uh, again, as it expands more globally, the uh, probability of a case showing up here does uh, increase. But again, I just want to be, be abundantly clear, no cases have uh, been uh, documented in Nova Scotia uh, to date. Um, so these discussions, I just want to be clear so that people don't uh, get too fearful um, when we're having conversations about preparation for worst case scenarios, um, that, that 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 is not reflective of, of what is happening uh, today or expected to happen specifically tomorrow. So I just want to put that, I guess, um, uh, viewer discretion, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, out there before uh, responding. Uh, the work that the Public Health uh, Office is doing uh, for preparation for the seniors populations is, is very much uh, not, uh, or I guess I should say, the work uh, within public health for um, uh, preparation around COVID-19 and, and uh, the uh, potential eventual um, uh, appearance in Nova Scotia uh, is really focused at the, 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 the general population. It's, it's how does the system respond. Um, as part of that, uh, you wouldn't necessarily, would, I, I haven't uh, been presented with something specifically that says this is the response for seniors, uh, because, but yet uh, as uh, the uh, news article, which was an interview with our chief public uh, health officer uh, indicated, we already know that, um, you know, uh, like the flu, 
um, this virus uh, would uh, have uh, a disproportionate impact on our uh, elder population, our age population. Uh, that uh, is because they'd have a weaker immune system. So any, any of our population that would have weaker immunities would be more subjected uh, or more likely to have uh, uh, contract and, and, and perhaps uh, more acute uh, symptoms uh, as a result of it. So without getting into specifically seniors or other populations, I think the system's preparation already acknowledges and takes into account, uh, like with the flu se season, uh, the number of people with the traditional flu, uh, it's, it's disproportionate Order. to the seniors. There's about 10 minutes left in the day and there's a lot of chatter. We're having a hard time hearing the Minister of Health, so I ask that uh, everybody hold back their uh, chatter for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Minister of Health. Uh, so uh, again, I guess what I was just saying is that uh, I'm not aware of something specific targeted at the seniors because the general response to these types of situations already kind of takes into account and recognizes uh, how the population responds to the particular uh, infection. Um, so I hope that uh, clarifies uh, for the member. Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thanks. So you've mentioned a couple of times preparation and. Your caveat is understood that it hasn't arrived in the province and we're not trying to raise any alarms, but as you said, in public health scenarios, we prepare for the worst. Um, so you've mentioned that a couple of times, and so I'm going to get two questions in here because I know you like to take your time answering, so maybe I'll get an answer to. Uh, but I guess if I look at the budget line on 13.11, um, I see that the budget for public health has in fact been adjusted downward relatively significantly this year. Um, and so I guess my question is, is this the budget line where that preparation for the worst uh, would be happening? Um, and and what is it, and, and why has it gone down? Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Oh, actually. The Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. Uh, the um, the response to, uh, uh, well, I guess two things. Uh, the first is that um, the emergence of the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, here uh, nationally, or internationally and, and, and here locally um, really happened very late in the budget uh, preparation um, process. Um, and uh, as reported and reflected in the um, <clears throat> in the uh, risk assessment that the Department of Finance prepared as they submitted, uh, it does acknowledge that uh, any uh, increased costs uh, in responding to COVID-19 are... They requested increased funding uh, to deal with these issues? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I'd uh, mentioned, uh, uh, well, I guess first, uh, the member's comment that uh, uh, this won't be the only pandemic. I certainly hope uh, that it uh, is. Uh, the pandemics don't happen uh, frequently. Uh, certainly not new, uh, unanticipated ones. So uh, I certainly hope we don't go through this. Uh, you know the the the, cons you know, the uh, efforts and and. Uh, uh, challenges they present. Uh, so uh, knowing that uh, that these types of scenarios are not uh, common occurrences uh, is the first thing to uh, acknowledge and recognize as it relates to the, um, uh, as I said uh, previously, the uh, actual costing and estimating. Um, uh, they're, they're, we're, we're still too early in, in this in terms of needing to uh, execute or trigger. There's been no uh, triggers uh, with the, the budgeting. So during the budgeting cycle, and the preparation here. This was uh, not something that could have been uh, forecasted or anticipated. 
Um, as far as the planning and preparation, uh, again, uh, we already had uh, protocols, uh, plans in place that were built upon. And 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 once uh, you know we stabilized with the COVID-19 situation uh, internationally and in the province, uh, we did after uh, SARS. Uh, so that. Uh, thank you. Uh, as it relates to uh, hopefully receiving uh, vaccinations that uh, we'll be able to proceed, uh, if there were to be changes that would uh, show up under communicable disease and prevention line item, I believe, uh, that would be on uh, page 1311. Uh, so uh, yes, there would be areas, but again, as we said at the beginning, this budget does not reflect. And planning is being done, but with that, I'll just thank you for your time. I'm not quite as adept at getting right to zero uh, as the minister is, um, but I'll just let you do it for me. <laughs> Uh, the member yeah. for uh, sure. I'll, 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 what I'll just uh, say in the last uh, dozen seconds or so, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, I appreciate uh, the heads up on that piece. I'll, I'll endeavour to uh, dig in over the weekend, and we'll be back at this on Monday and, and try to have uh, uh, some of the, the additional, uh, more uh, granular details available. Time at that is time. up. Uh, order the time allotted for the consideration of supply today has elapsed. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the committee do now rise and you, that we will report progress and beg leave to sit again. <laughs> Motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House. House on Supply will now report that the Committee of the Whole House on Supply has met and made some progress and begs leave to sit again. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes the government's business for today. I move that the House to now rise to meet again Monday, March 2nd, 2020, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. Following the daily routine, business will include uh, continuation of the Committee of the Hall House on Supply, uh, with time permitting, second reading on Bills 233, 234, 236, 238, and 240. And I would also note that Law Amendments Committee will commence at noon. Thank you very much. The motion is for the House to adjourn to uh, meet again on Monday, March the 2nd, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. The House now stands adjourned until Monday, March the 2nd at 4 p.m.